Good morning. Kind of beautiful to see a full chamber. I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors on June 6, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. Good morning, Rhonda. Let's begin with a roll call. Good morning. Supervisor Arenas. Here. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Sumedian. Here. Vice President Lee. Good morning, President. President Ellenberg. I am here as well. We'll begin with the, uh, we will go next to the Pledge of Allegiance and Supervisor Simidian, would you lead us today? Thank you very much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our invocation this morning will be presented by Louise Shields, introduced by uh, Supervisor Arenas. Good morning, everyone. It's really and truly my honor to introduce today's invocator, Louise Shields. If you would step up, Louise, um, to our podium while I, I speak wonderful remarks about you, um, and all uh, absolutely true. Um, Louise is an incredible self-taught artist based in South County. Um, we are now enjoying some of her pieces above um, on the screen. Uh, she's an artist and a curator for the Gilroy Center for Arts, as well as a deputy public guardian conservator for the public guardians officers here in Santa Clara County. So our um, in-house talent is wide and incredible. Uh, she's passionate about the work she does as a deputy conservator and equally as passionate about creating artwork um, that really illuminates beauty in the form of hope during times of struggle, so we really, I truly appreciate that. For the past nine years, Louise has produced the annual Black History Month art and cultural exhibit at the Gilroy Center for Arts in South County. To her, art is an outlet and a way to speak to others. She creates art from her heart and soul with a purpose to educate, connect, and inspire meaningful conversations. And we can all view Louise's work now, but um, throughout the county, including if you happen to be, and this is not a, a paid for Campbell Starbucks, but there is one at West Campbell Avenue. And her work is um, featured there, as well as a virtual gallery in London this summer, so congratulations. Thank you for joining us today, Louise. Pardon me, I want to make sure we turn the mic up for you first to hear you. Thanks, Rhonda. Good morning, President Ellenberg and Board of Supervisors. My name is Louise Shields. As the producer and curator of the Black History Month exhibit at the Gilroy Center for the Arts, it is an honor to uplift the achievements of black Americans in Santa Clara County, as well as raise awareness of the importance of celebrating diversity, engaging, in healthy dialogue on the social issues that affect us all. Ahead of the upcoming Juneteenth holiday, I'd like to share with you the importance of culture awareness and community cohesiveness. Each year, the Gilroy Center for the Arts features creative arts, poetry, photography, and other activities to heighten their awareness of the rich history and cultural legacies of African Americans and their impact on the world. During the month of June, many will celebrate Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day. Juneteenth commemorates the emancipation of enslaved African Americans in the United States. For many, Juneteenth is a reminder of the struggles that African Americans endured for 150 years and the newfound freedom that they embarked on. For others, Juneteenth is a time to reflect, celebrate, and recognize the importance of being committed to racial equality and justice for all. For all, Juneteenth should be observed as an opportunity to contemplate, educate, and reflect on the pervasive issue of racial justice in our country. I encourage you all to join the Juneteenth celebrations happening throughout Santa Clara County this month. My hope for Santa Clara County is that all artists are supported and that more public spaces 
like county buildings, display their artwork. Many county employees are also artists that have a lot to say through their art. It would be wonderful for the county to provide more opportunities for personal expression to county employees and to continue extending this opportunity to artists throughout the county. In closing, I would like to share one of, the, one of my favorite quotes by the phenomenal Helen Keller. The best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt by the heart. My one request for everyone today is that we all take a moment out of our busy lives and soak in the beauty that surrounds all of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you so much for that really beautiful and uplifting invocation. Uh, we have a couple of adjournments in memoriam today. The first is in honor and memory of Bishop Patrick Joseph McGrath, and that will be presented by Supervisors Chavez and Arenas and Lee. Thank you. Yeah, it is with a heavy heart today we adjourn our meeting in the memory of Bishop Patrick McGraw. Bishop uh, McGraw was loved by many, many who knew him uh, in the diocese, and we were blessed by his ministry as our bishop for over 20 years. And I'm really honored that Bishop Cantu is here um, to represent the diocese and to speak on behalf of Bishop McGraw. He led the Roman Catholic Diocese of San Jose from 1999 to 2019, and during a time of tremendous transformation for both the diocese and Santa Clara County as a whole. Bishop McGraw was born in Dublin, Ireland in 1945 and first came to the Bay Area in 1970, shortly after being ordained as a priest. He spent more than a quarter century serving the church in San Francisco before coming to the South Bay in 1998 to serve alongside San Jose's first bishop, Pierre Dumaine, before uh, Bishop Dumaine's retirement the following year. Bishop McGraw cared deeply for the welfare of the least and of, uh, among us and the most marginalized in his community. And for anybody who knew him, um, he was warm, he was loving, and he was hilarious. And you don't always think about bishops being hilarious, but he really was. And he was bold in his own way. There were many times you could see that his, um, you know, he was concerned about the welfare of others and also always concerned about the future and the health of the Catholic Church. And so he cared deeply about Catholic education, about supporting um, the women religious in our community. And he helped us with things like passing Measure A, which was a housing bond, by the way, that RMPA, you all helped with as well. Um, he helped us establish a minimum wage that went on to um, raise the, the wage of people all across our county. And in his own quiet way, he could be very, very bold. I, I wanted to just, the reason I would, thought it was so important that we honor him today is that there were so many important gifts that he gave our community. And I really wanted to be able to lift him up today and to say just how incredibly blessed we were to have him as a faith leader in our community. And also how very, very honored I am to call him a friend. Um, before Bishop Cantu um, joins me to speak, I wanted to see if any of my colleagues wanted to uh, Say a few words. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez. Uh, I get a chance to uh, know Bishop McGrath, uh, being a Catholic myself, and we see him everywhere, and he really serves everyone. Uh, she actually, he delivered a sermon uh, at St. Joseph when my oldest daughter was getting her confirmation, and he's often visited St. Martin and Sunnyvale, uh, my parish, and always made himself very available to everybody. He was always open and engaged and listened to community's needs, and he will surely be missed. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, raised a Catholic and always a Catholic, I'm um, very sorry for Bishop McGraw's passing, um, but we know he leaves a legacy with others that he has had under his wings, and uh, of course the whole congregation, and so he 
will be missed but lived through um, all of us. Thank you. And I wanted to invite up Bishop Cantu and to say um, to the bishop as he approaches the, the podium that um, I thought the services that you did for um, for Bishop McGraw, I want to keep wanting to say PJ, he was in my American Leadership Forum class, so I knew him camping. And you get to know people when you camp with them. So, so please, welcome. Thank you. It's hard to imagine Bishop McGraw camping. Truly. But um, uh, none, nonetheless, I'm sure that was, had its own uh, uh, hilarity to it. Uh, just a, a thank you on behalf of, of uh, the family, the McGraw family back in Ireland and, and the diocese for honoring Bishop McGraw. Uh, I personally will miss him. Uh, we developed a, a nice friendship over the past five years. And, uh, um, you know, with regard to the Catholic faith, I mean, that's certainly, that was the, the core and the motivation for his actions and his priorities and beliefs. But uh, as Pope Francis has reminded us, and it's always been our posture to come to the public square and together with public and private agencies and individuals and groups to, to do good for humanity, to uh, create a society, communities that are more just and more loving. So again, thank you for uh, for honoring Bishop McGraw, and he will certainly live in our memories. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Cantu. Thank you. Uh, our next adjournment will also be delivered by Supervisor Chavez in honor and memory of Jorge Escobar. Thank you. And um, again, colleagues, thank you so much for allowing uh, me the opportunity to bring forward um, this in memoriam for Jorge Escobar, who is the Evergreen Community College District Vice Chancellor of Administrative Services. Um, we are joined today by Dr. Conrad, who's a Vice Chancellor also at Evergreen, and his son, Diego, um, and his partner, Alex. We're really honored that you're here today. Jorge was an outstanding person who was known for kindness, generosity, a sense of humor, but also a great deal of tenacity. It takes tenacity to move big organizations to do uh, for the community what we want them to do. And he really cared about this community in San Jose for everyone who calls it home. Jorge worked tirelessly to become the bridge to ensure that all had the opportunity to succeed. Jorge served at the San Jose Evergreen Community College District for nearly 10 years, first as the San Jose City College Vice President of Administrative Services, and then as the San Jose City College Acting President, and most recently as the District Vice Chancellor of Administrative Services since 2019. As Vice Chancellor, he was entrusted with leading two departments outside of the Administrative Services, and that included technology and support for the Center for Economic Mobility, in every single role he took, he advanced the district's values of opportunity and equity and social justice for students, employees, and our community members, irrespective of what their backgrounds were. Jorge made vital contributions to countless committees, councils, task forces, programs, and initiatives, and stayed both patient and impatient at the same time. To highlight a few, the development and construction and renovation of campus buildings and infrastructure throughout the district and the facilitation of the San Jose City College Ironworker Apprenticeship Program. He navigated the challenges presented by COVID-19 and his efforts to deeply expand educational services to the east side. I wanted to stop and just see if any of my colleagues wanted to comment before I say a few more words and invite up his son. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Well, I only have met Jorge a few occasions in passing. My chief staff, Wendy Ho, actually worked very closely with him as a member of the Board of Trustees for the San Jose Evergreen Community College District. From what I've learned from Wendy, I learned that Jorge was a pragmatic but visionary leader. He believed deeply in the ability of community colleges to transform lives and demonstrate an unyielding commitment to uplifting marginalized communities. As the college district's chief business officer, Jorge led with his heart and was full of compassion. He did everything with passion and purpose. Jorge's laugh was infectious, and he lit up every room he was in with his boundless energy. He was also so genuine, giving of himself so earnestly and effortlessly, and he was just so human. 
how he valued his relationships, even when he found himself on the opposite side of an argument, often remarking to others that relationships over issues, relationships over issues. In the tribute to him, Hohei's team remarked, we'll honor your memory by following the example of dedication, hard work, humor, and integrity. And I trust that the district will carry on Hohei's legacy. And my sincere condolences to the Escobar family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor, uh, for bringing this forward to all of us. And um, my uh, deepest condolences to the Escobar family, as well as the San Jose City and Evergreen um, College family. Um, as you've heard, Jorge was very generous. He had a great sense of humor. He was compassionate, generous with his time. And um, he was brilliant. He, he dreamed a lot, um, not only for our community, but especially for the students within the college systems. He was always trying to expand opportunities for our youth, especially those that um, were first time college students in their families. Um, always trying to pursue and to obtain more. And I had the opportunity of getting to know Jorge through, um, unfortunately, a land use um, project that had 27 acres at uh, Evergreen College. And because I know he was such a jokester, it isn't lost on me that later today, I will also be talking about a project that is also has its difficulties, and it's 27 acres. And so it just brings it all um, together for me. I, I know that he's, he's looking down and smiling and um, bringing his sense of humor even to this, um, this memoriam today. I'm lucky to have met him. Um, he'll always be with me. I learned quite a bit through those difficult conversations. You always do, right? When there's difficulty in life, whether it's a project and land use that's going to determine how uh, a campus is going to look for, uh, like for our community and for our students um, and for the, forever, those kinds of conversations and difficulties just stay with you for a really long time. And so, Jorge, um, thank you for all that you've, you've brought to our lives and to our students and to our community. And I hope que descansen en paz, amigo. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to invite up um, uh, Diego, if he would like to say a few words. And I know um, Dr. Conrad is also with us, if you wanted to say a few words. Welcome. Is this microphone on? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> so first off, I'd like to say thank you to you all uh, for setting up this memoriam. It's uh, you know nice to hear the effect that he had on you guys and uh, that he's his work is you know, recognized in the county. Uh, but I will keep my remarks short here. Uh, my mother and sister were unfortunately unable to attend, but also sincerely appreciated the gesture. Uh, yeah, my father's main driver during his life was to improve the education system, and he truly believed that he could change the system throughout the nation. Uh, who knows if he really could or not, but <laughs> he believed that. Uh, he also, he always wanted to enact enough change to leave his mark on the world or at least on his community, especially for Latinos. And I think that we can all say that he achieved that. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the county office for you know, this time and the attent attentiveness you have all provided in setting this up. And I'd like to provide a special thanks to Supervisor Cindy Chavez, uh, Mike Medina, and Alex Lynn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisors, for the opportunity for San Jose Evergreen College to get the honor for Jorge and all the great work that he did and your support. He reached out and collaborated as best he could to support the needs of the community. And it was always a real joy to work with him, his passion and intensity, but then go out and have a cup of coffee. So it, it, he embodied what we want in the community to help raise everyone up. And again, we appreciate your support and we hope to continue the collaboration with the county and continue to help our community grow. Thank you very much. 
And thank you, colleagues, and thank you, Dr. Conrad. I just wanted to say thank you so much for letting us celebrate these lives well-lived. They both had such big impacts on our community, and thank you for letting me adjourn in this meeting in both the honor of Jorge Escobar and Bishop P.J. McGraw. It is our honor, and may both of their memories always be for a blessing. Item six is public comment. This is the portion of the agenda set aside for members of the public wishing to address the Board of Supervisors on matters not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. I am delighted to see all of you here. Let me just make a couple of comments about uh, meeting management. Um, if you are intending to speak on public comment this morning, now is the time to submit or to have submitted a yellow card. Um, if there are more than 15 people, we will, um, we will limit the speakers to one minute each. If we are over uh, 30 people, we, we may have to reevaluate um, that timing as well. When the first person begins speaking in person, the queue will close for in-person speakers. So I'm happy for as many people as want to speak, speak, but but the cards need to be in, again, for meeting management purposes, so we're not um, trickling on through the morning. And for those of you who are on Zoom, the same applies. Please uh, raise your virtual hand at this time. The Zoom queue will remain open until the first Zoom speaker begins, at which point that queue will close. So. With all of those caveats, uh, we are delighted to welcome so many speakers this morning. And Rhonda, how many yellow cards do we have in chambers? Let's start with that. We have 24 cards in chambers. Okay, 24 going once and twice. When the first speaker starts, uh, that queue will close. So at the moment, we're at one minute per speaker. And on Zoom at this point? At this point, we have six. Okay, so that queue will remain open. Uh, let's begin, and we'll allot one minute per public speaker. Thanks, Rhonda. All right, do we wanna wait? Um, we have a few people, it looks like, are filling out cards. Absolutely. So. Yeah, let's wait. All right, while the last ones are being delivered, we can go ahead and get people lining up. I'll call five or six names at a time so they can get prepared. Thank you. And just note, please line up when you're called. Until your name has called, please do not stand in the, in the aisle. Thank you so much. All right, so I have Carl Guardino, Gabrielle Moran, Catherine Amoroso, Eric Alba, Sonia James. Let's start with those. Good morning, Madam President and members of the board. My name is Carl Guardino. I am Vice President of Global Government Affairs for Toronto Wireless, which is a pre-public company singularly focused on helping to bridge the digital divide around the globe. I'm here today as a community citizen, however, and proudly as the founder of a community charity run that is focused on our three public hospitals, 14 healthcare clinics, and the more than one million uh, people that they annually serve in our community. And what an honor to be here on a day where we have so many public health care professionals with us. On Saturday morning, July 1, we hope you, your staff, and your constituents will consider joining us for our third annual Bloom Energy, Toronto Wireless, Stars and Strides Community Run. We hope to raise $330,000 for the Valley Health Foundation to help those most needy. Thank you and very much. And that is my time. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Gabriel Moran, and I'm a government affairs and policy associate with Toronto Wireless. Uh, as Carl mentioned, the next generation fixed wireless access company founded in the Bay Area and based here in Milpitas. Um, I am also here today to speak about Stars and Strides. And to follow up on what Carl was speaking to, um, I wanted to mention that uh, you know, we asked for your attendance on Saturday, July 1st for the third annual Stars and Strides annual community run where we are hoping to raise $350,000 for the Valley Medical Center Foundation uh, with 2,500 paying participants and over 400 volunteers. And uh, this morning we have three basic requests. First, uh, we would like for you to register yourself and your family at starsandstridesrun.com for our elected leaders. Please sign up under the Calwater Elected Official Executive 5K Challenge. Uh, second, please reach out to your own community members. Uh, we have sample text that we can provide should you need it. And third, uh, we would be honored to work with your professional staff to be included in any online community. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. your coming to this morning. Hi, Welcome. I'm Catherine Amoroso, registered nurse and public health nurse. The county continually tells us we are not equal to other RNs. However, we do some of the exact same work as RNs and more as we're a specialty nursing practice. During the county's COVID-19 response, I work side by side with other RNs from the clinics and hospitals and also travel nurses doing the exact same tasks like COVID testing and giving vaccines. All the while, we are not compensated the same as other nurses. Later on, PHNs were pulled to work in the Special Investigations Branch to be investigators overseeing outbreak responses in hospitals, SNFs, schools, child care, and more settings, as PHNs were selected for our specialty knowledge of public health to coordinate the response and mitigate the effects of COVID-19 in our county. Why are we continue to be treated as less than? Whether we work in the clinic, hospital, out in the community, directly in homes, a nurse is a nurse, and we all deserve the same respect. The county can make things right by equitably com compensating PHNs and all RNPHNs nurses, the same as all other clinic and hospital nurses. Thank you. Good morning, Madam President, members of the board. My name is Eric Alba. I'm a public health nurse for our public health department. I work with the most passionate and talented people you could imagine who genuinely care for the members of this wonderful community. My fellow nurses in the public health department have consistently gone above and beyond the call, especially in times of uncertainty. As a nurse in public health, I have been told repeatedly that our work is important, meaningful, and impactful in helping close the health disparities that affect our most vulnerable and marginalized community members. Despite all this, I still feel undervalued as a nurse due to the unfair widening pay disparity between our nurses throughout this county. If one of the public health department's core value is equity for the community, why wouldn't it do the same for its employees? Aren't we also people who live, thrive, and work in this community? If we can have the following, get ready. Paul Williams, Amanda Lamarca, Diane Vanderpool, Christina Stanyard, and Leticia Picard. Good morning. My name is Sonia James, and I'm a public health nurse with the county's health care program for children in foster care at the Department of Family and Children's Services. Morale among public health nurses is at an all-time low because the county refuses to recognize that we are registered nurses with the same duties as clinical nurses. This is even after everything we did during the pandemic, which, where we often worked side by side. For example, at the start of the pandemic, I provided C CDC guidance and recommendations to ER physicians and infection control nurses in the hospitals. I was also part of the original handful of PHNs that started the county's mobile vaccination program providing COVID-19 vaccines. All the amazing work we did collectively as PHNs led the county, uh, specifically Dr. Sarah Cody, to be recognized as the public health official in America who may have saved more lives than any other person in the country by MSNBC. We deserve pay equity. 14 other counties, which compromise 75% of California's populations, pay PHNs equally. A nurse is a nurse. Good morning, I'm Paul Williams. I'm a PHNRN with Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. I bring primary care to formerly unhoused people at seven of our um, PSH sites here in the county, 600 people at those sites. I work side by side with clinical nurses doing exactly the same work, yet um, we're paying them 25% more. How is that okay? After COVID, after what we did for this community, after we proved ourselves, how can that possibly be acceptable? For years, we've been the long forgotten um, 
group of nurses and treated as less than by this county, a problem that has grown far worse post-pandemic. We are all RNs. We deserve equity and respect and not to be othered. Same work, same patients, same pay. A nurse is a nurse is a nurse. And we stand in full solidarity today with our brothers and sisters from RNPA. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Amanda LaMarca. I'm a registered nurse uh, and a nurse coordinator for the SAFE program at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Um, as a nurse coordinator, we wear many hats. Um, we provide training and support to every registered nurse on our unit, those same nurses that were deemed worthy of increased compensation. We provide direct patient care when needed, just like those nurses deemed worthy of increased compensation. We oversee and support most of the daily inner workings that allow the unit to run smoothly, and in turn, we support our nurse manager, who's also a registered nurse that was deemed worthy of increased compensation. So I stand here today with my fellow 135 forgotten nurses, and we ask, or we are here with the hope that as you make this decision, you look back on what you've heard today and ask the question of yourself, what makes us unworthy? Thank you very much. You've been so good, and I know it's so hard um, that you want to to be supportive of your your colleagues, but I do have to maintain a consistent rule, uh, regardless of whether one likes the statements being made or not, that um, that expressions of of noise, applause, um, positive or, or negative verbal indications slow down and disrupt and impede the meeting. So I do have to ask that you don't do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm here to stand with my colleagues against the gross injustice and in inequities in, in of the recent wage realignment that was given to some, but not all of the nurses represented by the RMPA. I am a registered nurse too, but I'm one of the 135 nurses that supposedly are not deserving of the same wage increase. I want to know your thinking behind the decision to exclude certain classifications of nurses. We are the nurses that took the time and initiative to seek higher education and take advanced nursing roles such as staff developers, clinical nurse specialists, nurse coordinators, infection prevention nurses, nurse practitioners, and nurse anesthetists performing the same research, education, and patient care functions performed by physicians. The staff developer, nurse coordinator, myself, a clinical nurse specialist, are frequently in the staff um, at the bedside when staffing uh, issues are, arise. We perform the same duties as the clinical nurses, yet we're the ones that train the nurses. So th Thank you. Hello, my name is Christina Stanyard. I'm a critical care staff developer at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. I'm here today to talk about the inappropriate decision to de deny the 10% raise to our staff developer group. While HR said they did a classification study, it was clear that the quality of the comparison was poor. The study was not a reflection of our actual role as we do so much more. But instead of looking at the comparisons, the county should be looking inward. What value does the county see in staff developers? It is clear that they're no longer seeing us as nursing leadership, despite being told that we are. We are, we are asked to work like leadership in participating in key decision making about the nursing profession. We're involved in the evaluation and development of all nurses, yet the county is not paying us in a way that reflects the leadership and work being done. Instead, they currently have staff developer role as not promotional, but a transfer from a clinical nurse. In the past three years since becoming a staff developer, I have trained over 400 nurses. My knowledge and expertise... Thank you. If we can get the next five up, Lorraine Massives, Semar Helmichael, Stacy Oaken, Alan Kamara, and Jennifer Hughes. Good morning. My name is Letitia Picard, and I'm the staff developer of the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at BMC. I'm here today in hopes that you put an end to the inequity and injustice that is occurring with us in the hospital system. The county has increased clinical nurse wages by 10%, yet completely left out staff developers, clinical nurse specialists, nurse coordinators, and more. 
This is a detrimental blow to the 135 nurses who work so hard not only to lead their units, but also educate and provide excellent care to our community. This is an injustice. When I stepped into my position as a staff developer, it was a promotional opportunity. And per in county, there needs to be a 10% increase for that to be occur. I am not considered in a promotional um, role anymore. It's a lateral transfer. So my expertise is basically demoted. Many of my peers on the floor are making higher wages, yet I'm expected to lead the unit, educate the same nurses on the floor, and help maintain CCS cer cert certification requirements and everything else that comes with this position. Please do the right thing and provide equity for all nurses. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Lorraine Messiers. I've been with the county as a registered nurse for the last 20 years. I'm currently a staff developer, which I obtained after, obtain, after getting my master's degree. Um, I'd like to thank you for listening to me today and also for the recent offer. However, the recent offer does not acknowledge application of our knowledge, skills, and responsibility, nor does it acknowledge um, the feeling of receiving a pay cut where our other nurses received a 10% increase across the board. When we go to the application, you heard my colleague, Christina. She told you about the 200 critical care nurses she's trained this year. As a result, we'd have to, we hire less travelers. A snippet into the responsibility. We are responsible for Joint Commission education requirements. We have to make sure that they get done or our hospitals risk being closed. We are also responsible to make sure that every nurse that is trained is trained to a degree of excellence so that every patient is safe in the hospital. And we continue to do that. Thank you. Hello all, my name is Stacy Oaken and I'm a new nurse coordinator. The forgotten positions are meant to be part of promotional pay practices for good reason. These roles comes with immense responsibility. Their key functions are to keep VMC's practices current, to keep their patients safe, and to keep VMC's doors open while maintaining state certifications all while ensuring that Santa Clara County residents are receiving the best care possible. Two months ago, I left bedside to become a nurse coordinator. I make 24 cents an hour more, 24 cents. That is all my 11 years of experience at VMC, my work ethic, my newly acquired responsibility were worth to the county, 24 cents an hour. In closing, it's downright unreasonable to not give the forgotten 135 positions equity and pay that is promotional to their responsibility or proportional to their responsibilities. It will not attract candidates to fill the empty positions and it will not make people want to stay in them. Daily, I question if I made the right choice to move into this role because the stress and responsibility are simply not worth 24 cents an hour. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisor, Alan Kamar. I would like to address the Oakland report first and foremost. Um, those nurses on the Oakland report doesn't reflect the great work all our nurses in the County of Santa Clara do every day. In the last 21 years, nurses have been considered the most trusted profession, 21 years in a row. And I want to apologize that we were not here to address that. First and foremost, our nurses do great work. Um, Dr. Smith, we were looking forward to, to see you outside to hang out with us, but we didn't see you. Um, Supervisor, we want you to address the inequity with our nurses as you have heard them. It is not right. Dr. Smith, we urge you need to do the right thing. Greta, James, we urge you all to do the right thing. We cannot promote equity within our system and we will not allow the county to divide our nurses. We urge the bottle supervisors to do the right thing. Thank you. Good morning, Honorable Super Board of Supervisors. My name is Jennifer Hughes. I'm a clinical nurse at Valley Med and Vice President of RNPA. SEMA got an 8% realignment based on our corresponding RNPA classifications. This means the supervisors and management of infection control got an 8% realignment, and our own infection control nurses have not received a classification report or a recommended increase. This is an equity issue. Our whole RNPA bargaining unit should receive the 10% increase. There are unintended consequences of not providing the 10% increase to everyone. An example of this is in the past, when nurses promoted to staff developer position, which should be a promotion, they would receive a 10% salary increase. 
They have more education, duties, and responsibilities. Now it's just a lateral transfer. There are no incentives. This has squashed career mobility and opportunities in the county. Please do the right thing and give the 10% increase across the whole RNPA bargaining unit. Thank you. If we could have the next five prepare to speak. Juan Alfaro, Jerry Colbertson, Juanita Tran, Brian Komrowski, Angie Rosenbaum. Good morning. Um, my name is Samara Hala Michael, and I'm a nurse practitioner at the Spark Clinic, which is the medical home for um, youth and children in foster care. And currently, the two primary care providers at the Spark Clinic are nurse practitioners. We provide exceptional care to our patients, help on families, and help them navigate through difficult times. And we are their primary primary care providers. And um, to be excluded from the recent raises given to our nursing colleagues um, sends the wrong message about how the county values our profession as nurse practitioners. We are serving our community um, very um, diligently and provide comprehensive care and give them a medical home. And to be excluded just sends the wrong message about the value of nurse practitioners in this county. Thank you. Dear Board of Supervisors, my name is Juan, and as an infection control nurse at O'Connor Hospital, I'm deeply concerned about the lack of equity for our 135 nurses in the terms of compensation. It is not just a question of receiving the same raise as our fellow nurses, but this disparity will also make it incredibly challenging to recruit new talent and keep the current nurses in these crucial areas of our healthcare system. Infection control nurses play an essential role in protecting and caring for our patients, staff, and visitors. And it is only fair that we recognize and compensate accordingly. As someone who has been with the county for three years, I have seen firsthand that positions in infection control are difficult to fill, as the other key nursing departments and areas which were forgotten and, not, and did not receive the 10% increase. Infection control requires special education and training. By addressing this equity issue, we can ensure that we attract and retain the best talent, which is essential for the health and safety of everyone in our care. I urge you to take action on this issue, and thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Jerry. I'm an infection prevention nurse at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. First of all, thank you for the raise that you provided uh, the colleagues that I work alongside. And while I might not be patient facing, the things that I do impact the safety of the patients and their outcomes. What we do is also publicly reported. We're looking at healthcare acquired infections things that our community can look up to see how we are doing with that. My colleagues maintain an advanced degree or certification to hold this position. We really want you to consider looking at the inequity and disparity that you've caused among our group. And as you've heard, a nurse is a nurse is a nurse. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brian Komorowski. I'm here to represent my spouse, Melissa Komorowski. She's a registered nurse and nurse practitioner who's devoted 18 years of her life treating patients and providing medical care to our community's underserved population. Just so you know, a clinical nurse practitioner generates over a million dollars in annual billable services for the county. But this value underscores the tremendous contribution that nurse practitioners make every day. In the face of the pandemic, Melissa and fellow nurse practitioners bravely provided in-person medical care, prenatal medical care, before COVID-19 vaccines and therapies were available, stepping up when most shifted to phone consultations. In the salary realignment, nurse practitioners were overlooked while registered nurses and physicians received a needed, a needed salary increase. This exclusion is demoralizing. In fairness and equity, include nurse practitioners in the salary realignment. Allow them to continue to treat your community with dignity. Thank you.
Um, good members, uh, good morning members of the board. Um, my name is Yacinta Tran and I've worked for the county for over nine years. I'm an oncology and nurse coordinator at O'Connor Medical Clinics and assist our patients as they navigate the hospital system when they've been giving the worst news of their lives, that they have cancer. With a daunting diagnosis, I coordinate between many specialties required for patient care, a harder task than you'd imagine in such a large system. I'm the person to cover the gaps that patients may fall into and help our patients smoothly transition through curative treatment or palliative end-of-life care. O'Connor Medical Clinics has exi existed for less than a year, and I'm currently helping to build this into a thriving, successful program. Through this growth, we have had an increase in clientele without the appropriate support requiring me to work multiple job titles that are not within my job description. My job is an integral part of our patient's experience, but most importantly, for our patient's overall outcomes. I'm asking the board to understand that the nurse coordinator's role is a vital part to our organization, and most importantly, to our patients, and to grant us our deserved 10% raise. Thank you. Thank you. If we can have our final four speakers line up, Maria Cortez, Mercy Egbejor, Mark Trout, and Jonathan Liu. Good morning, my name is Angie. I'm a nurse coordinator at the O'Connor Clinics. I've worked for the county for 23 years, and I'm one of the forgotten 135. About three years ago, Matt Gary and I started the O'Connor Clinics with just two departments. Just two of us started two departments in a two-room clinic in June of 2020. Since then, the O'Connor Clinics have grown to 12 departments. We have, the, our success has brought care to your community and money to your budget. My role as a nurse coordinator has been instrumental to the success. I'm honestly quite disappointed at this inequality and it's, that it's gone on so long. If your budget can support giving the highest paid health center coordinators, health center managers a wage increase, then your budget can support us too. A nurse is a nurse is a nurse, thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Maria Cortez. I have worked for the county for 20 years. I'm a nurse practitioner in the neonatal intensive care unit, responsible for the most vulnerable, definitely most adorable, tiniest residents of Santa Clara County. I stand here disheartened that as members of RNPA, few of us have been singled out and considered undeserving. I watched as the county diluted our average wages to justify this, with unlike centers while excluding higher averages, requiring promotional opportunities that the county does not offer nurse practitioners. You have an amazing group of nurse leaders, and I hope you can appreciate that. I'm asking the board to restore equity in our bargaining unit. Why exclude 135 among 4,000 members of the bargaining unit, and yet grandfather in SEMA? Please do not let us down. Please do not forget our nurse practitioners, and please do not forget our other nursing professionals. We deserve equity. Good morning. Thank you for having us, and thank you for the 10% you have given to some of the nurses. And as one of the one, 135 forgotten uh, nurse, nurses, I am Dr. Mercy Ebujo. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work for Santa Clara Valley Homeless Program, and I've been with County for 32 years. 22 of that, I have been a nurse practitioner, providing care to those who are the most vulnerable and marginalized, giving some of the nurses raises and excluding nurse practitioners like myself who went back to school and have started really thriving programs like the Backpack Street Medicine. That was my capstone project for my doctorate program. I also manage that program. I manage the uh, mobile unit for our program. I also started a diversity, equity, and inclusion program for our program. So we do not just do medical care for our patients. We give all we can, and we give all that we have. Excluding nurse practitioners is not right. Please do the right thing. Thank you so much. The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. Now these words in Jeremiah 50, which predicted the overthrow of ancient Babylon 70 years after they had destroyed the, the temple in Jerusalem, 
was given before the temple was destroyed. That's an amazing thing to think about. We learned uh, last time I hear the, was it the golden key of interpretation by Rabbi David Kimshi in regards to the cycle. If we're using our brains, we realize that when ancient Babylon was overthrown, uh, it had to be overthrown 10 sabbatical cycles or 70 years later, proving that when the handwriting appeared on the wall, it was uh, a Sabbath year. We are in a Sabbath year right now. Will Jesus Christ... Good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. I'm Jonathan. I'm here on behalf of my wife, Sherry Kai, who's a nurse practitioner, and a colleague, Rachel Hummeler, also a nurse practitioner. Sherry Kai and two other nurse practitioners see up to 110 sleep apnea patients a week, and they're booked two months out with 400 patients waiting for consultation. Without them, there is no sleep clinic. During the COVID uh, pandemic, they were both deployed uh, to help out side by side with, nurse or with nurses. And Rachel, uh, she's worked for the county for 23 years, and she's just seen, seen it all, where um, she wants to say the ethos here is not about the money, but the culture of equality, recognizing loyalty, excellent service, and being a better organization for all. And Rachel works for the Center for Pulmonary and uh, Quit Smoking Clinics, where she's done an incredible job helping uh, a lot of program participants and directly counsel to quit smoking and has done an incredible job. Thank you. And that concludes our in-person speakers. We currently have eight people in Zoom. Thank you, and I will uh, offer a final reminder to those on Zoom, if you're intending to speak on public comment, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. We'll close the Zoom queue when the first speaker begin speaking. So Rhonda, let's give that a few more seconds and then uh, begin with the first speaker. All right, looks like we're holding steady. Our first yeah. speaker on Zoom is Paul Soto. Paul, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept him unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Paul Sopo from Horse. What are the reasons for these meetings? This is my understanding of democracy, is that what we as citizens, as individuals experience in the community and as a direct result of policy decisions that are made here, that our right to come here and to challenge you and actually to expect change is part of the democratic process. That's what democracy looks like. Democracy is not polite. Democracy is very, very complicated. Just look what it took in order to establish it. So what I'm, what I'm asking for is that we're going to receive information like we today. That information has already been given by me and other members of the public. What we're looking for now, once we all see the information, is action based on. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jimmy. Jimmy, we've asked you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, uh, I'm Jimmy Lopez. I work in the ED at uh, Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. I've been there about 10 years. And I am calling in in support of my colleagues that have not gotten the raise, the staff developers, the nurse coordinators, the NPs, everybody that has been missed. I believe that it's unfair that they haven't gotten their raise. I think if you guys want more Sentinel events, you guys continue on this path, especially with staff developers, because they're so vital to a nurse's education and how they treat their patients and provide standard care. Um, I shout out to all, all the nurses at um, our three hospitals. They do such amazing work. They really do. And I hope you guys realign it and make it equitable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Salons. Jessica, we've asked you to unmute. 
Good morning. I wanted to, my name is Jessica Salins. I wanted to thank Supervisor Ellenberg for the appointment to the Health Advisory Commission and the board for approving the appointment. I'm speaking today on behalf of myself as an individual, not of the commission. Um, it's my intention to be there in person today. I'm hoping to secure a meeting with Supervisor Simidian, who is the chair of the Health and Hospital Committee. I was able to secure a 15 virtual meeting with Supervisor Lee later this month, which I appreciate. My concern and the reason that I joined the commission is our ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there are, our, our data collection is gone except for wastewater tracking. We have no free PCR test site, tests anymore. I'm watching immunocompromised friends navigate the risks of their healthcare appointments because providers are no longer mandated to wear masks in hospitals. It reminds me of when doctors weren't washing their hands at the turn of the 20th century when they, you know, were advising patients to smoke cigarettes. I think we can learn from history. Masks protect us from COVID. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patty Beeb. Hello. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk. My name is Patty Beebe. I'm a nurse educator at DMC. I teach orientation and other things, and I've been there since 2000. Uh, we need pay equity for all of the nurses. Uh, every one of us is vital to our mission, including NPs and public health nurses. I have just been blown away by all the speakers today. It's really amazing all the work that is happening. Uh, thankfully, there was a raise given for per diem and extra help nurses. And now, uh, as I see who comes to orientation, I see more per diem and extra help nurses to key areas. So pay matters. It matters a lot, and especially when it comes to hiring. So i um, grateful for your time. We need pay equity so that we can continue our work. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is A.H. We've asked you to unmute. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Uh, this is Andrew. I'm an emergency room nurse at Valley Medical Center. Just calling in uh, in support of my fellow nurses um, and uh, hope that you hear their concerns today and that we can align and, and get them the adjust the pay scale too that the rest of us got. And also I'm calling in just to speak on the fact that we are still masking here. It's great to see everybody there without, most people without masks on and the people that have them on have chosen to wear them. And we're asking, Still, that Jeff Smith gets rid of this administrative policy and lets us work here. There's no respiratory pressure on the hospital systems right now. And come November 1st, when the respiratory season starts again, we will be in masks again. And we're asking that that policy, administrative policy, is rescinded now and a lot. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sean. Sean, we've asked you to unmute. Hi, um, just a shout out to all the nurses. I uh, appreciate all the hard work that you do. Um, I do hope in general VMC gets better, taken unhoused people there and spent 20 hours waiting to get seen. Um, I wanted to bring up, it's Pride Month and uh, we need to do better for our unhoused folks who are LGBTQ. We have a camp that is full of uh, unhoused folks that are LGBTQ that is about to get swept by the city on the 12th. And then we have another camp that is going to be swept by Valley Water slash the city um, in a few months as well. And there's no, no place for them to go. There's those small amount of beds at New Haven Inn, uh, you know, but that when people are there six months at a time, you've got a whole lot of people fighting for, you know, 18 beds. So we need to do better for those folks. We can do better and I trust that you guys will do better. Thanks. Thank you. Our final speaker today is Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, thanks for taking public comment. Um, it was I, the last 
uh, public meeting I attended, Board of Supervisors meeting, you, you had some really interesting decisions then and just thought and, and, and dialogue around um, how to deal with tort issues and how to make that a more open, accountable process uh, for understanding and how to share that with the public uh, uh, for trial items and what their uh, uh, you know outcomes are. Um, good luck how that can transfer in the future to, say, closed session agenda items and how to talk about that subject so it can be a more open, clear subject. Because I really think there has to be uh, just a bit more of a, a language and summary that describes the closed session meeting agenda items to the public. It's such a vital service that most city governments practice. I don't understand you know, your esoteric reason. Thank you very much, and thank you once again to all of the members of the public who, who took time to come and share your very important thoughts with us. I appreciate all of you. Item seven is uh, to approve the consent calendar and changes to the Board of Supervisors agenda. Uh, Rhonda, do you wanna begin with the current status of the consent calendar? All right, we'll start with the corrections. Items number 4A and 4B. Item number 4A should reflect Supervisor Chavez as the submitter. Item 4B should reflect Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Arenas, and Vice President Lee as the submitters. Item 4A is to adjourn in honor and memory of Bishop Patrick Joseph P.J. McGrath. Item number 4B is to adjourn in honor and memory of George Escobar. There's a request from administration to continue item number 11 to September 19th, 2023. Item number 11 is a public hearing with an intent to purchase real property located at 10 Kirk Avenue in San Jose. There's a request from President Ellenberg to hold item number 21 to June 27, 2023. Item 21 is to receive a report relating to gun violence prevention activities. There's a correction to item number 23. The item should read as follows. Adopt resolution delegating authority to the county executive or designee to negotiate, execute, amend, or terminate a grant agreement with the California Health Facilities Financing Authority to administer, manage, and disperse grant funds within the terms of the grant agreement to provide capital cost funding for property acquisition or renovation of real property in, amount to not, in an amount not to exceed $2 million for period January 26, 2023 through June 30th, 2025 following approval by county council as to form and legality and approval by the office of the county executive. Delegation of authority shall expire on June 30th, 2025. There's a request from Supervisor Arenas to remove item number 64 from the consent calendar. Item number 64 is to receive a report relating to the completion of a county pay equity study and strategic plan. There's a request from Vice President Lee to remove item number 70 from the consent calendar. Item number 70 is to receive a report relating to the potential development of a separate trailer facility at 999 Hamlin Court in Sunnyvale. There's a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item 72 from the consent calendar. Item number 72 is to consider recommendations relating to options to provide coordinated responses to challenges confronting waterways in Santa Clara County. There's a correction to item number 83BI. The item should read as follows. ID, um, Supervisor Simidian nominates William B. Clayton Jr. for appointment to the Assessment Appeals Board 4, seat number four. Request from district attorney, I'm sorry, seat number three. Um, a request from district attorney to remove item number 86 from the consent calendar. Item number 86 is to receive a report relating to the work of the gun violence task force. 
For record, items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on the published agenda. Any party or their agents and any participant who has financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. And this concludes the consent calendar. Thank you very much, Rhonda. I will look to my colleagues for any changes. When we have uh, completed that, I'll go to public comment on the consent calendar as it stands at that time. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. Um, I I'm going to just make some co remarks on item 64, and so I won't pull it completely off. Um, the consent to go on to regular agenda. But I just wanted to take an opportunity to congratulate the Office of Women's Policy as well as the task force that um, executed this or oversaw this um, study um, that found that there was essentially no difference between uh, the pay for women and men um, in our organization. And I just wanted to take that opportunity to recognize that. I think there's a lot of times that um, we get things right, um, it, even in a bureaucracy, right? Um, and so I just wanted to take that opportunity. I know that there's a lot of really good work that our county is doing and we have to celebrate it. And one is that we pay um, our women and our men the same, um, no matter what the task is. Um, and so I'm, I'm really proud of that. I know that there are some, some questions around maybe the intersection of race and gender. And I think that's something that uh, maybe looked at next um, just for equity, uh, for the question of equity and to make sure that we have that um, under control. And so uh, congratulations to the Office of Women's Policy and to this organization as well as, um, of course, the administration, that's the, the leadership and everybody in between who's in charge of, of making sure that we um, are men and women and, um, and those who don't um, identify as such um, Supervisor Arenas, thank you. I just want to uh, confirm. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not stopping the comment. I'm, apologies. Are you, Are you still going to want to pull this off of consent? If so, we should hear it at that time. No, if this is a comment I'm, on consent. This is just a comment. By all means, yes. yes. Okay. I had prefaced my comment by saying that that I wasn't going to take it off agenda, and that this was just a remark to celebrate the really good um, uh, work of of administration and uh, everybody who um, contributes to this really great work. And so the final comment that I was just about to make was that um, I know that there's some question about the intersection of race and gender. And I know that that's something that we're going to continue to explore. Um, I'd love to see the results of that particular um, work. But in the meantime, I'm just celebrating this, this particular accomplishment and what um, this uh, represents in terms of values for our organization. Um, and so uh, congratulations to, to everyone. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, actually, I would like to pull 64. Uh, so I apologize for that. <laughs> if I, um, and uh, and I, I also, there are um, two others. I'd like to pull item 36. This is our behavioral health contracts. And, um, and it really is to, I'll just highlight for staff to ask a follow-up question about how we're managing um, more robust outreach so that, and whether or not that's embedded in these contracts. And then second, um, I'd like to pull item 29 and ask it to be heard with item 16. 29 is the, or I think I have this in the right order, is the mobile, um, is the mobile opioid contracts, and we're talking about the um, op op opioid settlement, so I thought they should be heard together. And then item 41, these are our healthcare contracts, and what I really wanna make sure I'm asked, that I'd like the staff to be prepared to respond to is, um, I saw there are some new metrics included in the, uh, in the um, contracts, I really wanted to ask a little bit about how we're going to make sure those metrics are met in particular with behavioral health issues. So if the staff would be prepared to respond to that, I don't need a whole presentation, but just would like a response to that. So that would be items 36, item 29, um, item 41, and item 64. Thank you. 
So I'm just looking for 41. Did I miss you say that too? 41, you're pulling off of consent. Correct. Okay. And 29 to here with 16. Correct. 36, 29, 41, and 64. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Supervisor Simidian, any amendments? First, uh, just a comment. Um, actually, I believe it is, let me just check my item number, Madam Chair. Item 72 um, is a contract with Valley Water that was referenced actually earlier by a speaker. Um, I will be an abstention and I am abstaining and looking to staff. That item has been pulled to the regular calendar. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, then I will abstain when the time comes uh, and I will not ask for it to go back on. Then that having been said, uh, Madam Chair and colleagues, we have been advised that certain items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language in our published agenda. Specifically, we have been advised that items get ready 26, 27, 28, 30, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 61, 62, 65, 72, 73, 74, 76, 77, 79, 84, 95, 96, 97, 98, 100, 101, 103, 104, 110, 111, 118, 119, 120, 122, 124, and 126 on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. I wanna ask at this time that if any party or their agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of the county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, any amendments? Nope. All right. I don't have anything to um, switch positions on, but I, I do want to make some brief comments on a couple of items. Uh, item 21 is a report from the Public Health on Gun Violence Prevention Strategies. This item uh, was supposed to be heard at the May uh, PSJC meeting, but time ran short, and our committee is scheduled to hear the report on Thursday at PSJC. Uh, so for transparency, that's why I'm holding it to the next board meeting to allow for a discussion at committee first. Uh, and just quickly related to this work, Dr. Smith, can you confirm that the $1 million to implement the gun violence prevention workshop as directed by the board on May 2nd and during the workshops will appear in the revised June budget? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Item 31, that wasn't pulled, right? Item 31 is the annual behavioral health uh, board work plan. Uh, thank you to the speaker. And I, I just as well want to thank a moment to recognize Supervisor Chavez and now Supervisor Arenas for their engagement on this board and with, and with all the members. Uh, I appreciate the efforts of Chair Ann Baumgartner to align the work of the Behavioral Health Board with the department's five strategic priorities. And I would encourage the Behavioral Health Board to continue to provide recommendations both to the Behavioral Health Department leadership on system improvements 
and to the Board of Supervisors to improve, to inform our work on the behavioral health system and areas the Behavioral Health Board sees for county improvement and investment. Uh, next, I want to thank our behavioral health staff and Kaminar for their continued support of the LGBTQIA Wellness Center noted in item 37 and for the work in item 32 to develop a plan for state consideration for a separate and dedicated transgender, non-binary, and gender expansive wellness center, which, we'd, which would be the first publicly funded center in the state to serve the needs of our TGE residents. Thank you um, for continuing to prioritize this work. Item, let me see, we're 46 is still on consent, so item 46. This is the CEO's recommendation for executive positions uh, for next year. Uh, Greta, I'd like you to please uh, plan to provide a verbal update at FGOC uh, during your COO report on the hiring for the special assistant to the CEO who'll be, who will be working on strategic planning. I'd also like to see quarterly FGOC updates on the work plan for that role after we hire someone. Uh, I would ask also that similar reports go to PSJC for the inmate rehabilitation director position, including hiring reports and then subsequent uh, work plan reports. I will um, incorporate that along with my colleague's additional direction into a motion for approval and look for a second. I'll second. Thank you very much. Do we have public speaker? Oh, uh, Greta, apologies. Uh, just a, one additional request from administration to hold item 45 to the next board meeting, please. And what is item 45, please? Uh, it's the, it's item, item 45 is um, two amendments to the job specs uh, for the inmate rehabilitation coordinator and a planning executive position. Got it. All right, thank you very much. Do we have public speakers? Yes, we have five um, in person and one currently on Zoom. All right, I will remind everyone in the chambers, if you're intending to speak on the consent calendar, now is the time to submit your yellow card. The in-person uh, speaking queue will close when the first person begins speaking. And for those of you on Zoom, um, raise your virtual hand now. If you intend to speak on the consent calendar, that queue will close when the first speaker on Zoom begins. So let's give everybody a second, Rhonda, and if we don't see anyone dashing down with late cards, we'll proceed. All right, our first speaker is Mark Trout. Let me go ahead and call everybody forward. Mark Trout, Jeff H., Alyssa German, Asha Dumonthier, and John Haggerty. Son of God. I identify as a son of God because I am. A wise king scattereth the wicked and brings the wheel over them. See here what is the business of magistrates. They are to be a terror to evildoers. They must scatter the wicked who are linked in confederacies to assist and embolden one another in doing mischief. And there is no doing this but by bringing the wheel over them, that is, putting the laws in execution against them. Now, I am not going to celebrate a man sticking his dick up the butt of somebody. And I am not a hypocrite, and you are all a bunch of hypocrites and liars, and Jesus had very zero tolerance, and Otto can't even stand it. He's a hypocrite, too. He walks out there. Listen, I'm telling you, words mean things. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be when I come back. And the day of vengeance of our God is coming. It's coming. It's coming very, very soon. And Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And in regards to his return at the end of the world, he said, these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. It was typified in the overthrow of ancient Judah in 70 AD when they rejected the Son of God. We have rejected the Son of God. We're doing the same thing. And I couldn't do better than just read these comments of this man, Matthew Henry, who God used in the life of George Whitfield, who read this commentary 21 hours a day for a year before he preached his first sermon. What is the qualification of magistrates which is necessary in order to do this? They have need to be both pious and prudent.
We call the remaining speakers. Oh, you've done so. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, honorable supervisors. My name is Jeff. I'm a resident of Santa Clara. I'm here to speak on item 71, the home key application for the Life Moves project on Benton. Thank you so much for supporting this project. It is exactly what our homelessness task force in the city of Santa Clara asked for. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elisa. I am the founder, director, and lead organizer of Santa Clara Housing Advocates. Uh, we have over 100 contacts on our email list and a long and growing list of expert organizations and community leaders who have given their public support. I, the members of Santa Clara Housing Advocates, and those listed in the support document that was sent to your offices are in strong support of the proposal uh, to co-sponsor the Home Key application and urge you to vote yes on item 71. On behalf of myself and all those I just listed, I thank you for taking the time to show us that the county cares about all its residents, not just the ones with housing. Thank you for supporting this incredible project. Hi, uh, my name is Asha Dumontier. I'm also here to speak on item 71 in the consent calendar regarding the application to Home Key for funds to build interim supportive housing at Lawrence and Benton in Santa Clara. Um, I'm a resident within a mile of the project and I'm very excited about it. I believe that there is a great need um, that I've seen personally as a resident, but also that the data supports for more supportive housing in our city. Um, and I thank you all for supporting this project. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is John Haggerty. I also am speaking about 71, not in support, but I do believe it should be taken off the consent calendar. Uh, Supervisor Lee has already taken 70, or is asking to take 70. The two are interrelated. Um, there's a Sunnyvale interim project that is currently family, um, but in order the Santa Clara in 71 uh, is... Um, is going to be made family, so it might deplete the family that's coming out of Sunnyvale. So I believe the two are interrelated, so that's one reason. Second reason is the total bill for this, for the taxpayers is 70 million, and we're talking about 30 families. So that's two million per family. You could buy each of those families a house for the 70 million. So I think this is a rushed thing because of the deadline for the application. I think you should consider it off the consent calendar. And then, um, uh, Finally, the, the resolution is not really, in, that's in item 71, is not in accord with the agenda because it doesn't give the county executive the power to terminate the application, as was noted to the public in the agenda. And, my, and finally, a small thing, but in the resolution, the county is referred to as the applicant, quote, quote, but at one point it's called the co-applicant. So there's confusion in the resolution that's at the heart of uh, item 71. So for the basis, on the basis of cost, agenda, and an interrelation with item 70 that uh, Supervisor Lee wants to address. I think that you should take 71 off the calendar, and I would urge you to vote against it if I have the chance to talk about it at that time. Thank you. That concludes our in-person speakers. We currently have four on Zoom. Thank you. A reminder for anyone else on Zoom that wants to speak on the items on the consent calendar, now is the time to raise your, your virtual hand. When the first speaker begins uh, speaking, we'll close the queue. All right. It looks like we're holding at five. Our first speaker is Sean. Sean, we've asked you to unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. I'm gonna try and cover three topics in two minutes. Um, first, um, I don't think any hate speech should be accepted at the Board of Soups. I've said this for years. I've said it about the same person. Um, you should really not accept hate speech. Secondly, uh, the acquisition of Tenkirk is a great idea. Third, I wholly support the uh, item 71, <clears throat> the Santa Clara Home Key Project. Um, with this caveat, it should not be life moves. 
life moves, um, has a proven track record of failure, of treating unhoused people poorly. There was the expose, that was an excellent expose on their track record. And their track record goes all the way back to when they had the safe parking program in South San Jose. Um, they've got, and that somebody was almost murdered at that program. The city of San Jose, the district attorney's office had to put two people in a hotel for a month to keep them safe. There were people that were treated poorly. We had to bring food there because Life Moves was not providing food. We regularly brought food. I can go on and on about that, but look into it. Life Moves does not treat people with any kind of dignity. And there's uh, Brian just waves people off. When you're in meetings, he just waves you off like, woohoo, you just don't exist. I just made everything disappear. He is not respectful. And from him down, it's not respectful. The uh, rate that they go through case managers is just ridiculous. People don't have case managers for months at a time. And then the way that they're treated, that you just have to report like every two weeks to see if you get an extension. People are not treated with any kind of dignity and people are back on the streets in Sunnyvale. All of them are back on the streets in Sunnyvale. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alan. Alan, we've asked you to unmute. Thank you very much. I would like to speak on item number 32 and item 71. So first of all, I would, as a transgender uh, resident of Santa Clara County, I am very much in support of the gender expansive and transgender mental health center. I think this is is going to be a great su uh, support for our uh, gender expansive and transgender community in this county. And about item 71, I, as a resident within a mile uh, of the proposed home key uh, site at Lawrence and Benton, I'm in strong support of supporting the homeless um, residents of Santa Clara County. And uh, I would like to uh, commend the county for supporting this a proposal and helping fund it. So thank you very much, and that's all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catalyze SB. Good morning, supervisors. This is Alex Shore with Catalyze SB, speaking in support of item 71, the proposal and the application for Project Home Key in the city of Santa Clara. We spoke with our members about this project a couple of weeks ago, and I referred to it in my letter to you yesterday. I hope you had a chance to quickly look at. Uh, and our members are supportive of housing for all. That includes uh, some of our neediest in our community, which is what this site and this project supposes. We want to continue to see public support from the community and from our elected officials to be solving this issue. And the best solution is, as always, permanent supportive housing, but it is also opportunities like this that help folks get off the streets and into homes. So we are supportive of this item. Uh, another note, we have got to do a better job in our community and local government uh, as community-based organizations, all of us, in having conversations that are difficult about development. The community meeting that I went to in the city of Santa Clara, and you all probably know I go to maybe hundreds of these meetings in the course of the last few years. The meeting I went to on this project in the city of Santa Clara was one of the most divisive meetings I have ever seen. It was something out of the drama of a movie. It was so There was so much anger toward this site and project, some of which is completely no fault of city or county staff, but we've got to rethink how we engage the community so that we can get to greater levels of understanding and build more support for the housing we need. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Whit Turner. Whit, we've asked you to unmute. Hi, good morning, supervisors. This is Whit Turner here on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition. Uh, we're here in strong support of the Interim Life Moves Project. 
Uh, we want to thank you for making this project a priority. Um, an interim housing site with supportive services will be critical in uh, serving our most vulnerable residents. So please move this project forward without any, delay, any delays. And uh, we thank you very much. Bye. And our final speaker that had their hand raised before the first speaker began speaking was Ken Kratz. My name is Ken Kratz and I support the county's proposed home key interim pro housing project item 71 to be located at the corner of Benton Street and Lawrence Expressway in the city of Santa Clara. I am a homeowner in the city of Santa Clara living within a half a mile from the proposed project. There is a serious need in my neighborhood for this promising proposal that will be a vital service to our unhoused and unsheltered neighbors. I've lived in the neighborhood for 45 years and worked for the city of Santa Clara as a public works inspector for 30 years. My childhood family received social services that prevented us from becoming homeless. It was a frightening time being so close to homelessness with few options. I toured the home key interim housing complex in Mountain View with others recently and was impressed by the complex and the friendly staff and residents. The complex provides privacy, safety, and community for residents, as well as offers professional case management on site. I think helping others in this well-planned and professionally managed project is not only compatible with my neighborhood, with nearby shopping, parks, schools, and public transit, but also socially, socially responsible in the long tradition of our county helping people. My childhood family would have been thankful for such an option. Thank you for proposing this facility in my neighborhood in Santa Clara. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the consent calendar by Ellenberg, second by Lee. Let's take a vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumedian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you very much. Our um, next three items, eight, nine, and 10, are to be at, heard at time certain, not before 10 a.m. We are at 11 a.m., so let's go ahead with, hey, um, the first item, the first public hearing, item eight on the county lighting service area assessments. Welcome. Yeah, good, mor <clears throat> good morning. Good uh, morning. Board of Supervisors, President Ellenberg, Harry Freitas, I'm the director of the Roads and Airports Department. This item number eight, public hearing to consider uh, protests and objections to the special district known as the county lighting service area and also to adopt a resolution uh, to set the assessments for the year. Thank you very much. Um, let's open the public hearing first to determine if any members of the public wish to comment on this item. We have no public speakers on this item. Then I will close the public hearing and look to my colleagues for any comments or questions on this item. I'm ready to make Supervisor a motion oh. to adopt resolution of the governing board of the County of Lighting Services area approving assessment for fiscal year 20 through 24 for CLSA. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Motion by Lee. Second by Chavez. Uh, any comments by anyone? No. Nope. Let's vote. Supervisor Reynas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Item nine is a public hearing on the county sanitation district number 2-3, fiscal year 23-24, sewer service changes. It's a same, same item, uh, consider um, uh, protests and objections to setting the assessments for the, sewer, um, the sanitation districts and uh, then adopting a resolution setting the rates. I will uh, look open the public hearing on this item. Any comments from the public? Oh, there is one public comment, I'm sorry, from Paul Soto on Zoom. Excellent. Let's um, I'll just then remind anybody else on Zoom, if you're intending to speak on item nine, public hearing, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. When the first speaker begins speaking, we will close the queue. Paul, we've asked you to unmute. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, when issues of sanitation, uh, garbage, things started surfacing within the context of the city, it was discovered that even the contracts that the city signs and that is referred is those are different systems. Like say, for example, uh, Willow Glen has one system and then other parts of the city have other systems. And so when you look at that, you can say, ah, well, you know, they're just using different services. But there are certain things within those particular contracts that differ. And these are the issues that where, like, you wouldn't think that we've institutionalized um, uh, uh, violations of equal protection under the law or due process. But when you look at these, you see that certain areas are going to receive different treatment. And so this is, so uh, what I'm doing is, I'm, I'm, the reason why I'm saying that as a, as a cautionary is that when, you, when we're having these discussions and when these contracts are signed, what kind of mechanisms and what kind of uh, are in place in order to ensure that one particular area of our county from the same pot of money is not getting certain preferential treatment simply because they are who they are. Uh, because that would be the perpetuation of the very things that we are trying to amend when we're talking about racial equity, when we're talking about all of these systemic ways in which uh, certain areas of our city and county have been affected, it starts there. So my comments are restricted to just simply being cautionary and to really pay close attention to how we deal with something, even like sanitation. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, do we, we had a motion by Lee, second by Chavez? Not, yet. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, apologies, that was the last item. Uh, do we have comments, uh, colleagues? I'm happy to make a motion to approve. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let's, oh, it didn't close the public hearing. Public hearing closed. We had no comments, <laughs> questions by board members. Motion by Lee, second by Chavez. Let's take a vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Our uh, third and final public hearing this morning is on the vector control district assessments. That's item 10. Good morning. Good morning, well, Dr. Supervisor. My name is Nayyad Zahiri. I'm the Vector Control District Manager. We are here for 23-24 benefit assessment. Thank you very much. We'll open the public hearing. Do we have speakers on this item? I currently do not have any. I just noticed there were people at the back table. Can the clerk please at the back table confirm there are number? No speakers for this item? Perfect. We're good to go. We have none on Zoom. Excellent. Then I will close the public hearing. Turn to my colleagues for comments, questions, or a motion. So moved. Second. second. Motion by Chavez, second by Arenas. Let's take a vote. Supervisor, Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Item 11 has Thank been you. continued Thank to you. September. Thank you very much. To, to September 19th, which brings us to our time certain at 11 a.m. item. And we are past 11. This is um, my resolution for the CSAC at home plan and at home coalition for accountability. Uh, so thank you to my, my colleagues for hearing this out. A few months ago, uh, my colleagues on the county, uh, California State Association of Counties Board and I worked to create a comprehensive homelessness plan or guiding set of principles with the intent to engage our own colleagues, mayors, city council members, and state legislators in meaningful discussions about the need for a statewide coordinated solution to one of our most significant crises. 
About a month ago, I published an op-ed in the Merck and East Bay Times with my colleagues Contra Costa County Supervisor John Joya and Alameda County Supervisor Keith Carson to further explain the principles and path to implementation. It is my honor to invite Graham Knaus, the uh, Chief Executive Officer of CSAC, to offer a very brief presentation on the plan and its growing influence in policymaking and funding determinations. And Graham is on Zoom, Rhonda, and may need to be promoted to uh, panelist if that hasn't already been done so. Graham Knaus with a K. They have been promoted. Thank you. Uh, Graham, you are welcome to unmute and make a brief presentation. Thank you and welcome. All right, good morning, um, President Ellenberg and members of the board. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to spend a few minutes, moments with you this morning. Uh, I first wanted to really thank uh, President Ellenberg and really all of Santa Clara County for the incredible work that you all have been doing and your leadership around homelessness because it was uh, a really integral part of our learning and the crafting of the at-home plan. Um, we were fortunate to have both uh, Supervisor Ellenberg as part of our executive committee um, driving it there, but also uh, Santa Clara County expertise uh, internally. And so um, a nod to Destination Home CEO, Jennifer Loving, and also um, Tamiqua, Moss at All Home California, who have been helpful resources to us as we've been working through this effort. Ultimately, at home is about shared governance, which is to say there is no system to address homelessness in California and really in any other state in the country. And we need to change that so that communities are armed with the authority, the resources, and the flexibility to do things in a way that makes sense to them. And that requires a state role, a county role, and city role, um, along with a whole host of nonprofit partners. And that's where this plan comes from. And there's a particular uh, focus in, in the plan around permanent supportive housing and really all the housing options that are necessary to uh, house the homeless. And the model in Santa Clara County with your Measure A housing bond and the policy and leadership and investments that you have been making have really helped shape that. And um, and so I really wanna applaud the thousands of new uh, permanent supportive housing units that have been put in place in the county because that is a model for what others can do across, uh, across the state. Um, ultimately at home is accountability, which is defining who's responsible for what aligned to resources and accountability. Transparency, which is about data to determine what is working and what is not working. Housing, which is about shelter, transitional housing, and permanent supportive housing. Um, outreach, which is both about having a sufficient workforce and about having that emergency response system when someone falls into homelessness. Mitigation, which is largely county health and human services that are provided on behalf of the state and federal governments with focus on behavioral health. Um, and, um, and then economic opportunity, pathways out of homelessness and poverty, and um, also recognizing that there are some individuals who are homeless and have such a severe disability that they are not um, gonna be positioned to become self-sufficient. And we need to uh, both acknowledge and address that uh, as we move forward with an overall approach to homelessness. What we're trying to get accomplished this year is specific to the first pillar of accountability, clear responsibilities for all levels of government, ongoing funding commitment from the state, and clarity about what the county versus what the city versus what the state would be responsible for. So specifically cities being responsible for um, the housing related items in terms of siting, standing up and doing administrative operations for shelters and transitional housing, siting permit supportive housing, and having the county in as the health and human services provider with a particular focus around the homeless uh, population. Um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of policy recommendations that are comprised within our overall plan, which is available 
on our website at counties.org. So certainly would encourage folks to take a look at input as we can get from every perspective. That's what makes it real and impactful. And we're having very positive conversations with the governor's office, the legislature, our colleagues at Cal Cities and others um, to make progress on this this year, um, hopefully over the next uh, 10 days as we move towards the final um, state budget adoption. So uh, with that, uh, let me hand it back to President Ellenberg and really thank you all so much for this opportunity and for your leadership on homelessness. Thanks very much, Graham. I wanna thank you and the CSAC staff who have made um, creating this state, state level homeless, um, homelessness prevention and ending plan the key and priority work of, of the association for this year. And the gains that, that you have all made thus far has really been tremendous. So thank you for that work and leadership. And, and I'm glad to be a part of the journey. Um, we'll look to see Supervisor Chavez has uh, yes. questions or comments. Yes, thank you. Um, so first of all, Susan, thank you for being so active in CSAC. It's such an important organization. and. You know, I, I think CSAC is such a small team. Uh, Graham, I feel like you're everywhere. Um, so appreciate the, the work. Um, I just had two comments. One is more broad, and that is that, I, you know, the resolution is really, um, it's very good, but I, I would just recommend as we um, codify in the future how we're addressing homelessness that we really use these kinds of documents to benefit, to, um, to further explain the work being done. And as an example, um, and I appreciate the, the highlight of Measure A, but the county has been doing so much with its general fund dollars relative to housing, in particular, you know, under Supervisor Simidian's leadership, a focus on the disabled. And, and so that's actually one issue. And then the other is that we spend so much of our own general fund dollars on the services. And the only reason I would want that explained is so that as at a state level, I think, often they treat counties and cities as recalcitrant uh, institutions. Right. Joe, I'm sure you did that at one point. <laughs> not Joe. Um, but recalcitrant institutions that are, are not putting their best foot, foot forward in terms of resolving the problems and that when we come to the state, it's because we're not doing our fair share. And I think just making sure that when we divine these kinds of documents that they're really robust in terms of explaining our our um, work because in a, in a way it explains better the, the framework that you um, outlined. So anyway, it's a small thing, but just as a future opportunity. It, it, thank you. It, it's actually a big thing and a really excellent point. We started um, with a template that is, that is being offered to all counties and I wanted to make sure that um, uh, we had Consuelo and Key weigh in and add um, some of the some of the work that we have been doing to make exactly that point, um, but perhaps we were too uh, too conservative or too timid in really laying out everything our county has done because I think that is a really um, important piece. And I'm I'm wondering, I, I I would love I'm hoping to see this pass today, but I'm also very interested in not missing an opportunity. So I wonder if... Um, I would just do it in a cover letter. At, that's yeah. what I was just going to say, a cover yeah. letter or th that doesn't need to come back to the board, but that yeah. really robustly um, records all of, the, all of the work that's being done. And, and so, if I had to yeah. choose a theme for local mm -hmm. government, what I would want our theme to be, especially at a county level, is we are all in. So... Since right. we're all in, we actually need them to be all in, and that's that's the that's the theme I would be looking at. And then the only other um, issue I wanted to raise, and this is really more a question um, for you all, as it relates to the accountability pillar. Um, I guess what I'm wanting to understand is, is this something that um, that you anticipate being part of state? law or are you asking for this to be a funding framework or an approach framework and if so how does it get adopted and by whom some of both and that's an excellent uh, question as well Graham I'm uh, assuming you're still here can we bring him um, uh, yes I am President Elberg we're we're absolutely we have crafted uh, language that would go into statute to implement 
this uh, clarity of responsibility aligned to funding so that you have an investment from the state that is directly connected to the results that would occur, the expected results that would occur at the local level um, through one countywide plan, funding going through that plan and through your uh, one um, big city in San Jose receiving dollars directly, continuing to receive dollars directly as well. But a good chunk of it would be put into statute to ensure that there is a real framework that is in place that defines who's supposed to do what, um, which is the linchpin of having any level of accountability. So I, I would just offer that um, I, I do, I do appreciate that as, as being foundational. Like, I think that's, that's accurate. The two areas that I would just want to make sure don't get left out, um, one is that the systematic um, role that the state plays, particularly as it relates to, um, you know, the, the, de the, the departments that are responsible for tax credits as an example, are, um, in my, from my perspective, not very accountable to anyone, and in part because each of these are legislative, off I mean, elected officials' offices that are pretty separate from each other. And so my, my only point is, is that I think as you look at the state, each of the offices, controller, treasurer, all of them, mm -hmm. have some very significant role and you know, and I think in some respects, we put a lot of pressure and emphasis on the governor's office, and the governor's office certainly has a lot of say-so in terms of how um, all the other offices function, but the fact of the matter is that at that level of government, it, it has cost us incredible amounts of money and slowed the pipeline for housing down so dramatically as only to be um, responsible for the increased cost in everything that we build five or six years later, because at least one to three years is spent trying to draw down tax credits. That's one example. The other I would use is that something that is a little more, again, that that's, um, leadership is somewhat more diffuse is as we look at the CSU system and the UC system, both having their own boards and making decisions on financing. One of the areas that we're drawn into financing for housing is um, student housing because we have now homeless students. So. My, my only point is is that as you're looking at the accountability mechanisms, having a a um, well-rounded group of people who are looking very specifically about where resources could be made available and where timelines could be dramatically improved may be beneficial as it relates to um, the accountability because we think of it at a local level, what's the difference between a city and a county, but at a state level, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to see an office where they've pointed me to another office. Mm -hmm. So. I know Joe's looking surprised. He's looking very shocked, surprised. Shocked. shocked. Um, but in, in any case, um, I, I think this is really exciting. I think this is a definite, wonderful um, first step. I really appreciate the visionary leadership, Susan, of you and the other leaders at um, CSAC and want to make sure that if we're going to be holding people accountable, it's really got to be mutual or, again, we get treated like recalcitrant children instead of, you know, really acknowledging where we have had, you know, success and, and failures, to your point, which I think are really important to talk about as well. Thank you so much for all of that. The mutual accountability is absolutely key, and CSAC has spent uh, at least the last several years and, and likely longer really working to build leverage in, in both the legislature and the administration in order to be able to, to insist on that, that mutuality. Um, I think your, your points about holding not only the governor's administration writ large and the legislature accountable, but really looking to departments and the tax credits is a really excellent example because I know that projects have fallen apart waiting for, waiting for tax credits um, that simply don't come in time. Yes, so, um, and, and I'm sure there are, there are additional departments. So Graham, I, I would say to you that as we're thinking about um, this accountability mechanism. I know this is, you know, both both a living document and something that we want to to nail down and have everybody sign. Really thinking about how broad that accountability needs to be, uh, I think would be very advantageous, truly for cities and for counties, and therefore should be for the state. 
and um, with regard, so I'll, I'll make a motion to um, uh, to approve the resolution, and I will add direction to myself on that to work on a cover letter with Key Consuelo, and I'm happy, you're, I'm not brown acted with anybody on this, if you'd like to partner, um, and making sure that that letter includes everything you want, I would be glad to do that and would, would welcome a second. Second. Thank you very much. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, I'm looking forward to voting aye in a moment. I did want to ask the maker and the seconder if they were willing to incorporate language we sometimes use when there is a wide ranging, still moving, multi-parted plan mm -hmm. uh, to simply ask that the minutes specifically reflect that um, individual board members may or may not agree with every single one of the individual pieces of the plan, which as Mr. Naus indicated, uh, is uh, up on the site. I went and looked at it, and um, I, I want to speak in support of the motion in a minute, so I don't want that to be the wet blanket, but if we could get that detail taken care of first. And in ask, the language of the resolution? Just, it just um, in the minutes of the meeting. Okay, got it. So that someday when somebody comes and says, you supported, because it was on page 38B of the appendix, uh, we can say, actually, no, we supported the plan, but we all indicated that there might be individual pieces where we had a slightly different take. Is that agreeable? Absolutely. To the, thank thank you. you for that. Thank you. That being said, um, I want to have some fun with this item uh, in addition to saying uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to start through the chair, if I may, by looking at Dr. Smith and uh, Mr. Williams, our county executive and our county uh, council, and say, uh, gentlemen, if I were to ask you who's responsible for indigent health care in the state of California, you would say? The counties. And if I were to say, pursuant to what authority, you would say? Um, section 15,000. Of? The Welfare and Institutions Code? WIC. There we go. OK. But if I were to say, who's responsible for um, homelessness in the state of California, you would say? Cities. Oh, OK. <laughs> and if I were to say, pursuant to what authority, you would say? Their land use authority. OK. And I'm guessing that that's not the same answer that we would get. Mr. Williams is definitely leaning back and not in on this one. And I mean that in a good way. Mr. Williams, uh, would you care to offer an observation or a response? I don't actually know that I would give a radically different answer. I would just make one sm small correction, which is it's 17,000 of the Welfare and Institutions Code. Ah, okay, just for the record. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What did I say? 15,000. 15. Uh, that's all right. No worries. Sorry. So um, thank you, because that helps me then. Uh, oops, now, uh, Madam Chair, through the chair, I see Dr. Smith leaning in again. Hey, I want to support my argument about the cities being responsible. Um, ABAG has arranged for many years to give all the municipal jurisdictions, RENA targets, which are um, requirements for producing affordable housing. And so as part of that, the county has a responsibility for the unincorporated area, but the vast majority of the area is incorporated. So that's why I think it's their job to do that. Point taken. Uh, and uh, the reason I was being um, a little bit um, rhetorical uh, question like there, Madam Chair, and or Socratic method for the veterans of law school uh, is because uh, this question has, or this issue has come up uh, frequently in conversations I have in the community and with elected officials. And relatively high level elected officials, relatively well informed folks, um, often start the conversation with, well, given that homelessness is the county's responsibility, and I have to say, whoa, 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 whoa. And um, to some extent, we've put ourselves in that situation because we looked around, saw that the problem wasn't being adequately addressed and leaned in. And, and because many of these folks are also our clients in other venues, we said, gotta step up, gotta step in. Um, but I remember very, clearly and painfully, the city council meeting at one of the 15 cities and towns in this county that I attended, where we were attempting to find common ground on uh, addressing the homeless challenges in the community, and one of the council members turned to their colleagues and said, well, you know, if we're gonna help the county with its homeless problem, and, you know, of course, I'm sitting there thinking, really, it's the county's homeless problem, even though these are residents of this particular community, 
they're sleeping in the backyards and parks in this particular community and under the overpasses in this particular community and they many of them had lives and histories that predated their status as homeless folks that were in those particular communities and they feel a particular affinity for those particular communities and what i think um, for all of the work that we have yet to do and this is where i want to give csac the shout out is um, i i have often had to say to people you know there there really is no system and there is no one who is legally accountable uh, in the sense that we can identify the uh, code section in the Welfare Institutions Code that uh, deals with indigent health care. And so we've been left to exhort folks to sort of take a piece of the problem if they can. And, and to their credit, a great many folks in a great many venues, individual community members, nonprofits, local governments, have stepped up and in on that. But I, I think this, um, you know, as someone who is looking back now with Supervisor Chavez on a decade on this board and this most recent stint, you know, the time is long, long since passed for folks to sort of sit down at the table and say, all right, who's got which piece of the problem and, and how are we going to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable for that? So uh, I'm. Uh, I'm usually not inclined to lean in and just sort of riff on something like this, but I, I was so pleased to see it, and I think it very much addresses a very clear issue out there, which is everybody thinks somebody ought to do something about homelessness, and they think somebody else ought to be the somebody, and that's never going to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, I certainly... Um, uh, want to, to also chime in and, and thanks for the great comment. First of all, thank you for, very much for the motion and the hard work you've done with CSAC. Uh, by the way, being the representative of CSAC from the county, you have done an awesome job, uh, uh, President uh, Allen Berg, and I just want to comment uh, that and also uh, thanks, Graham, for, for speaking today uh, on this issue. Second of all, uh, kind of uh, in addition to what uh, Supervisor uh, Sumidian has mentioned regarding homeless issues, uh, only one county is combined with city in that San Francisco. It's the county and city of San Francisco, so there's no a lot of who, who does what. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I certainly see this as not only city issue, but in terms of county-wise, we also have a huge role to play, specifically linked to the fact that many of the house issues also related to other medical issues like mental health issues, substance abuse issues, which of course those are the areas where we uh, as a county has our hospital, uh, and and, uh, and and that type of work. So I certainly do believe that there is a joint role that we really need to work together. Uh, and I, I'm very pleased to see that we certainly have that spirit right here in Santa Clara County. And we certainly look forward to working with our different partners in the 15 towns and cities to help resolve this huge issue uh, one day at a time. And we're going to have a discussion on item 14 later on to talk a lot about those additional beds we're increasing. Um, uh, and that's really exciting, but I just want to just kind of chime in of how important this is something that we really uh, take my own staff, say this one issue that I go to bed every night to think about and want to make sure that we are working on this every day, little by little. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Aranas. Oops. Uh, thank you. I just want to also chime in and um, and say thank you for all the work that has been done to to have this plan to um, really guide all of us. And the truth is that every level of government is responsible for their um, community. And as a more recent uh, addition to this uh, board and coming from the city, uh, when I joined the city, when I first joined the city and I asked somebody from housing, why aren't we why aren't we paying special attention to children and families? They said, uh, to what end? Uh, that person's no longer in that housing department, I'm glad to say, but um, <laughs> it, and not because of that comment, but simply I think they just didn't fit into the efforts of a housing department because it's not, it's no longer about just building. And, and yes, we, you know, the cities need to build. That's their uh, primary, one of their primary functions. Um, but we know that uh, providing a place for somebody to sleep isn't quite the answer. They need a lot of the wraparound services that we know are um, key to making that home and 
uh, and that transition to a permanent home successful. And so that takes all of us to do that and changing really, just shifting the mindset in terms of whose responsibility it is. And it's all, all of our responsibilities. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to have these kinds of conversations that unite us rather than differentiate, differentiate our roles. Um, and to continue to build on those relationships within our districts so that we are all on the same page, if you will, as we're moving um, towards addressing our unhoused community in our respective districts. We need to have the relationships with those cities. We need to have the relationships with our nonprofits. Um, and, and more importantly, we need a, 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 um, a North Star, and so I'm, I'm really happy that we have something that outlines exactly how the whole state will be looking at um, moving together. And so congratulations for all the work that's been done. Um, I look forward to seeing how this all unfolds, and, and especially the, the money that goes, uh, that connects all of this uh, together. The money certainly is is a big linchpin here. I just want to thank all of my colleagues for your really thoughtful comments. And Graham, I hope you see just how lucky I am to be part of this this really outstanding board. And um, and you you reference thank you for acknowledging Destination Home and Jen Loving because it was the first iteration of the Santa Clara County Community Plan to End Homelessness that was the model for much of this work because we had. Um, delineated roles for, for city, for county. We had the participation of the housing authority, of nonprofit uh, organizations of all 15 in our cities. And for eight years, we have been moving in the same direction. And I think that the success that we have shown um, really should speak to a continuation of, of this direction um, because ultimately, and I, I think we'll, we'll all agree, that, that deeply affordable and permanent and supportive when necessary housing really is the sustainable solution to ending homelessness. And the things that we do along the way, including interim and temporary shelters, uh, are important. But I think it's critical that we don't lose sight of the end goal. Um, I was describing it to someone as a theater production. The, the play is the thing. You need rehearsals, you need a dress rehearsal, you need all of those things, but that's not what should merit the greatest attention, that's not where the greatest investment should be made. Those are all in pursuit of the end goal of, of housing. So. Again, I'm, I'm just I'm truly grateful to all of you. I wanna make one um, ad additional note in, um, in the area of, of family homelessness because families were the, the one target population uh, whose numbers really scarily increased in our most recent point in time count. And families need housing. They, they can't live in, in shelters, in congregate spaces. Um, many people can't, many, many family members can't live together uh, necessarily in a, in a tiny home or another shelter. So we have so much work to continue to do, but I am deeply proud and grateful to all of you of the work that we have done. Do, and thank you again, Graham, for, for making time. I know you're dipping in and out of multiple meetings today, so thank you very much for your time and expertise. And Rhonda, do we have public speakers on this item? I do have one Zoom speaker. All right, I'll note that for anyone else on Zoom, if you're wishing to speak on this item, right now is the time to raise your virtual hand. When the first speaker begins speaking, we'll close the queue. Thanks, Rhonda. All right, Sean, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept, oh, we have one more, pause little. Um, Sean, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Um, I had a question of where utilities fit into this, because uh, obviously uh, the railroads, uh, Valley Water, uh, things like that are heavily tied into this situation. So I'm kind of curious where they fit in, and I'm also curious where you can make them fit into the conversation. For instance, right now, Valley Water is doing this huge project that affects a ton of unhoused people, and 
the county in many ways is not part of this, but the city is, but the county could just do it better um, because the county has New Haven in and the city isn't tied into that. You know, you see where I'm going here. Um, also, I wanted to just a couple of grammar issues. Um, it's just my way. Um, I just want to make sure that we're, it's not a, a homeless problem. It's a housing problem and homelessness is a result of that. Um, and I want to make sure that we continue to say unhoused people instead of the unhoused. Um, just want to make sure that we keep track that these are all people. Um, and then um, I also, um, I, it's just really, I want to know where utilities fit in because, and if you have the ability to make utilities fit in. So when you're talking about something or if the city isn't, when you say this is city, this is county, this is state, and something's happening, do you have the ability to step in and say, look, we're the county, but we think that we could help out better in this city issue? Um, is that a possibility? Um, just a thought. That's all. I know you never know respond to questions, but I want you to. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we do not generally respond to questions, but I'll just um, make a note that the uh, utilities, um, um, had the, the, the utilities and special districts have joined the coalition of supporters for this plan. Um, we're, we're working with them and I, I think it's a really intriguing idea for them to be fully folded into the countywide plan. And I wonder um, if Supervisor Chavez or, or um, Simidian, do you know if um, utilities and special districts were part of our community plan to end homelessness? They weren't, and um, and I think it's actually a really good point because, you know, one of our biggest challenges is is working with them. And the uh -huh. other thing I would uh -huh. just add is that the the other point that was made that I thought was thoughtful is that there has to be a role for s special districts, and special districts for the most part are creations from state legislation. And so, that's actually a really really excellent point that it's it's everybody's responsibility. Yeah, and thank you. That was a, a break with form, and I and I hope I don't get uh, in trouble uh, having having uh, directly responded to a, a public comment. Um, it's not a great practice, but it was really just hard to hard to resist uh, that moment. And um, I'll follow up with with Graham as well on that piece. And with that interruption, uh, my apologies. And let's hear our final speaker. Um, Paul Soto, you lowered your hand. Did you wish to speak on this item? If so, please raise your... There we go. We've asked you to unmute. You should be able to speak. Oh, yes. Hello? Hello. Can you there. It, thank you. It is extremely frustrating because my hand stays up. I will never ever pull it down. Just, just please note that. Never. Now, thank you for that report, Mr. Mr. Noss. You talked very clearly about the legal issues. What was not talked about within this context is redlining. Now, the county executive has gone on record because he is accurate in that assessment. And that is that redlining and all of the associated policies created these deficits that we are now continuing with 80 years later, 1939 till now. So until we get to the point where we are properly centering that conversation and, and detailing all the political, economic, social uh, consequences of that, you can continue to write resolutions, you can do whatever it is you want, and you will never, ever, ever address their issue. Why? Because the truth of what has happened here in this city and in this county has not appropriately or properly been contextualized in these budget allocations. You see, when you attach that, and the, and, and the literally horrific, I speak as a resident of D11, that barrio was completely deprived of resources to allow it to have a vibrancy and to how, allow it to survive into the next generations. And because of that, now when all these billions of dollars are coming to the city, these are the populations that are vulnerable. They are the most vulnerable. Why? Because we created this system. And so now to try to do something to amend it 
but not properly contextualized to that history is, is it's irresponsible. It, it, it's irresponsible, unethical, and immoral. Because I'm not concerned with the legal questions because redlining was legal. So I don't care about that. I want the moral and ethical responsibility. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a motion by Ellenberg, a second by Chavez. Let's vote on this item. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion Aye. carries. Thank you. And again, thank you to my colleagues. Uh, some housekeeping. We're going to take up item 13 right now, which is uh, first a Levine Act item. So I'll ask for that announcement in a moment. Um, this is the uh, OSE compatible use determination for 2245 Liberata Drive in Morgan Hill. We're going to hear this item and then um, I believe we're going to break for lunch. If we finish before 1230, we'll hear the county executive and the county council's report, um, but we have a, a, a and the next slew of items to be heard no earlier than one. So it will either be just 13 or 13 and county council and county exec. All right. Item number 13 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. And through the chair, before we begin, Madam Chair, we have right been ahead. advised that uh, item 13 on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language on our published agenda and as just shared with us by our clerk. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member, as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings has made uh, such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would, of course, also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any other member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, procedurally, this, this is um, a, an appeal that is not a, a commonly taken up item by our board. So I'll note uh, to the clerk of the board that we're going to offer uh, the appellant, Mr. Lyle, seven minutes of public comment. We're going to hear then from Actually, what's the order? Do we hear from planning first and then the appellant? Correct? Are you nodding at me, Jack? Okay, thank you. So we will hear first from uh, the county planning department. Then we will hear from Mr. Lyle, who has up to seven minutes for public comment, a response from the planning department, and then three minutes uh, for a, um, a response or rebuttal by the appellant. So let's begin and thank you for guiding me through this. Good morning, President Ellenberg, board members. Jacqueline Anciano, Director of Planning and Development. With me today is Principal Planner Sam Gutierrez, Senior Planner Laura Tran, and Deputy County Counsel Christina Stella. We are here on item number 13, which is an appeal of the director's decision on a compatible use determination Mr. Gutierrez, Sam will present on this item. Thank you. Good morning, President Ellenberg and supervisors. Again, my name is Sammy Gutierrez, principal planner, and I have worked with senior planner Laura Tran on the appeal of the planning director's decision for the compatible use determination that is located within an open, existing open space easement. The decision before you is to uphold or deny the appeal of the director's determination. In parallel, there is a development application before the zoning administrator, which has been continued pending the decision of the appeal of the compatible use determination today. Concerns have been raised by the appellant and other stakeholders that are not pertinent to today's hearing, and these concerns 
will be considered and addressed at the forthcoming zoning administration hearing. However, in light of that, in light of the concerns that have been raised, staff will describe and provide responses to each concern today. Staff recommends that the board deny the appeal and determine that the proposed residential development is a compatible use with the existing open space easement on the subject property. In the following presentation, staff will detail how the residential development is consistent with the criteria listed in section C1339, compatible uses and development within the county code of ordinances. To begin, the project location, the subject property is located at 2245 Liberata Drive, west of Anderson Lake and the city of Morgan Hill in unincorporated Santa Clara County. An aerial view of the subject property is provided on this slide that identifies the location of the subject property and the appellant's property. The subject property is a vacant 27.1 acre lot and an open space easement contract over the property has been active since 2007. For clarity, the open space easement encompasses the entire property. In accordance with the County Code of Ordinances, Section C13-39, a compatible use determination is required when development and new uses are proposed on a property with an active open space easement. In this case, the Gutierrez residential project consists of residential development and uses that include a single family residence, a detached accessory dwelling unit, and a detached three-car garage. As previously mentioned, a discussion on the, on the current land use entitlement for residential development is not as what before the board today. That action is on hold pending the outcome of the compatible use determination appeal and would move forward to a continuation hearing before the zoning administrator if the board were to deem the residential development a compatible use and deny the appeal. The board's determination to uphold or deny the appeal would be based on the criteria for compatible uses and development under section C13-39A. Under this section of the County Code of Ordinances, there are four criteria that staff considered when evaluating the compatible use determination for the subject property. The first criterion involves a determination if the proposed development preserves public use and enjoyment of the natural scenic character of the land. In this case, the development and the proposed land coverage encompasses less than 1% of the 27.1 acre lot, leaving the majority of the lot as undeveloped open space in a natural state, preserving the enjoyment of the natural landscape. This is also consistent with the open space easement contract restrictions which limit the development of uses to 5% total land coverage of the property, maintaining 95% of the parcel as open space. Therefore, given these factors, the development proposal for residential uses complies with this criterion and the finding can be made. <clears throat> the second criterion states that the develop that the proposed development does not significantly impair the open space character of the land. In this situation, the development uses a, is clustered to the far eastern corner of the lot in close proximity to the subdivision surrounding Anderson Lake, again, leaving the majority of the property as open space. The third criterion states simply that the project not be a subdivision. In this case, the project is a residential development and is not a subdivision. Therefore, the development proposal for residential uses complies with both criteria two and three, and the findings can be made. The fourth criterion states that the proposed use or development must comply with federal, state, and local ordinances, regulations, and the county's general plan. Staff has conducted a preliminary review of the development project and its compliance with the applicable regulations and the county's general plan in consideration of the concurrent land use entitlements that are pending a decision on the appeal of the compatible use determination. The development and uses meet those requirements 
required criterion as the development project appears to be consistent with the applicable laws, regulations, ordinances, and guidelines. Thus, this finding can be made. The, this analysis for residential development's consistency with the criteria for the compatible use determination approval form the basis of the planning director's decision. A determination on the concurrent land uses for building site approval, design review, and grading approval has not been rendered by the approving authority. Again, that determination is pending the board's determination on the compatible use determination appeal and is subject to a public hearing before the zoning administrator, whose decision is subject to appeals before the planning commission and further appealable to the board of supervisors. The appellant and interested parties have raised concerns relating to the compatible use determination that are not pertinent to the basis for making a compatible use determination. Since these concerns have been raised, staff would like to respond to each concern. As mentioned before in the presentation, the proposal for development is consistent with the criteria for compatible use determination. The specifics of the development and its consistency with the requirements for the concurrent land use entitlements, as mentioned before, would be determined at a forthcoming public hearing before the zoning administrator. <clears throat> the first statement that is related to the placement of the development on the ridge line and the county's general plan describes that the development may be allowed for ridge line and hillside development if there is no alternatives and there is mitigation. Staff has conducted a site visit and the development is not located on a ridge line. In addition, story poles will be installed prior to a public hearing for the concurrent land use development applications. The second statement is related to the removal of trees and the impact of sensitive plants from the development. The applicant is proposing up to 185 trees and mitigation measures from the habitat plan are incorporated as part of the conditions of approval for addressing possible impacts to sensitive plants related to the development project. The, the third statement of appeal is that the development will create drainage issues for neighboring properties. The project was reviewed by land development engineering to make certain erosion and drainage standards are implemented for driveway and grading design and incorporated as part of conditions of approval for that project. Finally, the last statement of appeal is that the development will create visual impact from the neighborhood. The project includes landscaping and tree replanting that will screen the driveway and the proposed structures and minimizing any visual impacts from the development. Given that the grounds for the appeal submitted by the appellant are not relevant to the criteria of approval for the compatible use determination for an open space easement, and that the development and uses comply with the criteria for approval, staff recommends that the board deny the appeal of the open space easement compatible use determination and uphold the, the planning director's decision. This concludes staff's presentation and we are available for questions that the board may have. Thank you. And if I may, um, President Ellenberg, the applicant, the property owner and his team is here also and would like to have opportunity to speak. Thank you. I have um, just one clarifying question to ask. Um, my understanding is that we are only talking about the compatible use today, um, not any specifics of the design, where a, where a project would be located, et cetera. Why then on slide seven did you go through those issues related to development since they allegedly shouldn't be part of your, your review? Uh, President Ellenberg, we wanted to respond to the appellant's statements uh, at this hearing today. That is why we went through the different uh, points of the appellant's uh, statement. I'll, I'll, I'll say it makes it a little bit muddy because I was frankly very comfortable with um, uh, with the perspective that our that our only decision is to uphold or, or to determine whether the compatible use and development de determination criteria 
have been met and that those issues, those four issues listed on uh, slide seven, um, it, perhaps you know, have validity but are still premature. Um, so uh, again, I, I am concerned that that really muddies and makes less clear. So I just need you to say again exactly what we are deciding and what we are not deciding, please. If I may, Jacqueline Anshano, Director of Planning and Development. What is before the board is a compatible use determination, an appeal on the compatible use determination of an open space easement only. So not project location, not project size, only that some residential development of some size somewhere in, on the property is a compatible use. That is correct. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Supervisor Simidian and then Supervisor Chavez. No, it's, Arenas, it's in my that. district. Thank you for that, of course. Supervisor Arenas, please go first. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the, the, the points that you just made, uh, President Ellenberg, um, to distinguish what exactly it is that we're trying to answer today in this question of um, um, an open space easement and this compatib compatible use determination. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that we go over this one more time. Um, would you tell us one more time what the CUD is and what is not being voted on today? If I may, Jacqueline Anshano, through, through the president. What is before the board today is a compatible use determination that would conceptually approve and state that a residential development can be placed on a piece of property that has an open space easement contract on it. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. And so one of the things that I wanted to, uh, there were four criteria that you upheld, correct? And for every criteria, you provided an explanation, a, a determination, in terms of why it meets that the, that criteria. And so, one of the things that that I I'm um, I think I'm really proud of uh, as a council member now as a supervisor is that I look at the policies that we are going to uphold within the general plan. Um, to determine how we move forward with a project. Um, there's a lot of projects that become very controversial. Um, uh, there's many of us here who have served in different capacity and have had a lot of folks um, oppose a certain uh, project uh, throughout our, our political lives. Um, and so I, I wanna make sure that this is not my opinion and this is based on policies that are set forth. And I hear you loud and clear that you've looked at each of those criteria and determined um, that this project meets those, that, those criteria or that you've answered um, those thresholds. And, and I'm gonna ask you just some questions about some of those criteria. So one, one of which is, um, one of the thresholds is to preserve public use or enjoyment of the natural scenic character of the land. We've heard um, some arguments that it doesn't. And so what I want you to do is to just help us understand um, how you um, got to your finding. Thank you for the question, Supervisor Ennis. Um, yes, the way I got to my finding was that I looked at the 27 acre parcel. I looked at the constraints on the parcel along with our policies, I noticed that the residential development was located in, that was proposed, was located in a far corner, and it was only encompassing less than 1% of the 27 acres. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate that, and I'm um, grateful that it's only 1% of that 27 acres. This is, uh, I made a comment earlier, there is another 20, 27 acre a uh, project that I um, dealt with in my district, not in this particular area, but in um, as a council member. Um, and uh, I've got to say, uh, this is one of the more 
complicated single family home uh, projects. Uh, because this is not, an in, we're not going to build, or the applicant is not going to build intensely on this land. Um, and I think it, uh, the, the applicant has been um, open to all of the criteria and making sure that they respect, um, preserve, uh, preserving all of the policies that are in place or respecting the policies and abiding by the policies that are in place. I, I'd like to hear um, if there is any points that, that Mr. Lyle made um, that raised, but that is within the CUD um, uh, compatible, this compatible use determination appeal that you'd like to address before we, we move on. No. Not at this time. Great. The last thing I, I wanted to just um, mention, and my, my colleagues um, will understand that there is um, always uh, an amount of interpretation um, with policies, but I am not a, uh, an engineer, and I am not a civil, I'm not a civil engineer, I'm not a planner, and so I leave that to the folks who, um, whose profession that is. And so th that is your profession, and I... Um, you, you guide us in helping determine some of these decisions. Um, and I'm going to be supportive of, of uh, what you're recommending today. Um, it is also my understanding that this open space easement is something that we this applicant could walk away from, right? It is a possibility that if they give notice today, they could start that process um, I think it'll take about 15 years, but they could start that process and they could go another route and build intensely if they wanted to. I don't think that that's the purpose of this applicant. That's not what this applicant wants, but there is another process for the applicant. So if we denied this CUD today, if we denied this um, appeal or approved this appeal, um, they could drop their easements and develop more intensely. Is this, some, is this kind of a fair judgment? Principal Planner Samuel Gutierrez, uh, through the president. Uh, yes, that, that is an option that can be taken by the property owner, um, including that 15-year timeline, of course. Right, right. Well, there, there's some people who are very patient. Um, but there is an alternative route, so I just want to make sure that my colleagues understand this. Um, I, I, I get that this project will be appealed to the board again for final land use permits, and today I, I'm going to vote to make sure that we enforce our policies fairly and, um, and consistently, so I, I think there's a decent chance that there's going to be some need for some modifications. I'm not going to uh, get into that today um, to, uh, for this project to get its final permits, but I agree with the staff that, um, that the applicant has met the minimum requirements specifically for CUD, so I'll make a motion to deny the appeal and approve the CUD. Through, through the chair, we need to complete the hearing process, right. the hearing process, and allow the appellant and applicant an opportunity to present their case before bringing a motion. Okay, were they supposed to speak before I spoke? This is a time for the board to ask questions of planning staff, but then the the appellant and applicant need to be provided an opportunity. Uh, to present their case before the board makes any decisions. That process wasn't clear, and so I thought the the uh, appellant was not going to present since they hadn't presented already, and it was, uh, I'll take that back and I'll wait. Question. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. I'm just uh, asking a question for staff regarding the interpretation of um, <clears throat> the rich line issue. I got a chance to review this uh, this application um, and also the letters coming from uh, the the Green Foothills, for example, that talked about the difference. Uh, I didn't learn about this. Uh, the difference between skyline and rich lines, and maybe you could help educate me a little bit more about that. How 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 is how are those things uh, defined differently? <clears throat> Uh, 
Principal Planner, Sammy Gutierrez, to the President. Uh, yes, so uh, Supervisor Lee, uh, there is a difference between being visible in the skyline and being located on a ridge line. Staff conducted a site analysis as we do with um, any project that is subject to design review. That is a combination of uh, using computer software and conducting a site visit. And through that process, we determined that the development would not be on a ridge line. Though we do understand that it is visible, uh, but mitigation is incorporated as a part of the project to minimize that visual impact. Okay, so you're calling this a ridge line, not just because of the fact that there's another higher elevation behind it, therefore that's why you call it a ridge line versus, I guess, skyline is when you only have the sky, but that's the part where I'm not clear about because in the definition looks like some tail is a definition, but I'm not sure if we have such a definition as well. So, uh, that would be from the view of the valley floor to, mm -hmm. to see what is actually visibly located on ridge line. Mm -hmm. So that's how staff does the, their calculus in analyzing um, that determination. Right, and, and and for these type of project, I saw some pictures with these orange lines and story poles, and they, they created that as the bulk in order for uh, people to be able to see from all different angles what the impact, the visual impact would be, and that's what you have gone through that uh, analysis using the uh, proposed height to see what the effect is to the, uh, to the, the visual impact of the ridge line, right? That is correct. Okay, great, thank you very much, that's all I have. Thank you very much. If there are no additional questions by board members right now, uh, we will turn to the appellant. And um, Mr. Lyle, to reconfirm, you have seven minutes to make your presentation. If you have additional speakers with you um, that you have authorized or invited to speak, they are part of that seven minutes. Uh, so just um, to think about how you want, if, if at all, to divide that time. Good morning. He, he needs some mic support and the clock should start um, when he begins presenting, please. <laughs> Okay, for this appeal, I will show that the project is on the ridge line in a highly visible area above Morgan Hill. The geotechnical report is for the wrong location. Trees around the project were removed without permits prior to project application, and screening trees are proposed that are not compatible with an open space easement property. Then I'll use these facts to show that nine out of the 10 findings in the CUD staff report contain false statements, and five of the six required findings for an OSE CUD are not satisfied. Next slide, please. County staff say the project is not on the ridge line. Findings one and seven say the project is behind the ridge line in an area that is buffered by a natural knoll to the north. The project is, in fact, directly on the ridge line. The images above show that the story poles are clearly visible from both sides of the ridge line. Next slide, please. The image above shows the proposed house is atop the ridge line. It also shows the watershed divide line runs directly through the proposed house. This proves the project is on the ridge line. Next slide, please. The analyzed geotechnical report for this CUD was written in 2015 for the location in red. County staff later helped the applicant cite the project to the location in blue. The geotechnical report is for a different location than is currently proposed. Next slide, please. CUD finding nine says the geotechnical report was used in determining the project will not create a significant visual impact to the valley floor. The project will, in fact, be visible from most of the valley below. 
Staff were provided photos and evidence of the ridge line and visibility before the CUD approval. At the public hearing two years ago, the CUD was continued and then approved behind closed doors the same day. Major issues raised before the public hearing were not addressed, and if these had been addressed, no appeal would have been necessary. County staff still, still say it's not on the ridge line. Next slide, please. OSE CUD guidelines show the proposed ridge line location does not conform and should not be allowed. Next slide, please. CUD findings four and eight state that no trees are being removed. Findings four and five state that no oak woodlands will be affected. The CEQA exemption says no trees will be removed. In fact, many trees are being removed for this project. The project plans even label a tree to be removed. Other trees were removed without permits before the project application. Many of these tre trees were located in a foothill pine oak woodland. Staff were aware that trees were removed before approving the CUD. Next slide, please. Images from 2009 show many trees were present. The project location is in the lower left of the image. Next slide, please. Images from 2018 show many trees were removed. A notice of violation and public nuisance was issued in 2011 for only 11 trees. County staff required landscaping plans to address the tree removal. And the appeal was delayed for two years until this January to wait for these plans despite repeated requests for the appeal to be heard. Next slide, please. The landscaping plans propose lines of trees along two borders of the 27-acre parcel and on both sides of the 900-foot driveway along the bridge line. The proposed screening trees will form a vertical line up the hill and along the ridge as seen from the valley below. These trees will block views and shade solar panels on adjoining parcels. Similar trees were planted many years ago and the county required their removal because they were not compatible with an open space easement. Next slide, please. The OSC CUD development handbook says that lines of trees do not conform. The proposed trees are not in the keeping with the natural setting, are not clustered, and should not be excluded from the development coverage calculation. This project impacts a large area and violates the 5% coverage and clustering rules. As a result, CUD findings 1, 2, 3, 7, and 10 are wrong. Next slide, please. An alternate site exists that avoids all the concerns raised in this appeal, but requires more grading. General Plan Guideline RGD 27 says, grading and excavation to situate a residence or other structure within a hillside to reduce visual impacts is encouraged. That's exactly this case. Guideline GD33 says, for existing legal lots, the county encourages the consideration of alternatives to ridgeline or hilltop locations. This site should be considered, this alternate site. Next slide, please. The area where trees were removed includes a foothill pine oak woodland, and this project also impacts an area with the rare plant smooth lysingia. Smooth lysingia is a covered species under the habitat plan and should be protected, but this is not being done. This project has substantial environmental impact. It should not be categorically exempt from CEQA, and staff were aware of these impacts before they approved the CUD. Next slide, please. Open space easements exist to preserve the open space character of the land and to reduce the impact of development on our environment. These objectives are not met for this project. Five of the six required findings for a CUD shown above are not satisfied, or it violates five of six. Nine out of the 10 findings in the report supporting this CUD contain misstatements of fact. Landscaping plans propose incompatible trees that will impact neighbors and the view shed of Morgan Hill. An alternate site exists that avoids all the concerns raised in this appeal. And this appeal shouldn't have been necessary. If county staff had listened to concerns raised before concerning it, no appeal would have been necessary. I urge you to accept this appeal and 
vacate this CUD. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lyle. Um, if there are follow-up comments from uh, planners and or questions from uh, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Lyle, you might want to stay up here in case there are questions for you. Uh, and then if necessary and if desired, you'll have a final uh, three minutes. Let me start with Supervisor Arenas, please. Thank you. I, I think you heard my, my statements from earlier, and I just wanted to let my colleagues know that I had already seen this um, presentation and um, taken that into consideration in my final, uh, what you've already heard as my motion. Um, one of the things that I, I do want to ask our um, staff is it, when in the planning process it is a mo most appropriate for us to work with um, the applicant uh, to look at the landscaping and how it's best aligned with our county policies. When if I may, through the president, answer the question of Supervisor Arenas. Jacqueline O'Shaughnell, Director of Planning and Development. The most appropriate time is during the processing of the land use entitlement for the placement of the residential development, and that would be uh, the process that goes before the zoning administrator. Great. So there's still an opportunity uh, for us to um, discuss some of the items that, um, Mr. Lyle, that you brought up. Um, so, not to, I don't want to d be dismissive, um, but I do want to only talk about what is within um, what we're talking today, which is this, uh, this appeal on, um, on the easement, on the open space easement. So, uh, because I don't want to muddle things up, I want us to make sure that you know that there's an opportunity for us to discuss some of these other items, like the trees, um, uh, just the whole landscaping plan. Um, and so th this is not that time, and, and, um, but I did want to, for you to hear from our planning um, staff that there is an opportunity for us to continue to talk about this and, and, um, and uh, that all is not done. Um, we're just moving in this particular process ahead. We're not m moving ahead with everything, um, but we're moving ahead with with um, with denying the appeal and approving the CUD. And so that's my motion: is to deny the appeal and approve um, the CUD. Through, through the chair, we we do still need to hear from the applicant. You know, I would really appreciate to have the whole process outlined in that way. It is clear to me and it is clear to everybody that's participating. This is absolutely disrespectful, not only to the applicants, but those people who've already been um, prepared with their content and their conversations. The, pro the process that we need to follow is the planning department makes a staff presentation. The board has an opportunity to ask questions of the planning department. The um, appellant uh, presents, um, at, and the president has set the time for the appellant at seven minutes. The applicant gets seven minutes to present. Uh, each side gets three minutes uh, for rebuttal. We have to take general public comment. At that time, the hearing portion can be closed, and uh, it would be proper for the board to make any motions. And this is the first time that I am hearing this outlined right now. So I would appreciate that to be outlined somewhere so that we can all understand what the process is. This is absolutely frustrating. Do we have uh, any other questions here for the appellant or for the applicant? The applicant we, now needs to be invited up. Yes. So that, that's what I, would, I thought that I was doing by asking if we had questions of the applicant. Um, Good afternoon. Good, good um, afternoon. One moment. This is new to at least three of us, mm -hmm. uh, so please bear with us. Um, the applicant has seven minutes as well. That's correct. And then, thank you. And then, 
the, the planning folks are done presenting and responding unless the board has questions for them, correct? Unless the board has questions for the planning department, okay. yes. Okay, thank you very much for your patience. We will set the timer. If you're both intending to speak, keep an eye on the, the time because the total is seven minutes. Thank you, we intend to, we intend to keep this brief. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Amanda Musi Verdell. I'm a principal engineer with Hannah Brunetti. I've been working with um, the property owner, Mr. Mon Martin Gutierrez, for the past 10 years in titling his home through the county. As stated in staff's presentation, Martin is proposing to build a single family residence within the regulations of the open space easement. We are here today not to talk about the house, rather discuss if this project meets the finding of the open space easement compatible use determination. As staff has thoroughly analyzed the site and development proposal, including several site visits prior to making their determination, their report clearly outlines how this project meets all the findings. I would like to thank the staff for their hard work and re reiterate some of the things in the staff report for emphasis. One, this is the only location for the house on the property. The property has fault lines, landslides, steep slopes, and storm drain easements throughout the property. These areas prohibit development. Taking out these areas, we have analyzed placing the house in different locations throughout the property. These alternative locations cause more grading and scarring of the hillside. Allowing the house to be built in this corner of the property, it will be on the flattest and most stable portion of the site that allows clustering of our development to meet the open space guidelines. Two, the development is less than 5% of the site and clustered in the corner. Developing in this manner will leave the whole face of the hillside in its natural state. The location of this house is near the existing development of Holiday Lake Estates, which further supports the clustering development. Three, the home is designed to be least impactful to the public. The house is a single story house and avoids high visibility areas. The house is approximately 90 feet to the common property line of Holiday Lakes Estates and 77 feet to the property line to the south. We're proposing trees around the house, driveway, and property to further reduce any visual impacts. For these reasons and all the reasons stated in the staff report, we ask that you agree with the staff's and the director's determination to grant the open space easement, easement compatible use determination. And I have four minutes left for the property owner, Martin, to uh, make a statement. Hello, my name is Martin Gutierrez. Oh. And uh, I bought this property in, since 2008. And, uh, the whole idea is to build a house for me and my family, to live in the property, and uh, uh, that's all I want, you know, that's all I want to have. I just want to have a house I can live on it and myself and my family. And enjoy my property, that's what I work for. And, uh, but uh, since day one I bought the property, Mr. Lyons have a, a personal issue with me. I don't know what it is. But every step we do, he have an issue. And I just, I mean, I just want to live in my property. I, I have my rights, and I, I, I just, that's all I'm asking for. I mean, I'm a good neighbor. I get along with everybody. I have my cows. I help all my neighbors. And I don't mind to, to work with him, too. And, and uh, please, uh, yes, uh, tell us what we have to do to, to comply with the county Santa Clara rules. And, We'll work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for the applicants? If not, if the appellant desires, you may have a three minute uh, rebuttal after which the applicants will be invited uh, to have the final three minutes. I'll just say a couple of quick things. So county staff say my issues aren't relevant. In my presentation, I tied them in directly to their findings for the CUD and all the mistakes in them. And it's actually really troubling that county staff keep holding on to these statements that aren't true. The ridge line's been proven, right? And they still say it's not on it. They mischaracterize things and make it sound like everything's okay. It's not the case here. County staff should listen to, to comments. I, I mean, they solicited, they had a public hearing 
They solicited comments, and then they disregarded them and approved it behind closed doors. The process, if you read my written appeal, I've written stuff that details a lot of concerns with the operation of the county planning department. And if they were, if they, I hate to say it, if they were doing their jobs and, and being forthright, this would not have been approved. Um, I don't, they said that we're just deciding if they can build a house on this property. They can build a house on this property, of course. But how can you determine a CUD and the impacts? How, how can you make judgments on those guidelines if you don't know where the house is going and where the trees are going and what the true impacts are? This is what CUDs are about. It's about minimizing the impacts and you have to understand the details of, of the plans, of the landscaping, of all of this stuff to be able to, I mean, to make an informed decision. Um, and finally, I'll just say, you know, there is the lower location that they can build on. It requires increased grading, right? There are landslide areas adjacent. That's why they need to do more grading for it. But the county general plan, the RGD 33, specifically says do more grading to make things less visible. And you know what? The bonus is if you do that, you avoid all those environmental impacts. The rare plants, uh, as mitigation for the tree violations, they could plant the trees where they were before, where they naturally existed. So I, I vigorously disagree with county staff's assessment. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Would the applicant like to add anything? Just very quickly, uh, Amanda Musi, Verdell, Hannah Bernetti, that um, I've, I've been working with the planning department for over 20 years. And sometimes I'm in Mr. Lyle's shoes and sometimes I'm in my shoes. And um, this is a process um, that we that we go through. We've worked with county staff, not just the county staff that's sitting before you right now. We've uh, have worked on this project for I, I think I said eight years, and um, every planner that we have worked with, and I think we've totaled to five planners three directors and three planning managers that we've met with on this project have all come to the same conclusion. So um, I, we've worked with county staff to get to this point and we will continue to work with county staff to get to the end of this project. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lyon is talking about the trees. In 2012, my property got in fire I lost most of my trees in my property. Uh, one of the reasons I liked the property in the beginning because they have some very nice trees. So we lost these beautiful oak trees in that property. And uh, all the trees being removed, they got burned, they got sick, and I got requests for call fire to remove those trees because they were hazardous. Needs to be removed, that's why I remove it. I have never removed a, a live tree. I like trees and I'd be more than happy to plant as many trees as required. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Looking to my questions. colleagues, Supervisor Lee. Yeah, just my questions. I'm not touching any motions. <laughs> uh, first of all, my first question is regarding the trees, as we talked about. Um, the, uh, on page 328, there's a discussion regarding a pallant uh, talking about removal of oak trees impacting this move lasagna plant. Uh, the staff response is that the project will require removal of three pine trees. So just want to double check. Uh, are we going to, uh, first of all, is there any oak trees right now on site? Are those going to be affected? Through the, through the president, Jacqueline Anshano, no. The oak trees on site are not proposed to be affected. Okay, so those will stay. And then they talked about the smooth lasagna plant that is apparently uh, uh, very rare. That would also not be affected, am I correct? During the um, processing of the land use entitlement is when that, the, the impact, any potential impact to any biological species would be analyzed. 
Right. And then the other one was this talks about staff saying that there will be required the removal of three pine trees. And those are current pine trees that would have to be removed in order to fit the space, or why, why is it there? I just want to make sure. Through the president, Samuel Gutierrez, principal planner. Those reflect the plans that were submitted, which are outdated as indicated by the property owner, by their statements. Those trees were already removed. Staff conducted a site visit, and there are no trees located in that area. Okay, so no additional trees is planned to be removed at this time. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, and then the other thing is they are proposing to plant uh, another 185 trees on the property, including Coast Live, Coast Live Oak, California Pepper, Strawberry Trees, Purple Leaf Hop Seed, and these will be uh, all part of the conditions that will come back to us if this were to proceed. Is that correct? Yes, um, Jacqueline Unshano, Director of Planning and Development. The proposed trees, whatever the trees end up being, would be analyzed with the land use entitlements. It may not be 185 trees. It may end up being much less than that. They may be naturally dispersed on the site. That analysis is taken up at the land use entitlement process. Okay, thank you. And that's all the questions I have, thank you. Sorry, I am blurring your lights. It's Supervisor Travis's light. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, you know, and thank you both for the presentation. I don't. I wanted to wait to ask questions to after public comment if there was more, but I'll, I'll just dive in if that's okay since we're doing that now. Um, one is that Supervisor Lee asked a question that I, I want to make sure I understand the answer to, and that's relative to the difference between a ridge line and a skyline. And I'm not sure I exactly understood the response. And so when I, so anyway, that's really my first question, which is what's the delineation for our staff on that? Thank you for the question through the president, Jacqueline Anshano. So the skyline, depending on where you take a photo, you can have skyline showing on the back of a, um, on a house. Uh, on any development, just depends on the location. The County of Santa Clara does not have a clear definition of ridge line, but usually ridge line means that there is no, that the, the structure sits on top of a ridge with no silhouette behind it. For this analysis, we went to the valley floor out, and we have some photos where we can show you, we went out on the valley floor to see what silhouetted behind the um, actually, we were looking at the uh, water tanks, and there's a little trailer there. And there are hills, depending on where you're viewing, that silhouette, silhouette behind um, the potential uh, residents. But one note I'd like the board to uh, just take note of, during the land use entitlement process, um, the house could be pushed back further, and that analysis is part of the land use entitlement process when it's going through the building site approval, the grading, and the design review. That's not what we considered um, in the compatible use determination. We considered the full 27 acres, and is there anywhere on that 27 acre lot that a residential development could be placed that meet the four criteria out of our code of ordinances. Got it, well, one thing I would just say, not just to you, but to the Hewlett Committee, is that this is certainly something worth having a discussion about so that we are really clear and the public's clear and it would create less animosity if people knew clear, more clearly what those rules were. So that's not on my to-do list, but I'm gonna ask our chair of Hewlett if he would take that up. Um, the second issue is what you just ended with, and I want to make sure that that the um, that I understand what needs to happen at this phase. So both parties are talking about the placement, the actual placement of the housing. And so just so I'm crystal clear about this, is what your the, the it, it, uh, when you look at those four criteria, you made a point that, the, the final destination of where a home may be is, in, is something to be discussed in the next phase. 
But this phase also looks at whether or not there will be significant impact to criteria that we already have from a policy perspective. Is that accurate? That is correct. So what is challenging for me on this is that if in fact there's an opportunity for appropriate placement of the house, that then means that it's even more clear that there aren't significant impacts. Why that isn't a part of this this phase of the process? If I may, through the chair, because the compatible use determination uh, guidelines clearly state that the compatible use determination must take place before the analysis of the details of the placement of the, of the structure. And so that's what we follow as that criterion. Do you want to add? Sammy Gutierrez, principal planner, uh, if I may, uh, through the president, uh, add, the, um, this is a, a bit of a, a cart and a horse situation. Um, so the uh, compatible use determination would be leading the process because we have to have that in place and then the development review applications that are pending this decision would finalize those fine granular details. So um, super unsatisfying in terms of the situation. And I do understand the point you're raising, which is the process is, is iterative. And I think that's really what, what you're saying. I, I think what I want to just acknowledge is that um, for me, the you know, I, I think that the, um, you know, the open space easement, the clarity in which that tool is used, and then how this aligns to all of our other policies is of concern to me relative to um, just the, the, the process. And, and again, I, I don't know if this is embedded in state law or not, but the process is not, you know, it's, it's, it's again, I think one of those areas that's creating conflict here is the the cart or the horse as we're talking about this. Um, so I, I'll just say that, you know, I'm, I realize that, I, I do believe that the applicant has met our criteria the way they're aligned today, but I do just want to sunshine for you all that the, um, the placement of the house relative to that ridgeline is of significant concern uh, to me, and the, the um, and I also think that the issues relative to you know, good neighbor challenges are a challenge no matter where you build. And I, I, so making sure that we're looking at uh, the the preservation of the plant life and the, you know, the, the um, integration of native trees is really critical. And, and so I, I, I'll just say, um, you know, both to both parties that I, I, I understand why this is a, a, a complex, um, process that we're in and really want to encourage staff to make sure that that we're looking at optimal choices. I do want to just add one point and that is that the home being connected close to where other homes are makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I worry that our the standards we use for open space easements is somewhat um, I, I worry that we're that that's something even at a state law level that we're going to need to be looking at because I do worry that you know we're, we're essentially chopping up the South County you know one big parcel at a time and I think as we think about climate change and other issues that we need to be really mindful of that um, so anyway I know Supervisor uh, Arenas has tried a couple times to make a motion so I'll just second you. I appreciate it. I don't know that this is the time either oh, because we, I think yeah. there's still oh, public comment. Oh, we still have comment. public comment. All right. Well, but, see, I wasn't helpful there. But, uh, All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you both for the presentations. <laughs> yeah. Um, Supervisor Arenas and then uh, Supervisor Lee. Th thank you, um, Chair. Um, uh, I wanted to say was um, to to your comment, Supervisor Chavez, um, uh, as Chair of Hewlett, this is something that... Um, I don't know why 27 acres um, follows me, but it does. Um, <laughs> and because it does, we must come up with policy um, solutions. And um, one of the solutions, um, I, I, I don't agree with changing rules or policies mid-process as, as 
as much as I would like to, to facilitate and make things a lot more transparent and clear, um, because it isn't fair to those folks who've uh, been involved in the project. Um, and so I think when people are working within those rules and following those policies, then um, they get to move forward. Um, whether I like the project or not, that's irrelevant to me. Um, and so I, I'm looking at it with those eyes, but yes, I appreciate your, 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 your feedback. I do think that there, there could be some policy, um, and, and believe me, we've talked about this in, internally in our office about some of the solutions, and so has our planning director. Um, and so I, I know that this, this is a, a, a bit, a bit um, different than what we normally go through in terms of land use, but, um, and I think this is probably maybe the first open space easement appeal <laughs> and um, that we've had and maybe that all of us have gone through. So I, I appreciate that we're all learning together. Um, but but to, to, to be fair to everybody, I do want to just stick to what we are um, focused on today and that is making sure that, um, it, it, what, excuse me, is whether the, the applicant has met the criteria, they're within those guidelines, and um, our planning director seems to, and our staff, believe that they have, and so, uh, you know, we'll move forward with my motion at one point or another. Um, I think you all know where I stand with this, uh, but I just wanted to, to, to make sure that I heard, you, I heard you, I heard you in terms of policy. It is a little bit of a cart before the horse. We, we can't, and, and this easement is, is there because um, uh, because it is supposed to protect our open space, and that's what we're doing. We're protecting our open space. We're not, this is this project, I feel, um, when I actually make this motion, I'm going to feel um, that I can sleep at night because I'm not in, um, contributing to intensifying any open space. Um, this is one single family home. Um, and, and it's not the, this is not what we normally would do in terms of uh, building more homes. We wanna see them where there's transportation corridors, <laughs> we wanna see them condensed. We want, we want to see this uh, development uh, much differently, but this is not that at this point. So, so anyways, um, love to hear from our public and see what they have to say. Thank you. Our Supervisor Lee, do you wanna make your comment before sure. the public? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Right it's really a question for staff, just to make sure I understand what we're voting on today. Now, it looks like to me this is only focused on the CUD, uh, which really, in so many ways, we're not saying where this house is going to be. We're not saying how big a house model this is, what the design of this house is going to be. All we are talking about is whether or not a house is allowable on this plot, basically. Is that, is that what we're voting on today, basically? Through the president, Jacqueline Onshano, yes. Okay. And, and it, I just want to say, it sounds to me that both sides says that this is okay to have a house on this plot. I mean, that, that I'm here today. I'm just stating the obvious, seems to me, but I just want to state that so it might be an easy decision at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have members of the public wishing to speak on this item? I currently have one person wishing to speak. Now I have two people wishing to speak. Any in chambers? None in chambers at this time. Okay, if anyone uh, else is interested in speaking on this item, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. We will close the queue when the first speaker begins speaking. And we'll give that a second or two for anyone that wants to raise their hand and then. All right, All looks right. like we're holding it to. Our first speaker is Brian Schmidt. Brian, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Uh, good afternoon, Brian Schmidt here for Green Foothills. And I, I appreciate the clarification of planning department's position, which is it's not whether this house is to be considered for conformance to the findings of the CUD, the, the proposal submitted by the applicants, but rather whether any house, it seems like, of any size is potentially permissible. I believe that is the wrong interpretation of those findings. You have four findings you need to make. Do they have any meaning to them? It would be the question that I, that I would ask. Um, in particular, you look at something like uh, the ridge lines 
there was some discussion of skylines versus ridge lines. Skylines are a type of ridge line. Uh, all ridge lines view, views are protected in the county. We would say that the finding number one, um, preserving the natural scenic character of the land is an appropriate place to apply your ridge line protection policies, which the county has. The position is no, do not protect the ridge line when you're looking at this project. It seems there's an inconsistency in staff's approach. Sometimes they look at submitted plans and say they're consistent. For example, the amount of lot coverage. And then sometimes say we refuse to look at those submitted plans, like this 11,000 square foot house and buildings on the ridge line and say it's not consistent. Uh, and they've refused to look at that in that circumstance. Um, I would point the, the Board of Supervisors also to uh, finding number four that comply with federal, state, and local law ordinances and the county's general plan. The county is a signatory to the habitat plan saying that they must avoid impacts to smooth lasingia. This project is designed with maximum impacts to that, that native plant species. So for that reason, I, I don't believe that they, met, they meet that finding. And it makes more sense to use these findings as they are exist right now and then later do additional iterative process. That's what you have. That's what you need to apply. So that. Thank you. Our next speaker, speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, we've asked you to unmute. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Schmidt. Uh, I, I'm glad that we have organizations like yours to give uh, a very learned uh, perspective on what is being done in these particular areas that we've held the sacrosanct. Once that's gone, it's gone. And what my issue is, is that we set a precedent when we allow even just 1%. 1% is 1%. Now you get some other dude that's gonna come up in here and he's gonna leverage that as a precedent and use that in order to support. Now add that up over 20, 30 years and then all of a sudden you gotta develop it. And so we have to be very careful and in, in, in be, practice some due diligence and responsibility, that, that sense of responsibility that we have been given a particular land, it, we're, we are the responsible stewards of that and that we protect it, that we don't allow like the, the rhetoric and the law to uh, get in the way of what doing what's right. Because just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's right. It really doesn't, it really doesn't. I'm sorry to inform you, but just because something is the law does not mean that it is the right thing to do. So with that said, I'd like to ask that you take a re-examination uh, of what the appellant had stated. I think the appellant did an excellent job of centering his argument. He supported his argument factually and his experience with the county staff and the way that they had used information and withheld information is very consistent with what other people's experiences have been with county staff. So I would be very, I would really implore you and ask you as a citizen that is constantly at these meetings, to reevaluate what the appellant had stated because it, it has merit. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. We have a motion. Oh, further questions and comments. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Um, the first one is uh, largely unrelated to the issue before us, but um, just for the record, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, I know that the clerk's office and the county council's office are uh, doing their very best to help us keep track of our Levine Act obligations, but I notice that on packet page 324, which is the first page of the staff report on item 13, we have the notation LA1, which I think typically means Levine Act and contracts, and pretty clearly this is not a contract matter. I just want to make sure I I'm dotting my Levine Act I's and crossing my Levine Act T's today. That's correct. It should be labeled LA-4. That has no impact on the statement that was read or compliance requirements. Thank you very much. Then my next question does have, for county, also for county council, has uh, um, bearing on this, which is we, we have before us, as I understand it, two possible actions. We can either deny the appeal or we can grant the appeal, yes? Yes. 
and that involves a determination as to certain findings of fact. And the four findings of fact that have been identified involve uh, whether the, the development, uh, the proposed use and development effectively preserves the public use, so on and so forth. Proposed use and development does not significantly impair open space character, so on and so forth, is not a subdivision, is the number three, and then the fourth one is complies with all laws, so on and so forth. So if, um, my understanding is that, well, that, that's my question, I guess. So if we, can, if we can make all four of those findings, are we then enabled, permitted to deny the appeal, or are we compelled to deny the appeal? Do you understand the distinction I'm trying to clarify for myself? I do, and I'm gonna to look to Deputy County Counsel Christina Stella to answer your question. That's called phone a friend in non-legal parlance, <laughs> that's what that is, so. I might phone my friend in the audience. Um, Deputy County Counsel Christina Stella, so. I'm not sure the microphone is on. It is on, I'll sit uh, closer maybe, to there it. There you go, thank you so much. Um, Deputy County Counsel Christina Stella, so if I understand your question, you're asking if you make all of the findings, are you compelled to grant the compatible use determination? Um, so if I were able to make all four of the findings, and I'll come back to this in a minute, Madam Chair, but I, I think there are a couple that are tough judgment call, at least for me. Um, but if I could make them all, am I then uh, obliged to deny the appeal? Because the applicant will say I am entitled as a matter of law to a compatible use determination for the site because all of those findings can be made? So if you can make all of the findings and you still choose to deny the compatible use determination, you would have to make specific findings as to why. I'm not sure legally what those findings would need to be to justify denying it. Okay. But there should be specific reasons, essentially. That being said, if I concluded that I could not make all of the findings, then I would have to grant the appeal because I have to be able to make all of the findings in order to um, uh, deny the appeal, yes? Correct. Okay. Confusing but helpful, thank you. Um, well, Madam Chair, uh, it's all been said uh, at least a couple times, but that won't keep me from saying it again. Um, I, here's the way I sort it out for me. Um, the determination that Supervisor Arena spoke to some time ago, um, is in fact about the compatible use determination and it is not specific to a specific project proposal, which means that really it comes down to what the staff and potentially the board will do when they see a specific project, even though the project has been in the conversation in my view, far more than it should have been today since we're mm -hmm. making a legal determination about a compatible use determination. And I'm not saying that critically of staff or the applicant or the appellant, I'm just saying, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm not surprised that this has gotten uh, to be a bit of a hairball since the thing we're not talking about has actually been the dominant topic of conversation. Um, so here's, uh, where I'm gonna land, and do we or do we not have a motion on the floor yet? We do have a motion in a second. Okay. Um, I'm gonna support uh, Supervisor Reynas in her motion and uh, vote to deny the appeal. Um, so I'm gonna reject the appellant's request. Uh, I'm gonna support the applicant's request that there be a determination of compatible use, but 
I just, since we've had so much conversation, I can't help. That, that means that staff is gonna have a pretty heavy responsibility when you bring back the project to say, yep, we got it right on the compatible use determination because the project then has to meet these standards. So for the property owner and his representative, I, I'm just trying to give you a fair warning I can get to yes in a theoretical way today, in a legal way today on compatible use, but I think you've got you've created some very high standards for yourself now in terms of the project itself, if and when it comes to this board. And to the appellant, who is gonna be disappointed presumably that I can't support the appellant's position today, I would say take some hope, take some heart, keep making the same arguments you made, which respectfully were often about the project itself uh, because you know if the project itself comes back I am going to be saying wait a minute what's going on with the view shed here and wait a minute what's going on with the smooth lasingia and by the way has anybody talked to the habitat agency where some of us serve because I kind of think they're a key player in this and I, I'll just again fair warning I'm going to want to know what they say uh, about this because one of the determinations that we had to make or have to make today is that the proposed use and development preserves the public use or enjoyment of the natural or scenic character of the land. And if you're talking about native habitat and the potential loss uh, of that native, native habitat, we got some issues to look at. Thank you for letting me pick my way through that, and I know some of it was repetitive, but I, I wanted to make sure that the participants understood what it is I am and I'm not communicating by the vote that I intend to cast in a moment or two. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you, and thank you for your comments, um, Supervisor Simity, and believe me, um, I know that this is going to be uh, um, uh, a very complicated single family home <laughs> project, but I'm gonna go by policies. And so um, whatever those policies tell us, and I know there's always uh, some judgment call, I appreciate you giving a fair warning, but the fair warning here is that the applicant, it has been um, uh, open with our planning department and I have not seen uh, or heard um, them not complying with anything. And so I, I, I don't care much for somebody's opinion of a project, whether it's the um, applicant or anyone else. Um, what I care about is, is it meeting some of our policies? And so I don't, um, I, I'm not weakened by um, stakeholders who may um, cry for a certain type of, of consideration. Um, and this is my fair warning uh, to those stakeholders because I'm going to comply with policies and whether somebody likes a project or not is not of my um, concern. What I'm going to do is, is um, uphold the policies and I expect everybody else to do the same, um, whether it's in your district or my district. Um, so with that, I'd love to take a vote now. Let's do that, Rhonda. Motion by Arenas, second by Chavez. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Sumidian. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Allenberg. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We are going to break now. It is 1.02. We will reconvene at 1.32. Thank you all very much for the work of the morning.
Testing. Testing.
Good afternoon. It is 1.32, and as soon as we have a quorum of supervisors, we will call this meeting back to order. Jess, I see several colleagues in the room, so let's uh, call the meeting back to order and take a roll to establish the continued presence of a quorum. Supervisor Arenas? Here. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Present, thank you. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Present, thank you. Vice Chairperson Lee? Present. Vice President Lee, pardon me. And President Ellenberg? Yes, I'm thank here. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, Item 14 is uh, the mental health and substance use report. And good afternoon to all of you. Welcome. Uh, hang on. Just give me one second to open up and reorganize. I don't remember if I wanted to say something first. I do not. Well, good morning. Good afternoon, board members. Um, I'm going to uh, kick off our report and um, if we can just get the slides in presentation mode. Um, and just to provide um, the board with an overview of how we envisioned the presentation um, going, we're going, I'm gonna give a few introductory comments. Whoops. And then uh, we'll turn it over to the RAND team who are uh, joining us virtually. They will present um, their analysis, then um, we will present some of the next steps as well as an update on, I'm gonna wait for the presentation to come back, as well as an update on some significant progress we've made in expanding substance use treatment services. We thought um, we might then uh, take questions from the board after both the RAND presentation as well as the staff presentation um, because we think some of the questions that uh, may emerge from the RAND analysis may be addressed in the staff presentation, um, but defer, of course, to the board if you'd prefer to structure that differently, but that had been our uh, proposal on that. Um, and with that, let me just wait for the slides. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Um, one uh, brief note before um, some introductory comments is in addition to the information that we're presenting today, wanted to call the board's attention, but primarily the public's attention who have been following a lot of the work we've been doing in this area to a number of off-agenda reports as well as other presentations to board committees that address in greater depth some of the things that we're discussing here today. And so we included this slide um, just to um, share with folks some of the other places they can go if they're interested in more closely tracking certain other updates. Next slide, please. Technical difficulty sounds like. Okay, I have my um, slides in paper form in front of me, so while we're waiting for the next slide. Um, next slide, please. Um, just as an introductory um, uh, few set of comments before we transition to the RAND team, the first, um, first thing to note is that the assessment done by RAND really focuses on um, gaps and an assessment of need and capacity for the population as a whole in Santa Clara County. And of course, the Behavioral Health Department specifically um, is responsible for ensuring access to behavioral health services for uh, all those folks in our community who are enrolled in Medi-Cal as well as the uninsured. Um, and we'll continue to focus on ensuring as the party responsible for meeting the needs of that population, we do so while also supporting access to care for the community as a whole. 
Um, and then one thing that I think you'll see weaved through some of the conclusions um, that the RAND team reached, um, but is something that I wanted to call the board's attention to even before their presentation, is that um, there are certain levels of care where we experience a lot of challenges finding placement for folks, even where there are theoretically the number of beds available to meet uh, the needs of our population. And that's because um, the county in particular serves folks who often have really, really complex overlapping needs. And sometimes we have a facility that could meet the um, one or several of those needs, but not all of them. And those clients in particular um, present really significant placement challenges. So even where um, we have the bed capacity that we may desire, a huge area of focus for us needs to be on figuring out how to make sure those beds are actually accessible to the clients who need them. So with that, we're gonna turn the presentation over to our partners at RAND, and then we'll come back to staff presentation after theirs. And I just want to confirm with the clerk's office that we have um, the members of the RAND team. It should be Nicole and Jonathan on the line with us and that they are both present in the virtual meeting and um, have presenter status so that they can cast their slide deck. We have Jonathan up. Oh, here we are. Great. Uh, Nicole was here and I was seeing what happened to Jonathan. I know it was on a moment ago. I'll be quiet. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. So you can all see and hear me, hopefully. And I will now share my slides. Can you confirm if you can see they these are, slides? They're coming up now. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, um, I'm uh, John Levin and uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Nicole Aberhart, and uh, as Greta mentioned, we are from RAND Corporation, which is a nonprofit and nonpartisan research organization that produces uh, both rigorous and objective analyses with the overall mission of informing policy and decision making. And today we are presenting on psychiatric and substance use disorder, bed capacity, need, and shortages in Santa Clara County. Is it going to the next slide? Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. And so the reason why we've been tasked with investigating this topic is that prior uh, publications have found that overall need for psychiatric beds has been increasing yet the number of psychiatric beds has fallen over the last few decades and it's been established that shortages of psychiatric beds are linked to a multitude of negative health and societal outcomes. And recently in 2021, our team at RAND published a report identifying that the state of California as a whole is experiencing a shortage of psychiatric beds. But one of the limitations of that report is that the extent of shortages or surpluses at more local levels was still unclear. And thus conducting analyses of capacity needs and shortages at the county level can enable counties to better understand where there may be deficits between need and capacity and for which populations. In understanding this information can then inform where to target additional investments and potentially the expansion of capacity through additional beds or facilities. And the report that we completed uh, for Santa Clara and the methods that I am presenting today build off of the work that we've done for um, uh, prior projects. And so uh, as you can see here, we've now, before this, we had already completed three evaluation reports using these methods. The first was the one I already referenced on the left-hand side for um, adult psychiatric beds across the entire Excuse state me. of California. Uh, just a, yeah, go ahead. Just, may I just ask a quick question? I don't have these slides. Do my colleagues have them? Okay. I might need to borrow someone's. All right, thank you. 
I apologize for interrupting. Thank you. That's okay. Is it all right to continue or do you need? Yes, please. Um, Thank you. Sure. Okay. So um, then the middle report at the top uh, was a report we did for Sacramento County, where we then expanded uh, our scope to also include substance use disorder beds, uh, as well as beds for children, both substance use and psychiatric. And we then use the same scope for uh, the report on the right-hand side uh, last summer for a trio of counties, um, Merced, San Joaquin, and Stanislaus. And um, all of these methods that we used, we uh, published um, as a piece in uh, JAMA Psychiatry where we sort of lay out um, the, the different approaches to estimate capacity and need for psychiatric beds. And so the goal for this analysis is to estimate psychiatric and substance use disorder capacity, need, and shortages for various levels of care within Santa Clara County. And the way we are estimating shortages is this equation where it's essentially an estimation of need minus an estimation of capacity. And that would equal shortage or a surplus. And so for this report, uh, we estimated um, capacity need and shortages or surpluses specific to the following dimensions of beds. So on the left-hand side of this table, uh, beds were first classified as either for psychiatric or substance use disorder care. And then we looked at different levels of care for um, each of these conditions. So starting with psychiatric, uh, the highest level was acute, which we consider to be urgent short-term care that can occur in either hospital or non-hospital settings. For hospital settings, these types of facilities include acute psychiatric hospitals. Uh, they also include psychiatric um, health facilities and also general acute care hospitals that have psychiatric wards. And on the non-hospital side of acute uh, would be crisis residential facilities. The next level of care was subacute. So that would be slightly less urgent than acute, but requiring a longer term stay. And we consider those uh, to be beds at general or specialized subacute facilities, uh, mental health rehabilitation centers, skilled nursing facilities with specialized treatment programs, as well as IMDs. And then a uh, level one was uh, community residential, and that consisted of adult residential treatment facilities, um, enhanced or augmented board and care facilities. And what I mean by enhanced or augmented, that means uh, having mental health services and then also social rehabilitation facilities. I do want to also note that uh, the scope did not include other types of residential facilities that may house patients with uh, psychiatric conditions but did not offer mental health services. And then uh, transitioning to the substance use disorder beds, they also exist um, across multiple levels of care. And uh, we, these are based on guidelines from the American Society of Addiction Medicine or, or ASAM. Um, due to uh, data limitations, our analysis uh, ended up looking at um, shortages or surpluses across the entirety of level three beds. Um, it's also worth noting that there's other levels uh, that exist, um, either levels two, which is less uh, um, uh, in terms of residential facilities, more intensive outpatient, also level four. And then there's uh, recovery residences as well for individuals with substance use disorders, but uh, those were out of the scope of our analysis. And then we also looked at two separate populations um, we looked at uh, all, all of these levels of care we looked at for adults, and we looked at some of these levels of care for children as they were appropriate.
Now for our estimation of capacity of beds, um, our baseline was the California licensure data, uh, which represent publicly available data sets from numerous agencies or departments within the state. And we then supplemented uh, this data with a survey that we administered to psychiatric and SUD treatment facilities um, in and uh, right outside Santa Clara County. And then we also um, complemented our findings from these two uh, data sources with information we received on the county, either as updates or corrections to um, the numbers that we already had. We also produced two separate measures of bed capacity. Our main measure of capacity, which is this measure that we used in other reports is at the population level. So that's the total universe of beds located in the county of Santa Clara. And this is the measure we then used for our analyses related to potential shortages or surpluses. We also implemented a secondary measure of beds, excuse me, um, that we are referring to as county accessible beds. So the overarching purpose of county accessible beds is to ensure access for residents of the county who are enrolled in Medi-Cal or are uninsured as other beds um, at other facilities in the region may only accept patients with cash payments or private insurance. And our definition of county accessible beds includes either beds in facilities that are operated by the county, um, also beds that the county has contracted with at various facilities, both within and outside the county. And then lastly, beds that the county has reported as having available to place Medi-Cal and uninsured patients at any given time. Turning to the other side of the shortage equation, uh, given how tricky it is to estimate bed need, we decided to use three separate approaches, um, each of which used different sources and data points. Uh, the first of which uh, was based on our survey. The second approach was uh, based on expert consensus estimates. And the third uh, was from reference cases. I'll now, um, in the subsequent slides, explain what each of these approaches involve. All right, so the first method, uh, which was based on our survey data, as you can see here, we have a pretty long equation um, at the bottom right, uh, but conceptually, uh, once we got the survey results, we then summed observations across a specific category of beds. And after we did that, we started uh, by calculating utilized capacity, which is the number of patients occupying a bed, um, a given category of beds. We then divided utilized capacity by a benchmark of 85%, which based on the literature is the target occupancy rate as potentially going above that could strain a facility's workforce. After that, we then added the number of individuals who are currently on a wait list to this equation. And then the other conceptual part of this equation, so that's the second bullet point on the left-hand side, um, are the transfer requests. Um, in the prior reports that we did on, on this topic, we found that um, patients can sometimes be in the wrong level of care but they are waiting to be transferred either to a higher or lower level. And so in order to account for this, we first subtract from the utilized capacity, the number of patients occupying this level um, that need to be transferred to a higher or lower level. And then separate from that, we then add back in the number of patients who are occupying beds at these other levels who are requested um, to be added to this level of care by their facility administrators. So for example, um, when we're looking at uh, subacute facilities, we would add in uh, the need of patients who are either in acute or in community residential 
who need to be transferred to subacute facilities. And then we subtract the patients in the subacute facility who need to be transferred either to a higher or lower level of care. Our second approach um, uses estimates that were derived by a technical expert panel, and these estimates were uh, informed by a review of the literature on this topic that we provided to the panel. And then lastly, our third approach used reference cases of bed capacity rates from other municipalities. Now, in addition to um, our primary analyses of estimating either shortages or surpluses, we also implemented several secondary analyses that were meant to complement uh, our findings. Um, so the first secondary analysis was projecting the uh, psychiatric bed need for uh, the County of Santa Clara over the next five years. And then the other secondary analysis was uh, based on data we received from our surveys where we asked um, facility administrators about their willingness uh, to accept certain hard to place populations, such as patients with certain uh, co-occurring uh, physical uh, or developmental uh, health conditions, uh, patients with prior involvement in the criminal justice system, as well as uh, their willingness to accept different payment sources. And um, just as one final point for all of the approaches that I've just shared, I do wanna underscore that you know, each of these methods um, have their own strengths and, and limitations, and that's why I will refer to our results as estimates rather than exact values. And with that, um, transitioning to our results, here is a table of our estimates of just, I'm going to ask you to pause for just a moment. I realize you can't necessarily see us, but a couple of supervisors uh, have questions. Um, and I'll just check with both of you. I'm hoping these are clarifying questions, and we'll get into a more robust discussion after the presentations are completed. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, so I'll ask the I question, know. and you give me feedback. Um, <laughs> one thing that I, so first of all, I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you, so I apologize if this is something that you shared already. But one thing that I did not see on the um, analysis was, and maybe you use this, but like our, our point and count time studies for the homeless or taking into account the number of people that probably aren't in any waiting line because we're not serving them. And those would be people who are extremely high need that live um, in our community and primarily on the streets of our community. Uh, thank you for um, raising that. Uh, to the extent that any of these patients are um, on the waiting list for these facilities, that would be captured as need, but also um, there are many types of, uh, as we learn through working with um, the county, um, there are certain lists that are not necessarily also, um, uh, that, that facilities may not be using um, in, at least when we surveyed them, and that is, you know, unfortunately a limitation of uh, this approach. So to be clear, we didn't use our, our um, I'm asking our staff, we didn't use the homeless, um, point and count time or that database or our reentry, for example, network. And, I, and the reason I'm trying to understand that is because it didn't, I didn't hear it referenced. I, I don't know where that would fall in. I'll ask Greta to weigh in on that. Thank you. Sure. So a couple quick things, and then I think um, others may have, have a couple points um, that they may want to add. A few things. Some of the information shared definitely does touch folks who may or may not um, say appear on a waiting list or be the subject of a referral. For example, the Jack list data is something that was shared with RAND. Um, also among the um, entities and organizations from whom they gathered data were um, the organizations who are part of our homelessness system of care, many of whom are also behavioral health providers, but included 
Office of Supportive Housing, for example. Um, whether they specifically looked at the point in time count, given that that includes folks who both have very serious substance use and mental health needs, but also folks who may not and just have other forms of housing stability, um, our team might be able to answer, but they definitely did gather data um, that's specific to our community that would get at what might be the underlying prevalence of folks who have need for these services but aren't yet connected to them in any way. In addition to, um, Jonathan, you might want to speak to some of the other approaches that you use that really don't look at wait lists but look at um, expert yes. consensus around per 100,000 people on average how many need the service, whether they've accessed it or sought it or not. Well, and what I'm specifically, and that's helpful. I'm using those two examples because those are examples that, those seem to be the only two um, really community feelers out there, and that may not be accurate, but that's my sense of it. And also because the acuity of the communities that we're talking about, to me, aren't reflected in need in the jails or in the services that we currently provide. So one of my concerns is that um, that we see emerging trends of very, very high need people that, that we don't have appropriate placement for. So so that that's what's prompting the question. Now, we don't have a written report yet, so maybe the written report will dive more deeply into those um, those areas, but that, that's what's prompting the question now. Thank you, and I, and I think um, we may circle back to that because those are, are good points that, that may be addressed in part through our staff's uh, response to, uh, to the RAND report, including uh, you know, limitations and, and caveats. So I'd like, um, with my, my colleague's consent, to move through the RAND report, staff's response, um, public comment, and then when we have all of that information together, come back to my colleagues for conversation. Thank you. All right. Um, so this is uh, our first slide of the results, which um, as you can see is a table of our estimates of adult uh, psychiatric bed capacity. The middle row in this table represents our main capacity measure, which is beds that are located in the geographic bounds of the county. And the last row is our estimate of county accessible beds. And um, one of the uh, takeaways that we found here was comparing the rate of beds per population served. So for acute, uh, for crisis residential and for subacute, uh, we estimated that the capacity rate of county accessible beds was about three and a half to four times the rate of beds in the county relative to the entire population served. And for community residential, the capacity rate for county accessible beds is slightly below the rate for beds in the county. And this next slide summarizes our estimates of psychiatric bed need, adult psychiatric bed need for beds located in the county. So this is for the entire population in Santa Clara. The middle row here is our estimates based on survey data. And the bottom row is our estimates based on the um, uh, technical expert panel. And so some of the takeaways from this slide is that um, we see how some levels of care, in particular subacute, the estimates using both data points are fairly close, whereas um, for other levels of care, there's a larger range, like in community residential. Um, another thing I want to note uh, that is not displayed on this slide, but was um, informed in our estimates uh, you, for the survey data is that we did find fairly large bottlenecks at all levels of care. And when I use that term, what I mean is that patients who are stuck in one level of care when another level of care would be more appropriate. And in particular, administrators who responded to our survey 
reported that um, about 40% of occupants in acute facilities needed to be transferred down to a lower level of care, and about 30% of both subacute and community residential occupants also uh, needed to be transferred down to lower levels of care. And so these numbers that you see here reflect uh, those, um, uh, those issues. And this slide offers our top level estimates for capacity, need, and either shortages or surpluses. So the new data here um, are on the right-hand side. Um, and so I'll just you know, go down by level. We do see a sort of modest to moderate um, surplus of acute beds. We then see a very small uh, surplus of crisis residential beds. Uh, we see a consistent shortage of subacute beds, and then we see a consistent surplus of community residential beds. And um, I will say for the uh, levels where we identified surpluses, we also did find that these facilities in general had very high occupancy rates and wait lists, but the reason why um, it sometimes led to an estimation of a shortage had to do with the bottlenecks I described earlier, and that large proportions of these patients needed to be in a different level of care. Another thing I want to note, um, as, as you can see, the ranges in need or, or ranges of shortages or surpluses sometimes did vary widely. And um, just to offer some explanation for the ranges that were a bit larger, uh, for the acute uh, need range, the upper bound estimate in this, in this case includes both um, need for acute inpatient and crisis residential. And that in part explains why it is so much larger than the lower bound estimate, which is specific to just acute inpatient. And then the lowest um, level for community residential, um, our results using both methods uh, are, are pretty strongly suggestive of a surplus of beds, but it's hard for us to you know, narrow in on the exact quantity of this surplus. And using the survey data, we estimate a, a much larger surplus, but using our expert consensus estimates, which don't necessarily take into account the specifics of Santa Clara, we estimate a much smaller surplus. And for our child beds, we focused on acute inpatient and uh, crisis residential levels. And um, as you can see for capacity, we estimated 17 acute beds, um, no beds that were for crisis residential, we estimated a need of uh, just a bit above 30 to a bit above 70, um, which led us to um, a modest to moderate uh, shortage of uh, beds at these levels. Now, transitioning to our adult substance use disorder beds, um, we have the same structure of the table as for psychiatric in that the middle line is for all the beds in the county serving the entire population of adults. And then the lower uh, row is for county accessible beds. And we see a similar trend to um, the psychiatric beds in that the rate of, the, of beds per population served is much higher at the, for county accessible beds compared to beds in the county. Another thing I also want to underscore is, as you can see, the um, total beds is much smaller than if you were to sum up beds across each of these levels. And that's because uh, these, these SUD facilities are able to flex beds at different levels of care. And so for our um, estimates of adult substance use disorder bed in need, uh, due to data limitations, we calculated need across all ASAM level three beds. 
And uh, we estimated a range of need from 286 beds up to 660 beds. And this slide represents um, our top level estimates of capacity need and shortages or surpluses at all um, SQD levels of care in the county. Um, so starting with the actually this time the uh, second row for children, we estimate either a modest surplus or um, a modest shortage, which taken together suggests that capacity and need for this population may be fairly aligned. But for adults, we estimate a fairly large range of uh, on one end, an 83 bed surplus to a 309 bed shortage. Um, so the approach that led us to estimate the surplus of SUD beds, that was based on our survey results. And um, in our survey, we found that facilities had a relatively low average occupancy rate of 62%. And it's, it's certainly possible that this occupancy rate is due to facilities excluding high need populations, which I will get to on the next slide. Um, by contrast, the approach that led us to estimate shortages of beds were based on using either um, the US or the state of California as benchmarks. Now, here are some of the results of our secondary analyses where we surveyed facilities about their willingness to accept patients with certain conditions or characteristics. For psychiatric facilities, we found that just a minority of them accepted patients with dementia or individuals who were not ambulatory or um, who required oxygen, uh, as well as individuals without funding sources. And we found the rates of uh, facilities willing to accept patients with certain conditions to be even lower for SUD facilities. Um, in particular, we found that only about uh, one in five SUD facilities accepted patients with co-occurring health conditions, as well as patients with prior involvement in the criminal justice system. Another secondary analysis was examining uh, the proportion of patients uh, who were from, who were in, who were residing in faci facilities in Santa Clara County, but were residents from outside the county. Um, we observed modest to moderate proportions of patients in these facilities who were from outside the county. Uh, but likewise, we also found for the facilities that we surveyed right outside the county, that they also had modest to moderate proportions of uh, residents who were from Santa Clara County. In our uh, projections of need, we um, and estimated that need for psychiatric adult beds would increase by about 4% over the next five years. And the takeaway here is that um, any shortages that we identify uh, could then potentially worsen um, if they are not addressed. So our takeaways across all of these results, um, we found that there was a shortage of adult subacute beds. We also found modest to moderate surpluses of adult acute crisis residential and community residential beds. We estimate the need for uh, psychiatric beds to increase by about 4% over the next five years. We also found that um, there are numerous hard to place populations uh, for psychiatric facilities that in fact may explain some of the disconnects between uh, what we estimate as the bed capacity versus what we were able to estimate as the need of these beds. And uh, finally, that the bottlenecks we identified are exacerbating some of these problems where there's an inability of uh, patients to transfer to a higher or lower level of care that would be more appropriate. Our key takeaways for our SUD analysis were that um, two of the four estimates suggested a shortage the other two did suggest a surplus, um, but 
uh, one of the, again, one of the reasons that may explain why we have these discrepant findings are that so many of these facilities are not accessible to vulnerable populations. And given these takeaways, we have three recommendations um, to the county. The first is to address the shortage of psychiatric beds, specifically subacute beds for adults, and um, also to address availability for hard to place populations, in particular those with dementia and uh, those without funding sources. Our second recommendation is to address the lack of SUD treatment bed availability for hard to place populations, in particular those who have co-occurring health conditions and those who have prior involvement in the criminal justice system. And our last recommendation is for the county to track investments in bed capacity over time. I, I do just want to underscore some of the limitations of our analysis. Um, the licensure data, uh, which we used as our baseline to estimate capacity, had various quality issues, and we did our best to address this through both our survey and information we received from the county. Uh, our survey that we used to um, support our capacity analysis, but also our need estimates. Um, for some uh, certain some levels of care had a small sample size. And um, just in general, with any survey, there's the risk of social desirability bias where survey respondents may frame things in a more positive way than may be what's actually happening. And our last limitation is that we did not have a separate estimate of need for county accessible beds. And that concludes our presentation and we look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Jonathan, before we switch back to the staff um, slide deck, I was gonna actually ask you to just go back to slide 22 on your slide deck, which is your key takeaway slide. And I was just going to um, maybe briefly before we transition to our county slide deck, talk a little bit um, about the staff. Um, the staff takeaways um, from, from some of the RAND analysis. And as I do that, let me just first also um, attend to something that I neglected to do when I got started, which is to say presenting here with me are Deputy County Executive Key Lee, Sherry Turao, Paul Lorenz, and Curtis Ohashi. Um, and, and so um, they're, I, I am taking the lead and kind of giving the general overview to make sure we can move through the presentation, but uh, they of course have lots to say on all these topics um, and we'll chime in. But one thing I was gonna just um, emphasize about some of what you just heard um, from John Levin's presentation is um, that certainly the shortfall in adult subacute beds is something that we've been very attuned to, is something that is very significant to the experience of certainly our inpatient uh, system of care and the challenges of, of placing patients, and I think really um, dovetails with the second conclusion, which is at any given time, 40% of our acute care beds have folks who are sitting in those beds who don't need to be there because there isn't a subacute bed available for them. And so the lack of subacute beds creates the feeling of significant shortage in acute care beds even where if we had subacute beds to discharge folks to, we would then have capacity at the acute level to, to have that feel like we could stay within that 85% goal to have throughput there. Um, and then I think the other thing that I just wanted to put an exclamation point behind is what's the fourth bullet point here, which is that hard to place populations create a disconnect between supply and demand. And the slide um, that, that really, um, touched very significantly on this, I believe is slide 19. Jonathan, I don't know if you can click back to that yes. quickly. Um, I will go back to it. Here you go. Which um, I think puts a fine point on something that we experience at a less data-driven level than what's presented here, which is to say that if we have somebody, for example, at Barbara Aaron's Pavilion who is um, non-ambulatory, um, then we may be the only um, acute care facility willing to take that patient, creating really significant challenges, or that patient may sit 
over at VMC rather than going over to BAP or EPS. There's a lot of um, also psychiatric care that's uh, occurring in our more acute care hospitals because we have folks with really significant medical needs who, but for those medical needs, would be in our acute um, psychiatric beds. So there's a lot of um, complexity here, and you can see in the substance use treatment facilities, really significant exclusions for huge numbers of folks. For example, if someone um, needs substance use treatment and has a sex offense conviction, only 21% of substance use treatment facilities will even consider accepting that patient. So part of what um, gave rise to a really significant potential disconnect between our experience and some of their findings is we'll have vacant beds with some of our substance use treatment providers, but they won't accept the patients that we're trying to send to those. So there's vacant capacity um, that that really should be there to meet the need, but because we can't actually get some of those facilities because of those exclusionary criteria to take some of the patients we'd want to send, we experience a really significant capacity shortage. So going back to one of the key um, points that I articulated before we got their analysis, a huge area of focus for us is really trying to figure out how do we ensure that where we have folks with these complex needs or complex histories that may give rise to facilities um, not feeling like they can meet the needs of those clients that we figure out a way to have um, an appropriate level of placement for them. Um, so I wanted to emphasize that before we now switch back to the staff presentation. Um, and I'm sure there's more questions on that, but did want to make that point briefly. And, and Supervisor Lee um, requested to ask, a to ask a question of Jonathan before oh, sure. we move on to the staff report. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, you mentioned at the end of your presentation that uh, of the limitations of this study, uh, I just want to ask you, you know, what, how, would, how should we interpret these study results given these limitations? That's a very good question. Um, I think that um, one of the ways we try to address these limitations is by estimating uh, or producing multiple estimates of uh, shortages or surpluses, um, such that, uh, and, and using methods that even if they each have their limitations, they, the limitations are not necessarily the same, such that if we end up um, estimating, let's say, uh, the same or a similar uh, quantity of, let's say, a shortage or a surplus, I think that gives us greater confidence in um, our estimates being what is in fact happening on the ground. Um, I think also uh, similar to you know, what uh, Greta described that um, <clears throat> knowing what the limitations are can uh, help us, um, uh, can help explain what uh, potentially um, uh, what 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 is leading to our conclusion? And I'll I'll say what I mean by that. Like for the survey data, um, it's we estimated a surplus of SUD beds, but that does not take into account um, the fact that uh, many of these SUD facilities are not accepting uh, certain patients with conditions that are known to be highly prevalent among the SUD population, and so. Uh, our other estimates for um, need of SUD care that are looking at sort of larger um, municipalities uh, may be, um, are, are not necessarily limited that same way. Thank you. I'm going to go back to Greta and then um, have you lead into the staff's report, please. Sure, and so I'm gonna very quickly move through um, our slide deck and then we'll, we'll turn it over um, for questions of which we expect there to be many, um, especially because I'll move quickly, but I wanna make sure there's ample time for questions. I may actually take public comment before we sure. turn to the board for conversation. Sure, so, um, so we, we did wanna to touch a little bit about now that we have um, these assessments from RAN that identify some really critical gaps um, in both the total number of beds we need at certain levels of care and certainly the accessibility that we need for hard to place populations, um, even at levels of care where we have probably sufficient beds if they were accepting all the patients that need them. Um, 
how will we, what are the different approaches we can use to expand bed capacity? And we just wanted to highlight that um, there are really three primary vehicles through which we can do that. One is expanding our contracts to include additional capacity, and the board's seen us um, talk about some of those expansion efforts to um, support providers in their facility expansion, since a lot of um, that work can sometimes happen more quickly than the time horizon for um, building and expanding county facilities. And then, of course, um, as is the case uh, now, we are also expanding county-owned and operated properties um, and facilities that would meet some of these needs. Next slide. So focusing specifically on um, some of the outcomes of the RAND assessment and what's the ongoing work, um, first I would just observe that even where the RAND report concluded that we don't have a shortage for many reasons, including um, meeting to, needing to meet the needs of some of our hard to place populations, we are working to expand capacity. Um, and that's certainly true um, uh, in uh, acute care knowing that we do have these backups because of the lack of subacute care as well as just a really significant need for acute inpatient hospitalization. Some of those efforts are highlighted here. And specifically wanted to call out that um, uh, it was good to see that their um, estimate of need for children really aligns with the major investment we've made to build our child and adolescent psychiatric facility, um, which as the board knows is on track to open in the next few years. Um, on the crisis residential for children, that because of both the state licensure requirements and many other factors has been a really difficult level of care for operators to successfully um, provide. There have been some providers of uh, children's uh, STRTP, which is the licensing category where um, crisis residential programs for kids fall within, um, have operated short term in the county not worked out, that's been the experience elsewhere. And so we are um, actively working both with our provider community and with adjacent counties to um, look at how we can support crisis residential capacity expansions for kids. I would note though that we have, although we have zero crisis residential beds operating for kids in our county, we can access crisis residential beds for kids um, outside our county and do so um, uh, through a team that really focuses on placement needs for, for youth. Next slide, please. So at the subacute level, um, the findings of the RAND study were very, as I mentioned, consistent with um, what what was would have been SAF's um, expectations around the really significant shortage here. And there are a number of efforts underway to really identify the quickest ways to try and close that gap, um, as well as longer term strategies that we're pursuing in parallel. And some of those are highlighted here, and we're happy to go into more detail on those um, at the board's request. Next slide, please. Um, for community residential, in part, um, I think because of some of the limitations and complexity of that analysis, there was a finding of no shortage, of course, um, experientially. We think we need more capacity at this level of care, and so we continue to make significant investments in expansion of community residential capacity. And I would note that, um, as, as was discussed previously, not included in the analysis by RAND are providers of residential um, support that are non-clinical in nature. So for example, um, our recovery residences, of which um, several hundred are funded by behavioral health to provide sober living environments to folks with substance use disorder, permanent supportive housing, Boarding cares where the county hasn't needed to pay a patch to pay, place a client there were not included in the RAND analysis, given the scope and given that they were building on their work um, that they had done in prior communities to really accelerate the timeline um, that they could bring their analysis to us here. So let's go to the next slide. Um, on the SETS residential assessment, as, um, as John mentioned, based on the um, fact that there are many substance use treatment facilities in our county that are not at capacity. One of the metrics they used um, did determine that there was a surplus of beds. I think we believe that the, um, the, the reality on the ground better aligns with the really significant shortage that was yielded by one of the other methodologies that they used. And so this is an area where um, we really think we need to, as we've described to the board previously, put lots of um, energy and effort into expanding access to care, which is going to be a focus in um, our second part of the staff report. 
Um, but here is just a, a quick snapshot of efforts currently underway um, and certainly more um, assessment of opportunities in the works as well. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> here, uh, just following up on what I'd mentioned previously, our descriptions of some of the other um, more housing focused uh, placements that are used to meet the needs of um, clients that are also um, having substance use and mental health needs that are being attended to by the Behavioral Health Department. I just would um, note that here uh, we have a lot of um, uh, work that's being done where we know um, based on all of our housing first oriented strategies that it's very hard for folks to recover and get well if they are unstably housed. And so oftentimes when we see someone um, who has a really significant need, we're focusing first on getting them housed and then getting them off in the outpatient treatment services that paired with housing um, are the path to recovery for that person. So here's a brief snapshot of some of the efforts to expand capacity underway here. Next slide. Um, we had a request from the last board meeting to lay out some of the grant funding um, that we've been able to draw down or pursue to support expansions at each of these levels of care. So that's um, briefly captured on this slide. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, and with this, I'm just gonna briefly um, highlight a few of the many <laughs> items that we included on the next several slides. Um, which really speak to a focus on expansion of substance use treatment services. Um, and I will just give a brief um, note of thanks for the leadership from both our um, medical teams and behavioral health teams, and particularly some of our addiction medicine um, physicians who provided some really wonderful feedback and thoughts and ideas that, um, that uh, some of which are incorporated in these next few slides related to our expansion efforts. So the first is um, we'll be adding a physician leader to behavioral health's executive team to specifically focus on um, substance use treatment and expanding our strategies and work in that area. Um, and the uh, expansion of an uh, addiction medicine consult service at our hospitals and our outpatient clinics is really to try and better support um, what is often the presentation of a really serious need for substance use treatment in those medical settings and to support our providers at all levels of care in meeting the needs of folks who present um, with really significant substance use disorder, as well as the creation of a potential outpatient hub clinic that would focus on withdrawal management. Um, and then uh, we are in early discussions with uh, San Jose Behavioral Health regarding the potential for them to provide medical detoxification services. We can talk a little bit more about that um, if the board would like more details, but there will be more details to come on that in the next um, handful of meetings where we provide updates on our expansion efforts. Next slide, please. Um, I, I won't go bullet by bullet, but here you can see um, a number of other efforts, some of which we've previewed for the board previously that are underway to expand capacity or otherwise um, provide resources to meet what is obviously really significant need in our community for substance use treatment and related needs. Next slide. Um, and here also are some uh, connected efforts, including um, being one of the first counties across the state to participate in a pilot on contingency management programs, um, the partnership between public health and behavioral health to have better and deeper understandings of um, overdose data and op opportunities for action and more targeted action, um, and addressing health disparities, which we know are profound in all of these areas, um, as well as the potential development of a SETS-focused full-service partnership um, which is something that we know our um, substance use treatment providers in the community were really excited about as a potential expansion effort. And then finally, and really significantly, um, and I think this speaks a little bit to um, one of the comments that Supervisor Chavez made earlier, we need to try and figure out ways to make it even easier for folks who have not yet accessed um, substance use treatment to gain access to that. And so there's been a really significant focus that will continue over the course of this year to work across all um, potential points of entry into our system of care to just create less um, 
challenge in accessing care, including um, having more opportunities for walk-in self-referral to different substance use treatment providers, expanding our outreach and engagement. Um, there's some really interesting work happening throughout the state to really focus on, um, and Sherry can correct me if I get the number wrong, but it's 90 plus percent of folks who we think um, might need substance use treatment across California and much more broadly um, are not getting access to any treatment at all, but do have an underlying substance use disorder that goes untreated. Lots of folks um, living in lots of different circumstances who need that level of care and are just not getting it. Um, next slide, please. So with that, we uh, will, I guess, turn it over for public comment. Yes, thank you. Jess, do we have speakers in the chambers and or on Zoom? I have three in chambers and three on Zoom. All right, I will uh, remind both groups, if anyone else in chambers desires to speak on this item, now is the time to fill out a yellow card and turn it into the clerk. When the first speaker begins speaking, we will close the live queue. And for speakers uh, or potential speakers on Zoom, if you're interested in commenting on this item, please raise your virtual hand now. We will close that queue when the first speaker begins. We're looking in the back. We're up to eight total. I don't have any additional from the back. All right, so then let's begin the uh, in-person commenters, please. Our first speaker in person will be John Sweeney, followed by Lorraine Zeller, followed by public commenter. Feel free to queue. John, you'll have two minutes to speak. I, I'm just gonna note before you start, two minutes is Fine, we're up to eight total, so we can get all the way to 15 at two minutes each. If we do get speakers beyond number 15, we'll, um, we'll need to reduce the time per speaker to one minute. Great. Thank you so much. Dear President Ellenberg, County Supervisors and staff, on behalf of the County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Marianne Dewan, and the Santa Clara County Office of Education, we want to thank the county for its ongoing partnership in addressing the issues of mental health and substance abuse among the county's young people. The Santa Clara County Office of Education is a strong believer that strong investment in general early support helps prevent escalations in the acute need of both young and adult individuals in the county. The work we are doing together to open wellness centers and more schools across the county is bringing this research-based intervention to more young people every day. We look forward to the ongoing implementation of the operational plan report in regards to the wellness centers. The Santa Clara County Office of Education also recognizes the terrible toll of substance abuse on youth and families in our communities and is especially concerned about the ongoing fentanyl crisis. In 2021, 11 children and 31 youth died from fentanyl overdose in this county. In collaboration with the county, the Office of Education has provided Narcon training and over 1,300 Narcon kits to school staff and community members through 43 distribution events. The Santa Clara County, uh, in Santa Clara County rather, 103 schools have access to Narcon on campus with supporting board policies in place. This is life-saving work and we remain committed to our ongoing partnership. Thank you. Lorraine Zeller, please go ahead. Good afternoon, President Ellenberg and Honorable Supervisors. Uh, Lorraine Zeller with Community Living Coalition. Um, I don't believe that this RAND study is a complete analysis of the need for care at all levels of a behavioral health system. Um, and you know, I'll just point to the 2020 Behavioral Health Management Audit that stated the continuum of available 24-hour care, residential care services also includes licensed residential care facilities and unlicensed board and care facilities. Uh, the RAN, I mean, the uh, management audit also said due to a shortage of licensed residential care facilities that accept clients with mental illness, case managers said they're often forced to place clients in the least desirable option, unlicensed board and care. 
So I'd like to ask how many licensed board and care facilities um, mental health, our mental health beneficiaries are placed in, how many of these adult residential facilities are needed, how many beneficiaries qualify per the severity of their mental illness for licensed board and care in our county, how many of these beneficiaries are being referred to unlicensed, unregulated facilities known as room and board, board and care, or independent, independent living. Um, Highly vulnerable clients deemed in need of supervision and assistance with activities of daily living because there's not enough of the adult residential care wind up fending for themselves in unlicensed, unregulated group facilities. Um, we need to, therefore, you know, they, they wind up homeless. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Our next speaker wrote their name as public commenter. Are you still here? Thank you. Nope, to the, to the um, podium, please. We're right here? Thank you, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Susan, um, Cindy, Sherry. Um, yeah, I was uh, the first peer hired by the county in 1998 and um, worked with uh, Kira Kazanzas and Mental Health Advocacy Project and uh, Momentum to um, begin a, a peer movement, um, you know, more collective effort in Santa Clara County. And um, so I'm, I'm just hoping to help revive that. And, um, and I also just, um, you know, there's, there's so much going on in the world today in, in terms of support for uh, nervous system healing, and um, that um, uh, brain—you know—this idea of brain illness is is not accurate. And so I, I just question why we've had such an increase in need for beds um, uh, in the public mental health system. And um, and I I just want us to look at. Uh, you know, what, what has created this crisis in California. So, um, because our, our, our peers uh, and our children especially do not need to be labeled with serious mental illness. They, they need play, they need, they need to be on t-ball teams, they need to interact with their families, they need to not be isolated and stigmatized and, and uh, you know, I mean, I mean, we're growing beds for them, but, but, uh, you know, I just, I just want us to step back and and look at the wisdom of trauma film. There's uh, the Trauma Research Foundation, the Trauma Foundation. I mean, if if we could, if we could do some social marketing on that for. Thank you very much for your comment. Our next speakers are online. We're currently sorry before we start. I just want to check the number and let people have an extra second. No problem. We currently have six hands up. Okay, which is what we had before. So I'm going to assume that anybody that has wanted to speak on this item has now raised their hand. If not, right now would be the time to do it. When the first speaker begins speaking, we'll close the Zoom queue. Thank you. Holding at six, our first speaker is Sarah Givanji. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Sarah Givanji. I'm um, the medical director of the Valley Homeless Program and also an addiction medicine physician. And I just wanted to comment to say that I'm just, I'm thrilled to see some of the um, <clears throat> proposals from behavioral health to improve access. Um, you know, I know that there's been a lot of talk with the RAND report about kind of residential beds, but also really through strengthening outpatient services and engaging folks, you know, in the acute care hospital setting, which is where we're seeing a lot of these individuals providing a higher level of care with medically supervised detox and then reducing barriers to access with walk-in access sites. I also am really appreciating the conversation around populations that um, are not served by a lot of these facilities, including the um, including justice-involved populations. And 
wanted to kind of expand on that to say that as we think about kind of facilities that can serve them, you know, especially as they're leaving, um, <clears throat> as they're leaving jails and prisons, or as alternatives to incarceration, not to forget that, you know, one other potential area is really strengthening capacity of treating these populations while in custody. And knowing, you know, as we um, provide reentry services, we have a reentry clinic and seeing that, you know, so this is um, a crucial opportunity to engage many folks who are in custody in care, of course, for um, mental health care and then for substance use treatment care and to um, make sure that we kind of think about how we can expand capacity for addiction medicine expertise and consultation into the custody setting um, so that we don't miss this opportunity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. We'll open your microphone. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I'd like to thank the Rand Corporation for the attempt that they made. Um, you were working with incomplete information that was intentional that you not create that comprehensive analysis, but what you have is enough. It's enough for supervisor Lee because I fully 100% believe in his, in, in, in his enthusiasm and his moral understanding that we that have power must use that in order to fortify those that have none. And I have seen that exemplified in Supervisor Lee's positions consistently. What I would like to say is I'm disappointed. And I'm disappointed because the county makes sure that it does not give them what they need to do what they gotta do. The voices that I'm hearing, especially from the COO, Greta Hansen convolutes and just completely disintegrates it with language, just I mean, just completely just intellectualizes her way through this issue. You cannot get a better informed, better position in these meetings on these topics than Lorraine Zeller and myself, where her constantly, constantly. I personally, what, what I'd like is if somebody can ask the Rand Corporation, did they take into account the deficits that were created in this infrastructural system? As a result of the three strikes you're outlaw, remember you guys were sending us to prison. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, a busload of 32 men were on their way to San Quentin. I was on that bus. And that created the generation of deficits in these systems. So I would like, I would like as a courtesy, a direct question to the Rand Corporation. Did you take that into account, the deficits that created? Our next speaker is Sandra Asher. We'll open your microphone. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, my name is Sandra Asher. I'm a District 5 resident and the mother of a child with significant mental health struggles. I appreciate the county's focus on expanding access to mental health services and substance use treatment. Um, but a few questions and concerns come up um, with this report. First off, um, I'm wondering if a look is being uh, taken to combine the analysis today of the need with the results of the ATI work group for this afternoon, uh, that will be reported this afternoon. It's also concerning that the lack of beds for hard to place individuals with developmental conditions it's frightening and considering that 30% of our jail inmates report having a cognitive disability, it's no result that we are housing those with developmental disabilities and cognitive disabilities in our jails. We won't place them in the facilities that can be of most use to them. It's clear from the report that many psychiatric facilities are not accessible to people with disabilities and other vulnerable populations. I'm also concerned that only acute and crisis youth beds were analyzed. All levels of residential care are needed for our youth. I know that it is hard to do crisis residential for children. I had to send my child out of state to get the acute crisis residential services he needed. I'd like you to look at best practices in other states and make these successful here in California. I know there are legal limitations, but please be innovative. Parents shouldn't have to send their young children hours away or out of state to get the help they need. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Uday Kapoor. We'll open your microphone. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to County for uh, using RAN as a vehicle to analyze the situation. I respectfully, I'm actually from NAMI. I respectfully state that the analysis is very flawed. Uh, the sample size is small. And I think the people that were surveyed are not the right people. I mean, they are part of the people, but they're not, it's not a complete picture. So a, a large population that are living in facilities that are not under the county uh, jurisdiction in a sense, uh, they're not supporting them. They don't, there's no contract. I think people are suffering, so they need to be surveyed as well. So uh, again, respectfully stating that uh, the analysis, uh, in my opinion, is not correct. Uh, for the first time, I'm hearing the, the word surplus. You know, it is it's not consistent with the crisis that the county is facing. So uh, those are my comments. Thank you very much for the time. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to follow up on the comments from Sandra Azure and Lorraine Zeller. Um, there are just so many flaws in this report. I can't list them all in two minutes. Um, and um, I strongly contest their accounting that there are too many beds in some categories. We're also totally overlooking the needs of people who are in the board and care homes and stuff like that and having to go into the unlicensed board and care homes. I've heard stories from people who've lived in those and uh, they're pretty horrible. We shouldn't be placing people in unsafe conditions. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is Elisa Kofkinsborg. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Elisa Kofkinsborg with the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. There were many exciting updates in this report, but I'm going to focus in the overall report, but I'm going to focus my comments on the RAND study. Um, I appreciate that the researchers shared that there were limitations, and I think you've heard more from other speakers about those. I see that as an opportunity. We're able to identify the limitations, and it provides a roadmap for us on where we need to dig in. Some areas are ones that county staff and providers and consumers have already identified. They may not have been part of what was possible with the data we have and the timeframe for this report, but they are critical if we're looking at this from the perspective of um, those in need. Uh, I think it's also important to note um, that when a provider does not accept uh, someone who is looking for a placement, it's often due to licensing requirements or the program designs um, on which their services are built. The presenter referred to this limitation not being the case in many larger municipalities. And I'm very excited and interested to look at those, learn more about them and identify what aspects allow the providers in these areas to accept the clients that he was referring to. Overall, I just wanna state that BHCA members are committed to be partners in this important work going forward. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. I'll offer here just a, a couple of housekeeping uh, points. I'm not going to ask any uh, substantive questions today, but I do want to thank uh, Greta and Curtis and Paul and Edwin and Sherry's absence uh, and Key and a number of others, other uh, uh, Key County uh, folks who are involved in this work for, for taking a considerable amount of time uh, to walk me through a lot of these issues so that I understand them. 
uh, well enough to explain to my constituents and anyone who asks. So thank you for that. Uh, in terms of just housekeeping and 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 next actions, um, as we noted, as noted in the uh, April nineteenth off agenda report from behavioral health following today's report, we're going to shift to a quarterly cycle of reports on the behavioral health system expansion with reports coming in August, October, January, and April. Uh, second, while uh, Supervisor Lee and I were discussing capital planning at the May 26th FGOC meeting, uh, there was agreement that Greta would present or coordinate monthly reports on the status of behavioral health facility projects to FGOC, inclusive of uh, projects in county facilities as well as those we lease, such as 650 South Bascom. Uh, to me, really the most essential element of these reports is understanding what our expert professionals recommend is needed in our system of care so that we can exercise our oversight and fiduciary responsibilities to assure that the work is completed and that funds are directed to fill system gaps. So we will move in 10-minute um, rounds, because I, I don't have a, have a sense of how many questions you all might have, but we'll do as, as many rounds as needed. And who would like to start? Supervisor Lee. And will you just um, set the clock for 10 minutes for each of us? Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> President Allenberg. Um, so the first question I have uh, with staff is regarding the priority gaps. Um, what are the priority gaps that you can identify for us right now on sets on our substance use treatment services right now? Mm -hmm. Supervisor, I just wanted to make sure I heard you. You, you said oh, you wanted sorry. to hear the um, key gaps that we see as top priorities in substance use treatment as an area. Exactly. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, well, maybe I'll start and then I'll turn it over um, to our panel, but I think a huge need is really making sure that we um, continue to focus on where we're seeing uh, real significant barriers in placing clients with complex needs. That was a portion of the analysis that I think really resonated with a lot of folks, was also consistent with our experience, and I think Curtis could speak to that um, specifically with respect to patients that end up in our acute care system that we struggle to then move downstream when they're ready um, for placement, as well as uh, expanding kind of the front door in um, to substance use treatment for folks who are ready to um, receive treatment or identified, for example, in a medical setting when they're meeting with their primary care doctor as somebody who may need substance use treatment, making it much smoother and easier for those folks to enter care through a whole variety of channels. Um, and then uh, working really just to grow capacity in partnership with a lot of our providers and understanding some of the barriers they're experiencing. Um, one of the comments from Elisa Kofkinsborg really spoke to just some of the complexity of operating some of these levels of care um, and making sure that we're, uh, we're figuring that out as we also enter a pretty new era of the way that the state is funding and supporting and, um, and trying to, to, to work with counties to expand access. But, um, I think I'll turn it over to the panel, and Curtis, I don't know if you want to speak more to just some of those um, downstream transitions. Good afternoon, Supervisor Lee. Curtis Ohashi from Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to defer on the priority gaps question. That's more of a behavioral health question, but my, I can make a general comment on it. When we design um, either mental health or substance abuse services, we really focus on developing the system of care, focusing on from the highest to the lowest level because every individual is different. And what we like to do is provide an individualized assessment to place the patient according to their needs at the appropriate level of care. And then once they're there, they're able to progress down or up based on their progress. So my comment would be that the gaps that were highlighted by the RAND report are the things that we need to supplement to make a full um, system of care for substance abuse. Hi, good afternoon, um, President Ellenberg, members of the Board of Supervisors, Sherry Terrao, Director with our Behavioral Health Services Department. Um, Greta mentioned a few of the um, items that I would also have highlighted as gaps with respect to substance abuse, um, namely uh, the front door and access, I think is something that we're gonna be really focused on, ensuring that individuals that are ready 
uh, for treatment and ready to um, address recovery are able to um, get into services as quickly as possible. That's something we're very committed to. I think the other um, area that we've shared in other prior reports are really around workforce development. So you've heard through the RAND study um, some of the challenges associated with either programs or services accepting clients that have both a mental health and substance use disorder. Uh, we sometimes refer to that as co-occurring conditions. Those actually become very complex situations where sometimes the individual's individualized system, whether it be mental health or substance use, struggles to address both um, in a co-occurring condition. And so our efforts are really focused um, to address that through workforce development, our efforts to develop um, our practitioners to be co-occurring capable, enhanced, or ex more experienced to be able to address those needs are another area that we're going to be very focused on. Uh, Sorry, thank you. I just like to add that um, while the focus of this presentation and you know the RAND study is on the treatment facilities, temporary treatment facilities, uh, um, it is. I didn't want it to uh, go unsaid that we do see that temporary housing and permanent housing programs, especially for persons with uh, a substance use disorder, um, is a part of the continuum and is a very important. Um, part of our strategy, and we will put energy to the, that as well. Thank you. Um, the, president, uh, the other question I want to follow up is at the last month's uh, Health and Hospital Committee meeting, um, when we talked about the SUDS and also detox uh, services, um, we discussed amending the contract with DHCS for medical detox services. Um, so what are the next steps with amending these contracts for withdrawal management for especially the levels, the most acute level, 3.7 and 4.0? One thing I would just say on that at the outset is we actually have a meeting scheduled pulling together a whole bunch of stakeholders tomorrow morning where we're going to hmm. um, really focus in on um, also engaging our medical system of care. I think as we've mentioned before, one of the challenges is um, uh, who, who's best situated to meet that gap given that right now we have a scenario where access to those services should be flowing through folks' mm -hmm. medical insurance. Right now the reimbursement rates through Medi-Cal are too low. So tomorrow morning um, our, our meeting is really going to focus on what is the most rapid and effective strategy to meet that. In the meantime, as we mentioned, we're working with San Jose Behavioral Health to expand beyond what we're currently providing in our acute care hospitals. Um, access to medical detox as well as the outpatient um, hub model that we're also in the process of exploring and developing while we separately look at sort of some of the funding barriers that have really led to a shortage of access to medical detox throughout the state of California for Medi-Cal beneficiaries and folks without um, any insurance at all. Okay. Um, good that you uh, talked about the uh, contract <clears throat> contracting with the San Jose Behavioral Health uh, for some of the medical de detox work. Um, are we also considering uh, using, you know, our own you know, VMC, our own services uh, in-house to provide medical detox as well? Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Mm -hmm. So as you well know, we provide medical detox services on the inpatient unit at Valley Medical Center and in some instances over at O'Connor Hospital. Right. And those patients are typically presenting to the hospitals that have an acute medical need. Um, and as we work through this issue, one of the things that we clearly understand is that the appropriate use of facilities is, in order to sustain the model is really important. Uh, so we are looking at San Jose Behavioral Health, as you indicated, uh, because they do have the facilities at the appropriate level of care for which we could probably contract with. So I guess my question is, when you say they come to VMC, so therefore they actually get served the DM VMC for the, for the medical detox, I guess my question is, if they come into a different area into our system, was, is there any type of referral to actually get to VMC for the medical detox uh, work? So, Supervisor Lee, yes, if this individual that, that's being referred to Valley um, by a privileged credential physician mm -hmm. um, has a medical need and meets the criteria for admissions, we will absolutely care for that individual. Okay. Um, so, now we talk about costs. Uh, what would you say is the associated cost for providing medical detox? 
So one of the things that I think we would probably have to do, Supervisor, is get back to you with more specifics on that question. Okay. All right. Because obviously the, the facilities is we basically using regular um, regular the, the the our own hospital beds, right, for medical detox, just like for other patients' needs. So they are not designated medical detox beds, but these are just regular patient beds, right? That's correct. They are not designated as specific medical detox beds. They're staffed as acute medical hospital beds. Right. Um, and, and in terms of the funding streams, I think that's what the, the challenge is, is where are we going to be able to get the funding and making sure that the, the funding is sufficient to cover because the cost of treatment is so high versus how much of it is really going to be covered by Medicare and all those other uh, funding sources. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly what we're um, interested in exploring. You know, the, the challenge, as, as you know, there are different models for... Um, for providing services to Medi-Cal beneficiaries. There's all of our capitated patients um, for whom uh, we have total responsibility to provide whatever is the medical care they need. Then there's also the fee-for-service structure where, um, for example, Anthem or Family Health Plan might contract with us to provide the care or could instead, for example, contract directly with San Jose Behavioral Health or another provider for medical detox for their beneficiaries. And so. Those are some of the exact issues that we're exploring and making sure that there's also understanding throughout our system and opportunities to think about why, um, why are we seeing this occurring throughout California. Right. Thank you. I just have one brief final comment, and I won't ask any more questions. How's that? I promise. So my one final comment is that I understand the Santa Clara Valley Health is working as the team of addiction medicine doctors to explore creating the outpatient hub clinic focused on withdrawal management and expansion of the addiction medicine consultation services for both inpatient and outpatient settings. settings. And so when such an update is available, I will be interested to see this information presented at the future public health crisis report. I just want to flag that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Supervisor Lee. Do other supervisors have questions? Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, there's so much to talk about in this, in this study, and then so much that we've learned, so much that you already know. Um, because obviously you do this every day and, and you know what the needs of our community are, but it's, it's really um, useful to have this data reflected on paper so that we can actually have some of these recommendations um, as part of our next steps and plan. So there is a, f a facility um, feasibility assessment and you all know that, that South County has been underserved for many years. I'm wondering what, the, um, what recommendations, if any, for substance abuse treatment in South County, especially in a county-owned facility, if we happen to have any down there that could, have, that could house that. Um, Supervisor, I can just speak from the Santa Clara Valley healthcare standpoint. The, um, so St. Louis Hospital, as with O'Connor Hospital and Valley, continue to see an increasing number of individuals presenting. Uh, I know, <laughs> should we up here or down here? I don't know, but we can um, decide. And in the development of the inpatient consult service for addiction medicine, uh, that team is expected also to provide support uh, to St. Louis Hospital and the physicians and staff there as well. So when we look at this program, we are looking at it from a systems perspective and not just from a single hospital. No, I, I, I get it, but as a regional effort, I mean, it's, it's so difficult for people to, to come. One, I mean, don't get me started on transportation from South County to San Jose, where most services are rendered in any type of uh, service. Um, we're working really hard, and I know administration's been working, and you all have been working really hard to get a lot of services down to South County, but we still don't have transportation, a like really meaningful transportation from South County to San Jose. So when we talk about substance, uh, substance abuse uh, treatment program, it has to be very accessible for that person. Um, otherwise, it, as you know, the moment is gone, and that opportunity is gone. 
Uh, Supervisor Arena, thank you for that question. Um, we do have providers that provide uh, substance use treatment services in the South County area. Um, Advent, we also have a program called House on the Hill. Um, but I think as part of our um, planning effort around um, substance use treatment, that's something that we will take back and continue to evaluate um, in terms of accessibility and availability of those services in the South County region. I appreciate that. I think House on the Hill is very, I know House on the Hill is very specific. That's for women. Um, and I think this was a topic of uh, Gilroy City Council meeting last night, along with um, mental health uh, facilities. But I'm, I'm going to stick to substance abuse for this uh, moment. And thank you so much, Sherry, for that answer. Um, w one of the things that when we were um, discussing all of this, uh, Key and Sherry, uh, we, we talked about this a little bit and we wanted uh, to figure out how do we make sure that the beds that are in Santa Clara County are being kept for our patients. Uh, would you go over that response? Yeah. Um, thank you, Supervisor. Um, I think generally our goal is to work with all of our existing providers to the extent that they have beds um, that are uh, being utilized by out of um, other counties um, that we would try to work with them to um, have access to those beds to reduce the number of you know patients individuals that we are placing outside for example um, you know Crestwood has a mental health rehabilitation center in San Jose about half of those individuals are uh, placements by Santa Clara County and about half other counties. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we've done is um, notify them and are working with them so that as sort of beds turn over from those other county placements that we have access to those, for, for example. Thank you. And, and how do we ensure that, um, encourage providers to take um, high needs patients. For example, in, in South County, as you know, Kaiser's right next to St. Louis Hospital. And from what I'm told, um, Kaiser won't take a, uh, a very high need um, or psychiatric uh, emergency unless uh, a, a patient that's uh, going through a, um, a psychiatric emergency, unless they're stable. And so then St. Louis will take them stabilize them, and then they, they can transition over to Kaiser. So, Supervisor, you've um, really touched on the dilemma I think the, the system faces relative to difficult to place patients, and I think the RAND study once again reinforced those challenges. Um, and you're right, they do end up in our facilities, whether it's at St. Louis Hospital, Valley, and of course, O'Connor, uh, in many instances, when they do present to St. Louis Hospital, we do move the patient to one of our facilities where we believe the patient we would be better served. And nine times out of 10, that is typically Valley Medical Center, where we have the resources to care for that individual that's considered to be high risk and of great need until we can find appropriate placement in the community. Um. I'd love to, to, to see what, um, I think there's gonna be a medical um, provider or um, part of the recommendations I think is hiring somebody on to oversee all of the, um, all of the, what we've learned and the recommendations underneath that. What, what is that position called again? Supervisor, um, I believe you're referring to the uh, medical uh, physician leader for substance use treatment services and behavioral health. Yes, yes. Um, I'd love to, to, to maybe offline learn a little bit more about those strategies. I'm wondering any maybe open enrollment with Kaiser, but I know that this is getting into the weeds, um, but we can talk about that um, a little bit offline. Um, I just want to make sure that South County has what they need in order um, to get um, on track um, and that it's accessible and that it's um, what, it, what they need at the, at the level, uh, meeting them where they're at, basically. 
Okay, I'm gonna move on um, to Good Sam, because I know that Good Sam's behavioral health programs are ending in August, and so I'm wondering, how does that impact, one, the RAND study, and then two, just what, what we know in terms of capacity for, for community? Will that eventually impact our county system? Supervisor, so um, you're correct. Uh, Good Sam, Good Samaritan Hospital is closing a 15-bed unit. It's a, a licensed as a psychiatric facility. Uh, they typically run a census of 13. Um, and as you've noted uh, in the RAND study, uh, you know, arguably there's an excess number of acute adult psychiatric beds in the county. Um, we do know that San Jose Behavioral Health does have, have capacity and they're working very closely with them in that transition plan. Um, you know, I think the focus on the subacute, as we've clearly seen, is, is where we're going to uh, see results relative to managing those additional patients that we're going to have to absorb somewhere in, these, uh, in our facilities. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're clearly looking at is, um, as stated over and over again, is how we can contract in the short term for IMD capacity and build that capacity over the, in the, in, over the next six to 12 months. Okay, so I'm at 50 seconds. So I'm, I'm going to end here and then maybe um, if there's another opportunity for a second round, I'll do that. Thank you. There absolutely is. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Just very briefly, I, I wanted to go back to a, an observation that um, Ms. Hansen made, which, uh, which I, I thought, you know, part of the challenge with this is there's so much here uh, to sort of sift through and what do you pull out that's sort of most important. And I thought, Ms. Hansen, your comments about the um, subacute versus acute populations and the, the number of beds and the adequacy thereof was sort of helpful in sort of saying, all right, if we look at this and then focus on the fact that we've got some bottlenecks, which is another way of saying sometimes the system gets in its own way, uh, and also that the numbers are perhaps not as simple as they seem if you understand that this area looks overly impacted because this area is under-resourced. Uh, and I, I, just, I just wanted to sort of go back to that and make sure that that piece of the conversation, Madam Chair and colleagues, didn't get lost in the conversation. Because I think it's, um, it won't be quick and won't be easy, but it's sort of simple and straightforward, actually, in terms of um, sort of some, what do we need to do and how can we do it? So I'll just let go with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, President, I'll just jump in while you're you're doing get, keeping us all organized. So, um, I think the thing I'm sort of struck by is that I, I don't think that there's anything here that is new, except that um, the you know the Rand Corporation. Um, took us to kind of a swipe at, in a good way, of trying to help us figure out capacity. And so what I am concerned about, and I've, I've really been thinking about how to say this because I don't want to sound as um, disappointed or angry as I, I actually feel, because I, I feel like these are conversations that we've been having for years and years and years now, and some of you weren't even sitting in your seats when we started these conversations. So, so I, I say that because Based on even the conversation, there are a series of kind of outstanding issues that we've been talking about addressing for a long time that I, that I don't really understand how they get addressed based on the approach that we're taking. And I know, um, President Ellenberg, that um, there are lots of actions that you're trying to take to sort of structure these discussions, and Greta, I really appreciate your, your leadership in leaning in and trying to pull all this together. Um, so I just want to make some observations about uh, what I remain concerned about. One is that um, 
to me, it is implausible to suggest that we have capacity and capacity in a system that still denies accessibility for people. So what I'm having a difficult time understanding is if we know that a best practice for somebody who's got a drug or alcohol addiction is being able to get into a facility quickly, because we know that is an indicator of somebody having a higher level of success, is they're ready, we want them to be in it, then how, um, as we're designing our systems, are we holding ourselves accountable to a certain time frame relative to a person having access to a particular facility? So that's an example to me of, of accessibility overall that I, that I just wanna make sure as reports are coming out that that's a, a detailed, quantified, qualified piece of data that the board's getting, and frankly, so that we're all understanding what we're holding ourselves accountable to. Um, the second thing, and this has to do with operators, our, our partners, our nonprofit partners, having the capacity, desire, or skill set to be able to accept hard to serve people. I have heard this discussion since almost the first month I got here, and we've talked about restructuring contracts, we've talked about um, supporting staff, we've talked about supporting nonprofits that may have capacity where other nonprofits don't. I have not seen that materialize, and I think what that means is that either we are not having honest, intellectually honest conversations with our partners, or we, we, the county, need to play a leadership role in providing those services because the risk is too great or whatever the reason is. I, I, I for one, don't want to have, and it's part of the reason I pulled the contract issue a little later on the agenda because I wanted to have a conversation about how those contracts are actually being structured. So that's kind of point two, which is accepting that we've got some of the strongest nonprofits in the country, I have no doubt of that, but if there are issues that they can't address, us continuing to have a conversation about how we're gonna update contracts, will just, it, it's just not gonna go anywhere. Um, the other issue is that we have to be able to prioritize, and this isn't really on you all, this is really Greta and team at your level. If we need technical solutions to communications for all of our partners, I know we're continuing to invest in them, but knowing when a bed is available is really critical. And I think the point you raised, that if we are in fact having a bottleneck problem, which I'm not sure I entirely think that's the whole of the problem, that our ability to move somebody up or down has everything to do with organizations being able to communicate rapidly with each other over the condition of a particular client. And that's such an expensive mistake, and it's and it's probably us doing too much for, for one person and not enough for an other, another that I would like to very much understand how that communication program is going and what we're gonna be able to do to resolve that issue. Um, and then, you know, on, on substance abuse, well, I, I could go on, but I, I think what my bigger point is is that irrespective of how we're investing in the system, if we don't have an operational plan that's married to the resources we have, we're gonna to continue to waste them and continue to, to, um, to not be able to serve people properly. And I actually do have one other thing, colleagues. I fundamentally believe that we, are, we have an emerging need that we are not addressing, and that is that whenever we have a problem we can't address, we use the public safety system, we use a jail system. And I, I think we have to accept that we have an emerging trend of people who are using drugs that are very, very dangerous, really addictive, not necessarily something that we can, pharma, you know, we have the pharmacologicals, pharma, I always say that wrong, you know, the medications to be able to provide support, and that we're seeing more harm done to people's brains in a shorter period of time. And so the people that I see that live in my neighborhood that are hurting themselves and hurting each other, there is no appropriate placement for them. And so what I think the RAND study completely missed is this emerging problem. And I don't, I don't have an answer to it, but if you talk to our psychiatrists, they will tell you they're seeing that same kind of challenge. So. 
and we're going to talk about alternatives to incarceration, but, but all of this is so linked together that I, I just want to say out loud that not one thing that I saw in here is different than anything I've seen before. And, and that I'm concerned that we're dog paddling a little bit when we should be moving forward. Now, all that said, and I, I mean this very sincerely, what we are asking you to do is incredibly difficult. It is, it's hard, and you all have explained that to me in any number of ways. What I really want, and you don't need to answer it today, but I, I think at some point you should, which is to come back to the board and say, here are the things that are completely in my way that absent being able to move them, we're gonna keep being in this situation because you've managed to do some incredible things over the last five years, so I don't wanna ignore that. Expanding services, I appreciate that. But if there are areas where you really need help and we're not there to provide it for you, then I'm asking you to do something without supporting you, and that I don't wanna be doing. And so, Again, you don't need to answer that today, but I think as reports come back, there should be a very honest discussion with the board about under what terms and conditions we can move forward with something you're asking us for, and under what terms and conditions we can't, and why we can't, so we can have a more honest dialogue about that. Um, th that, to me, would be priceless. And, and I don't know if there's a better format than this one, but I, I think I think the road ahead is a tough one, and I think we're asking you to do Herculean things, and we should be helping you. And I would like to be one of the people who does that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. We are ready for a second round. I'll start with Supervisor Lee again. Thank you. I think we are all kind of seeing some very similar um, observation from our day-to-day -day work is that the substance use treatment the such work that we're doing so oftentimes really overlap with the behavioral health work that we're seeing. And sometimes it's basically through the use of these substances, behavioral health starts or got exacerbated being much worse. And how we can make sure that the services that we're providing, whether we talk about social detox or medical detox, and that these services really need to be occurring jointly. So for example, when we, when I get a chance to visit the Pathways, for example, that was about approximately a year ago now, right? One thing I noticed is that they were able to do substance use work, but on the psych side, the behavioral health side, they were lacking certain expertise or, or trained personnel to do that work. And I think it is so important to make sure that those services are being offered together, because if you just get somebody so-called off the medication for a short period of time about dealing with the mental health issue, you really are not addressing the entire entirety of the problem because of how interconnected those things are. So I just want to ask the, our administration, um, is there anything we can do for like Pathways or any other organizations that we're making sure that both of these services are going to be offered when these services are being provided for such? I'll just say one thing and then I'll turn it over to Sherry who I think can expand on that. And this is also in part um, in response to something that Supervisor Chavez observed. You know, I think there's maybe two categories of challenges we're facing. Some are ones that are more readily addressable, although hard to address, which are, I would describe as more bureaucratic. And some of your questions about how do we make sure that we seize when there's a bed available, that bed right away? How do we make sure the communication flows are seamless? How do we make sure that when someone's referred, someone acts on that referral immediately. And those are kind of administrative efforts that we have underway that you know are some of them pretty um, pretty difficult to address, but are, are more within, within our power to just improve our systems to get our arms around. Some of them are more substantively complex where we have somebody who, as you, you just mentioned, Supervisor Lee may have a need for not only psychiatric care, but also substance use treatment, and it may be mild psychiatric care, really significant substance use, maybe the inverse. They may also have unmanaged diabetes. And trying to figure out what type of facility with what type of staffing can meet that client's need is a challenge we face and is one that I think every single community in the U.S. and in California is really struggling with, as we see for some of the reasons Supervisor Chavez mentioned, you know, people using much more powerful drugs like fentanyl, 
much more profoundly um, impactful in terms of people's behavior like stimulants. And we have a lot of improvements and expansions of care um, and are trying to kind of tackle both the administrative and the clinically substantive um, obstacles. But getting the right mix of services when we have a lot of unique clients presenting with really unique needs is just a real challenge. And so, you know, client A, whose substance use disorder is more profound, may need one type of program. Client B, who has um, a more profound psychiatric need, but unmanaged diabetes and, my, and, and a long history of stimulant abuse might be best served by a different program. And figuring out what is the optimal set of programs, given how unique and complicated the overall mix of clients we serve, is just I think exactly as, as you've both stated, a profound, profound challenge and one that um, has been vexing even to a system like ours that has wonderful community-based organizations doing their best, a wonderful set of leaders, a lot of resources relative to other communities and geographic diversity and trying to make sure that we have services that meet needs of patients where they live and can be in proximity to their family because we know that also supports recovery. So um, I think it really is a mix of um, bureaucratic opportunities for improvement and those we're jumping right on and trying to be laser focused on because they're the ones that we can tackle most readily um, while at the same time also trying to figure out what is that overall array of services that may not meet the needs of every unique and complicated client, but is better optimized to what we are seeing boots on the ground. And, and I will just say kind of as an overall comment, reflective of a lot of the public comments we heard from very knowledgeable folks with lots of different experiences with our system, I think there were a lot of things in the RAND report that were very intuitive, things that we've long described and known, and then some of them that didn't resonate with our more boots on the ground experience and where they, they don't resonate, we're gonna continue to move full speed ahead to meet what we know um, are experiential gaps that we see every day, even if um, kind of the numbers and modes of analysis that Rand has, has used in other communities in here didn't quite yield what we think is a pretty straightforward experience that we continue to have with lack of access. Thank you, Greta. Um, the follow-up question on that is regarding these numbers. So we talked about how, based on the study, that the acute care side is actually uh, not as short as we thought due to the fact that if we could get those folks in acute care to subacute care, then opening up those spaces will be able to accommodate uh, the, the current need. Um, and I think we all know that the subacute bed is where the shortage is. We are now opening up the 28 adult residential treatment beds of 650 South Bascom. We've been working on that for a long time and very excited to see that. I guess my question is, that actually sits around on the community residential side and not really the subacute side. So I guess my question is, are there folks sitting at subacute that we could potentially move to the community residential beds to open up more spaces there as well? Um, <clears throat> per my last discussion about the system of care, they're all dependent on each other, meaning that if you think about acute, subacute, and residential, there's a handful of patients today that are in the subacute facilities that are ready to step down clinically, but they don't have a bed to step down to. So once they, there's a free residential bed, it frees up a subacute bed, and then an administrative patient waiting for a subacute bed could fill that. That's sort of the domino effect on how the system of care works. They're all important. Right, so based on that, those 28 beds that assuming they will be open in a month of in 650 South Bascom, that we're all waiting for the ribbon cutting, right? Uh, as soon as that's open, you would believe that those beds will be filled due to the fact that folks oh, will yes. be moving from the subacute side, for example, and then when subacute opens up, then the acute side will move right into it. Yes. Correct. So theoretically, 28 patients that are in a subacute that are ready to step down would immediately fill those 28 beds. And then likewise, the patients that are sitting in a subacute or an acute care facility that are waiting for an MHRC would be able to fill up those beds. Great, thank you so much. Yes. And then the last thing I want to mention is the very glaring shortage that this county apparently does not have is the children's crisis residential capacity. And that's something that 
we are able to use outside county services to do that, but do we have any type of plans to work on that, or is this something that our adolescent um, uh, facility that we're building in be able to handle some of those as well? Yeah, Supervisor, um, as we indicated, we are um, looking at opportunities to work uh, collaboratively with adjacent counties um, to explore opportunities to expand, expand crisis residential services for children. Um, the building of the new child and adolescent facility will certainly assist with the acute level uh, bed capacity. Um, however, we do recognize that there still is a need for um, building the uh, children's crisis residential capacity. And in that sense, right now there's no initiative to try to find locations within the county. I know you'd mentioned something outside the county, but within the county, has there been any initiative in terms of trying to look for places for our children's um, crisis residential capacity? Yeah, we are um, beginning those conversations and we'll be exploring opportunities for in-county uh, children's crisis residential. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas, do you want a second round? Sure. <laughs> I'll take a second round any day. It's all yours. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate um, your comments, uh, Supervisor um, Chavez. I think that, that it's really important for us to recognize what those barriers are. Um, otherwise, um, we're, we're never really get we're never really going to get to a solution, um, regardless of whether we identify identify them. Um, so we, as policymakers, need to understand what those barriers are. And I know that subacute um, beds were a concern. Do those rise to that level where you you need? Obviously, there it's expressed in these reports. But I'd love to hear from you. What is that support that you need for the subacute bed level? Or how can we remove those barriers? Uh, uh, thank you for that question, Supervisor. I, I think at this stage, we have several options that we're exploring, and we have sort of identified resources sufficient f for those options. At, at some point, we will in order to really sort of meet the full need, we will need to have that discussion with the county exec office and the board about making additional resources available for um, either contracting, supporting uh, providers in the developing of their own facilities, uh, or using our own co county properties. And I would just add, you know, one of the state level reforms that may yield additional resources to help us make investments here is the pending potential MHSA reform on which we're still awaiting further details from the state. But there are a number of other potential streams of funding that we may use to significantly augment what would otherwise be county investments in care expansion based on some of those things that are happening at the state level that we'll be reporting out on as, as they develop. Thank you. I, I know that I asked this question um, in, in terms of how we can have a similar report to the RAND study, but really limited to patients that are inside our county programs. Um, but I'll ask it again, because I think it's important for us to figure out what, uh, and it, I, I, it was just reflecting on um, uh, the system of care that I once was a part of, um, over at First Five, and Sherry, you were there as well, and that system of care could tell you, or, or it got to a point where it was developed enough that somebody could call and say, you know, this, these are the issues that we have. A provider could, I, I've done an assessment on this kiddo. This kiddo need, needs home visitation, needs mental health services or counseling. And um, that system of care could tell them so there's two spots over in Community Solutions or EMQ or this and that, right? We, we haven't gotten to that point just yet in this system. And I wonder if there is any pathway um, to, to getting there. I know that there's some bottleneck issues. And I know that there's always um, uh, a movement in terms of clients, whether they're going to step up or step down in, in the level of care that they need. And so I know it's difficult to answer, but I wonder if we can get closer um, 
to answering that question and to having that system of care be that responsive so that in the moment when somebody calls, or a provider typically would call or a person self-referring, that we would be able to actually guide them in the same way. And that we don't need a RAND study to tell us. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I think that's, um, you know, a really important point that you're making, which is, um, you know, our systems in place essentially to be able to track and to know exactly what um, a client needs and what might be available um, in order to meet those needs. And that is something we're continuing to work on. Um, as you've stated in the children's system, we had a, had a really uh, good process for being able to recognize um, and create opportunities to, to know and track uh, capacity, for lack of a better word, um, uh, with respect to need. And I think uh, with respect to these different levels of care um, and the needs of the beneficiaries that we're um, looking to respond to, that's something that we'll continue to work on. I think one of the complexities with respect to um, these levels of care, for example, acute, subacute, and residential is that the process in which a client moves is not necessarily linear, meaning that they're going from acute to subacute to residential. Sometimes they mm -hmm. bump back up to acute and then back down to subacute and then to residential. And so that sometimes uh, makes it a bit um, tricky to track um, in real time, but we are certainly uh, working on that. And, and what would those next steps look like, Sherry, in terms of getting closer to, to that stage because, um, you know, when I met with some of the behavioral health providers, um, I think that what they said was, you know, we have these beds open and I think people know about, about, about this uh, capacity. And so I think it's, it's, it's the system communicating with each other. How do we get closer to that? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we, um, within the department, did uh, develop a bed tracking database, um, and that was um, initially the first stage to really be able to look at the availability of capacity within each level of care by entity, by location. Um, we're able to geomap the capacity available um, at any given time. Um, I think to my prior comment, just some of the complexity is just the movement of individual patients between those levels of care, not necessarily trending in one direction, but rather you know, up and down, just given their needs. Um, I think um, some of the next steps would really be um, kind of taking that to the next level, which would be enhancing that with um, some of the utilization management work that the department will be working on um, in the next um, several months which is really to be able to um, track more closely utilization, uh, bed days, administrative days, as both Curtis and Paul have referred to, and really have a better sense of um, just how much capacity is being utilized and at the same time uh, where we're seeing the needs and gaps. So that would really, I think, be the next phase of looking at how to enhance um, that, that database tracker that we've developed. And I'll turn it over to, to Greta. I was going to also say, you know, one of the things that were just a connected dot to what you were asking about and then some of our earlier comments, also where we have providers who are providing multiple levels of care, removing barriers for them to move a client up or down within the spectrum of care because they may know immediately, I have a bed available, I have a client who's ready to transition, and there can be really good continuity of care. So we're also looking in addition to just making sure our systems communicate um, well with our providers where we're trying to take a, a client who's not currently being served by a particular provider and place them with that provider. That's one area of work. Another is making sure our providers have a little bit more ability to move clients that they may already be serving to different levels of care because that's a very fast and seamless transition for the client um, that we need to then figure out how to manage within our overall system. But, um, but that, that's some of the um, removing barriers work that we're working on as well. Great, right. thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk just, oh gosh, 1.45. Okay, so I'm wondering about the, the folks in the interim housing and shelter, shelter beds that are not set aside for um, behavioral health um, clients. 
um, how, do, how, how are we supporting them? Are we providing with any opportunity for behavioral health assessments or support services to those folks? Because those, there's a, a huge number of, of them um, that are not, as, not set aside for BHSD. Um, and what is, if, if we don't have that, what, how can we um, set up a, a partnership or a communication or an, an, an opportunity to have a level of assessment? Because I'm, um, I'm thinking that when folks are a little more stable, they um, have an opportunity, they may find an opportunity to make changes in their lives, uh, such as um, substance abuse and, and care for their, for their well-being. Yeah, thank you for that uh, question, Supervisor. I, I think there are several um, pieces um, to this uh, response. I think first is um, a significant and very effective component of our medical and behavioral health services th is through the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program, sort of under Paul. In addition to their sort of brick and mortar clinics, you know, th they do have mobile units that go to di different shelter sites. Then um, f some of our um, sort of true interim housing programs and some of our temporary shelter programs that are tied to behavioral health services like our recovery residences that are for individuals who are enrolled in substance use outpatient treatment. Um, those have sort of built in ser service models. And, and then um, very importantly um, and something that we need to get to work on is how to then try to uh, make the, the suite of services more available to sort of all the t temporary shelter facilities, you know, um, and, and that is something that we have to work on and um, and, and figure out how to fund uh, as well. So. Mm. I'd love to see, uh, have a, a bit of more of a follow up on that in, in our next report, because I think that's important. Those are folks who are finding um, kind of their, receiving a little more stability in their lives in terms of where they can rest their head and that provides for an opportunity for, for some change, right? Um, so I'd love to know a little bit more about that. And I know my, my turn is basically over, but I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian, do you care for a second round? Just a um, question, and forgive me if while I was coming and going, I missed the, but I don't think I did. The, Issues that Supervisor Chavez raised earlier caused me to um, reflect on the fact that the, making these connections was in part what I hoped our Navigator program would provide when I proposed it some time ago. We, we I think what a lot of the conversation about today, and looking back at Ms. Hansen, um, it, you know, when, you, when we're talking about the complexities of the system, which are to some extent necessarily complex because of the complexities of the challenges and the diversity of individual needs, that was one of my hopes was that the Navigator program would be able to say, oh, this person needs to be connected here, but they also need to be connected there. Uh, and would serve as a resource either for the individual involved or for a family member or a provider. Is that happening at all? Does it have the potential to happen? Is that just not how the program is working in practice with thoughts? Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure, thank you for that question, Supervisor Smidian. Um, yes, um, the, the Behavioral Health Navigator program is effective in helping in several ways. One, um, at the very front door with respect to access, so individuals that are calling in that need you know, support or questions answered, the navigators have been very effective there. Um, they've also been supportive in our self-help centers, so um, for individuals that are coming in to our self-help centers who need navigation to additional resources or support, certainly uh, the navigators are, are helpful there. Um, I think what you're raising, though, is a really good point in terms of how could um, that particular um, support service be expanded um, to, um, you know, additionally support some of the complexity that we're discussing today. Do you need a higher level of care? How can you access that? So I think that's something we could take under advisement and, and come back around on. But I appreciate your, your question. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, let me just ha stay with this a, a moment. And I see uh, Ms. Hansen leaning in again. And I'm going to turn to Supervisor Chavez and recall with her 
the month after month after month that we spent together working on the challenge of uh, the pick up the phone rate at the CAN Center all those years ago. And, and I say that by way of um, a compliment to my colleague, but also an exhortation to the staff, which is, um, you know, I heard what she said, and I don't think she's going to give it up in the next year and a half. So if, I think, um, I, 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 and I'm glad to hear it, uh, because I think um, having a system that looks good on the org chart, but that is nonetheless impossible to navigate, to go back to that word, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't serve anyone well, obviously. And I, I'm hopeful, I don't, I don't pretend to have enough inside expertise, but, but I am hopeful, as I was when I was pursuing the Navigator program originally, that properly structured and adequately resourced, I get that, um, it could serve that function, that it, it could be the way that we don't have people <sighs> presenting themselves in need only to discover that they're in the wrong place or uh, not getting to Ms. Hansen's comments, the, um, the right set of wraparound services, which can be the demanding thing to assess and then provide. So thank you, Madam Chair and um, Supervisor Chavez. I, I don't know if the Navigator program can be part of the solution you're seeking, but I, I think it's a, I think it's worth looking at because at least it's not a starting from scratch approach to addressing these issues that, as you suggest, have been with us for far too long. And Madam Chair, I am looking over at Ms. Hansen if she wants to lean in or respond through the chair. Sure, I think, um, you know, just to connect um, something that you're raising that was, um, I think, implicit, but I can make more explicit about some of the comments I made earlier about looking also at kind of bureaucratic processes. I think we have sort of two strategies. One is making the system less difficult to navigate because we're thinking about how to, how to reform and align it with the realities of the clients that we're serving and what would create a path that they can navigate on their own. And so I'll give a concrete example. Um, we will be coming back in a subsequent report to talk about um, ways that we're looking at Mission Street Recovery Station as a place that we think could be a really key portal for people arriving and then being um, very directly supported in receiving substance use treatment services from that moment of contact with our system and really making sure that everything about what we're doing there and in other places is aligned with how do we make sure that this is a great portal of entry into recovery and care for folks who may end up um, at a touch point like that. And then also recognizing that there are gonna be clients with super complex needs for whom um, someone with expertise on how can we piece together components of different programs and services to meet what might be a really difficult medical, mental health and substance use treatment need that might need a combination of services that would then actually work for the client in front of us. So um, I think that that is a lot of what is really kind of philosophically underlying a lot of the specific activities we're undertaking is how do we make the system less complex, more seamless for clients and, and remove um, what might be also just artifacts of, of new opportunities we have that we maybe didn't have before as we're seeing state reforms that um, are hopefully aimed at removing some of what are historic administrative complexities around which we've built our systems of care and really taking advantage of some of those changes as they, as they present. Thank you, Madam Chair, that's all I had. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, did you have anything on this item? All right, um, I don't believe we need a vote on this or do we just to receive the report? We do not need a vote. We do not. Then uh, we're going to move to the next item. And Supervisor Chavez? Thank you. If we could hear item 36, only because we have all the same folks here, uh, that might be, if that's okay with my colleagues. Absolutely. Do you want a presentation or do you want to just, no. or do you want to ask your questions? Yeah, I'll just um, ask two very basic um, questions. One is that this looks like an extension just for a year. And what I'm wondering is why. Um, why we're doing it for a year, and if that means that there is a 
RFP or an RFQ that's in process. So item 36 is an annual request for delegation of authority that um, is essentially the same as what has been asked for year by year that allows the Behavioral Health Department to execute the next fiscal year's contracts, most of which are just continuing existing um, programs funded by the um, pot of funding primarily serving the Medi-Cal population. So this is a renewal of the annual delegation of authority. That so you see. thank you, that's really helpful. I, I think um, just based on the conversation we're having right now, it's hard for me to understand what changes, and there's nothing in the ledge file that says what changes, if any, are happening relative to these, these contracts. And so um, I will move approval, um, but with a request that as these, uh, as we're, um, working to improve our systems and our services to better understand how the contracts reflect the changes that we're making or not, you know, in our in our processes. That's a huge amount of money to extend for a year. And I, you know, without really knowing whether or not there's any substantial improvements, including, for example, whether or not folks from our community are getting more access. I know these are discussions that we're having with the providers, but that also isn't reflected in the staff report or in the contracts. I'm happy to second that, but I, I um, jumped a little too quickly, and we need to have a Levine Act announcement oh. on this item, so Thank we'll you. do that. Um, take public comment, any other than any other comments from colleagues, and then we'll vote. Thank you. Item number 36 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian, Thank would you, you like to make a comment? Ma Madam Chair, since we have been advised that this item on our agenda may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language of our published agenda and have also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member uh, as described on page three of our agenda. I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings as defined by the Levine Act has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of the county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And finally, Madam President, while it is, of course, a matter of public record, I would like to note that since January 1, 2023, when Senate Bill 1439 took effect and amended the Levine Act, I have, in fact, received various campaign contributions, which have, of course, either been or will be reported in full as required by law. All such reports are, as I noted, public, and I would ask that if anyone has any reason to believe that any of those contributions were unlawfully made, that they advise me of that immediately so that I may correct the situation and ensure that contributions that are not permitted are not subsequently given or received. Finally, let me just exhort any and all potential contributors, please make no contribution which violates Senate Bill 1439, the Levine Act, or any other provisions of law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Chavez, your light's on. Do you have something to add no, before? Just okay. was ready to vote. All right. Uh, do we have public speakers on item 36? We do not, both in chambers or on Zoom. Thank you very much. We have a motion by Chavez, second by Ellenberg. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes 5 0. Thank you. We will move on to item 15. Uh, which is the Assisted Outpatient Treatment Program Report. And thank you to all of the, the staff members for your, your input.
Welcome, please begin. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Riera. I'm the Deputy Director for Behavioral Health overseeing the service delivery. And now I'm gonna ask my colleagues to introduce themselves and um, present an update on the report relating to assisted outpatient treatment services. Good afternoon, supervisors. I'm Margaret Obolo, Director for Adult and Older Adult System of Care. Good afternoon, my name is Sue Jung. I'm a division director overseeing our cross systems initiatives and overseeing AOT program. We don't have a formal presentation on this item, but we're happy to answer any questions or provide any clarification to you on this report. Why don't we go to public comment uh, first and then to the board for, for discussion on this item. I would jump to that pretty quickly, so if there's anybody in the chambers who wants to, to speak, we will certainly give you a minute to fill out a yellow card. I have one speaker online. One speaker on Zoom. Going once, going twice for chambers. When the speaker begins um, speaking on Zoom, Looks like we have, we have somebody in the chamber, so we'll, we'll wait, but I will still let folks know on Zoom, if you're intending to speak on this item, the AOT annual report, this is the time to raise your virtual hand. When the first speaker on Zoom begins, we will close the queue. Uh, but as is our practice, we'll begin with speakers in the chamber. You can come on down, we see your card coming in. but just a moment. Yeah, I'm sorry, and this kind of impromptu, but um, you know, I'm just, I'm just concerned because um, I was in Sacramento uh, a couple weeks ago with Senator Cortezi and uh, a lot of school children from schools from Santa Clara County and and um, one of them was from San Jose Unified with his mom and um, and this uh, senator has experience with Eastside Unified we have a lot of wellness centers um, there but I don't, I, but the 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 young man was concerned because a lot of uh, fentanyl is in the bathrooms on, you know, very available for our children. And recently we had, through our police um, association, um, a uh, misconduct and uh, I think an arrest of our director for distributing fentanyl. Um, so, You know, there, there's just some corruption that I, I see going on, uh, perhaps even at the state level with Cal Mesa, and um, you know, just a, a, a long-term relationship with Rand and their studies, um, and um, you know, so one of my colleagues is in Washington D.C. right now with Mental Health America. And um, you know we have other studies, and um, uh, it just just for everyone's information, NAMI has long been continuing to miseducate our faith leaders and the public uh, with their. Thank you. Sure. And now we're moving to Zoom. Is that correct? Yes, I have two hands up. Two hands up. So again, uh, final note, we're going to close the Zoom queue as soon as the first person begins speaking. So if you are intending to speak, now is the time to raise your hand. Our first, first speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. We will open your microphone and the timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. 
uh, thank you, Paul Sloan from the Horseshoe. I'd like to extend my gratitude to Sherry for her time and advocacy. She's been there for about at least four hours that I know of. And so just as another citizen that does advocacy, I want to extend my gratitude to you for as another citizen to another. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez. You, yeah, you, you would have. You would have saved a whole lot of money if, if, if the county can get to a point where they see the, the power and the, the legitimacy in the advocacy that both Lorraine Zeller and myself present, you can't get no better. Because number one, I personally have access to every single one of these systems, every single one. Another thing is that I have also experienced the deficiencies and the consequences of those deficiencies in all of these systems. And then I study what I experienced from a sociological, political, uh, psychological, philosophical, and uh, scientific perspective. So you're getting information from somebody that has not only experienced it, but stood outside of it and examined it from the outside in, from each one of those disciplines, and then formulated a, a, a perspective and a position on that and then I come to these meetings and I give it to you. That's what I do as a citizen, because I can do it, number one. Number two is that I really honestly care about people that are, that, that, that are like me, that, that, that have gotten shaft over the past 30 years, because these deficits were created because this county was just insistent. Lock these people up, put them in prison, put them anywhere, but we don't care about them. We do not care about them. We don't care what happens to them. And now, Cal. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Catherine, you were unmuted and then muted again. Try opening your microphone one more time. Catherine, you have permissions to unmute. You'll just have to click one more time. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my computer. There you go. Um, we can hear you. Yeah, I, I can't. I, anyway, um, I want to add to what the pre previous speakers have said. Um, we need to listen to people who have been through the system, who have lived experience. Um, I mean, you wouldn't go to a restaurant based and review by someone who had never been to that restaurant, but just looked at the menu and, you know, did a survey of, you know, cooking techniques in different restaurants of that type. You would want to look at reviews by people who had actually visited that restaurant and sampled a lot of dishes. And we need to pay more attention to people's lived experience. Um, these you know, I don't think that forced treatment is effective. That's borne out by what people in the system say. That's borne out by what a lot of research says. But because one consultant says it's better, that's what we're doing, even though it's expensive and coercive. Um, we need to stop this. Thank you very much. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Looking to my colleagues, does Supervisor Lee? Sure, thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> um, President Ellenberg, so first of all, I want to thank staff for this uh, report um, and that we have some real data for the past year to see a brand new program that's been implemented with this AOT. Um, looking at the, the report, it really looks like that the program is A, um, coming along, uh, the capacity is growing as we have planned, uh, and the overall effectiveness uh, is very positive. So I just want to get your opinion too in terms of the effectiveness and uh, what do you see the future of this program? How big would this be growing, say, a year from now? Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I think we look at the effectiveness of the program by um, really looking at how engaged 
our clients are uh, because the nature of the people we're working with are people who have consistently um, not engaged in, in services. And so, um, as you could tell from the report, um, we, our outreach um, team, outreach and engagement team have been working very assertively for, um, you know, engaging with uh, clients uh, who are referred, but also not just a short term, but really extensive engagement. Mm -hmm. Once they do engage, we also work with our providers to do a warm handoff. Oftentimes, we'll do joint engagement. Uh, so that's been very successful in that most of the clients have been um, voluntarily in the program. We've only had to do two petitions um, so far. Um, so I really think that that's been a great success. Um, another is really part of the goal is to reduce the uh, utilization of our emergency services. Um, while the, the data is still I think premature because you know it's small. We're just beginning the program, but I think it still does show that there's a trend towards a huge reduction in our emergency services and also incarceration once they've been enrolled in the program and engaging. So I see that that's a positive um, way to measure success. And I think moving forward, our goal is not to keep them uh, long term. Our goal is really the way we see it is we may um, have them maybe about two years to continue to stabilize them, but our goal is to step them down to other level of intensive outpatient program like um, FSP or ACT programs. And so we, while we do have a need to expand um, in a way, we don't see that it will continue to expand because we want to step them down. Right. And then second question is regarding in, uh, those who are just as involved. Uh, a few of the individuals got into the AOT program directly from uh, some type of arrest, right? Uh, can you explain how many people we're talking about or what percentages we're talking about that came through uh, straight from the jail setting and in straight into AOT? So the referrals are through the court or um, judge. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically, rather than having them go through the um, justice track of mandating services, they will refer these individuals who meet the AOT criteria to our program. And once they do that, then our um, staff will go out even to the jail to meet with them, try to engage and outreach to them while they're incarcerated. And then once they're ready to be um, released, then we will meet them upon release to either place them in some type of housing or right. programs from right. there. And, and that's what's so exciting. Uh, how do you follow up with them after they leave the AOT program at this point? Do you track with them four weeks later or 12 weeks later just to check on them and see how they are doing? Right, and so I think uh, out of uh, the clients, we uh, discharged about 15 of them. Uh, most of them have either stepped down to other lower level services or similar level of services. There are about six individuals who moved out of the county. In that case, our, our staff actually researched the similar type of services in that county. They will actually connect with them, and they will continue to keep these clients open in our program until we know that they are connected. Um, and really, there is only one individual who has AWOD, uh, meaning that person uh, we weren't able to locate, but that's a very really just one number, considering that we're talking about um, 65 clients total and 15 um, being discharged. Okay. Um, is there a feedback loop for the county contracted uh, providers to provide some feedback and then put back to the BHSD for the uh, process improvement on this one? Yes, so we continue to also meet with our advisory committee uh, for AOT. So in the beginning, we were meeting with them on a monthly basis to really uh, hear from um, them about how to implement the program, the policy and procedures, you know, all these um, issues. Now that we have uh, implemented the program, we're progressing. We continue to meet with them to really discuss the um, program improvement. And also, um, because they represent our peers and people from the community, we hear from them any feedback they also receive to bring back to us so that we can continue to dialogue and incorporate that um, information into program improvement. Okay. 
Um, one thing I looking at the report find interesting is that out of the 65, out of the 65 individuals that has been um, treated, uh, just so happen it's basically almost half and half male and female. Do you know why the number is so even? We, we didn't plan on that, but <laughs> we're happy that it was evenly distributed. Very good. Uh, again, I, and, and last question is really about the future of this program. Uh, how many more slots do you think you need on an annual basis moving forward? Currently, we have a capacity to serve 100, and we have about um, 65 enrolled at this time. Um, the referrals have slowed a little bit, and we're hoping that that's a good thing in that we're able to provide and link them to other services. Um, and, but we also understand that there is continual need. Uh, we are not quite sure at this time as to how m many slots we need to expand beyond 100. Um, but once that time does come near, we'll make sure to bring it back to the board. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Samidi, and then Chavez. Thank you. Uh, uh, back in 2021, uh, about two years ago, we were having a conversation about AOT, sometimes referred to as uh, Laura's Law, at the Health and Hospital Committee. And initially, uh, county staff uh, expressed their concerns and recommended that we exercise the option to opt out of the program. Um, both Supervisor Lee and I were of the view that it might be time to consider participating in the program and we had what I thought was a very helpful uh, set of hearings where we heard from folks in both uh, Alameda County and San Mateo County about how they had implemented the program in their uh, counties. We then um, recommended, uh, Supervisor Lee and I both uh, recommended that our board opt in, uh, and ultimately that was the decision of our board. Uh, along the way, staff indicated, county staff indicated that uh, that would require some additional funding, which funding was made available. Um, and so I guess my, my question is, just as a sort of a takeaway, um, you obviously had misgivings when we were first considering the matter. Have the concerns that you have, have the concerns that you had um, been manageable and or addressed and or um, resolvable with the additional funding, or are there still concerns lingering from that two year ago anxiety about what participation might produce. Just, I, I wanna know if we can kind of put that part behind us is really where I am. Or if it's still out there. Dr. Smith is gonna lean in, yes, no, maybe. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I personally still believe that the program um, has great risk and it's really not needed. And I think that's illustrated by the fact that with 65 enrollees, we've only gone to court twice, which was already an option which we had without Laura's Law. <clears throat> so, um, from my perspective, it's a law that gives a false sense that if we implement it, we're going to solve problems that we haven't been able to solve in the past. By using high touch, very aggressive treatment, we could get the same effect uh, without implementing Laura's law. Got it. And but I'm going to be gone in a month, so. <laughs> I, um, no, I, I uh, f some colleagues will remember, I, I referenced the fact at the time that I'd actually been in the California State Legislature in 2002 and voted on Laura's Law, and I remember how contentious it was 
I was a first term legislator at the time and um, I had concerns at the time that I carried with me for a very long time, particularly around due process. Uh, and in fact, it was some of those concerns that made it such a challenging issue way back when in 2002. And that's why initially it was an opt-in. That was the way to sort of manage the controversy uh, back in the day was to say that counties would not be required or obliged to participate, they would opt in. And then of course that changed when f former assembly member, now Senator Eggman's uh, bill passed, maybe 1976 if I'm remembering correctly. And uh, you know the model got flipped on its head, which was to say you, everybody's in unless you formally opt out. And if you're gonna opt out, you're gonna have to explain why and do that in an open and public meeting. And by then, uh, you know, almost 20 years later, I was convinced that uh, the program could be implemented in a thoughtful, smart, and compassionate way. And I, you know, my sense is from the data you've provided that you, you feel like we've been able to do that here in the county, uh, understanding there was an additional cost. Um, and that, uh, that heartens me, frankly. Uh, the, we did have the challenge when we, colleagues, when we were talking with folks in the community, and I can't speak for every board member, but I'm guessing the experiences were fairly similar because we, they were, certainly were at the committee and at the board level. You know, I think there were a lot of folks who saw this as a cure-all and it was important to keep saying, look, it's gonna be a relatively modest number of folks. And that has also proved to be the case. It's, it's striking to me the numbers are actually pretty much within the range that we we're tossing around then, not really knowing, but having the experience of other counties to look to. Um, the question I would ask is, uh, the report takes note of the fact that our involuntary court-ordered placements are actually at an appreciably lower level. I think it was 3%, if I remember correctly, rather than roughly 20%, which is the norm around the state. Is that, is that noteworthy or do we not have enough data and not have enough experience and not have enough cases and we shouldn't draw too big a conclusion from that? Because the, you know, the first reaction is, you know, we, we wondered about what some people call the black robe effect, would simply being part of this process actually engage folks in a way that led to voluntary compliance. Do you, do you have a thought about whether or not what we what we now know after looking at a year's worth of data is a good strong indication or encouraging but too soon to tell or not nah, it's just you know don't don't draw too big a conclusion from that supervisors or something else I would basically say it's um, it's soon to tell right I, I know the program just started about a year ago but um, we are making progress, and it is noldy because of the work we're doing with um, engagement, outreach and engaging the folks and really working with our partners that we're able to, you know, have more individuals who are voluntarily um, accepting services. So I think it's noteworthy in the work we're doing here. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it as encouraging and uh, I'll probably ask the same question next year, just uh, uh, to give you a heads up. I, I was struck by the fact, and think there's a connection here, by the fact that, you know, I think it was 40 to 50% of the referrals came from families. Uh, and we certainly heard from a lot of family members who felt like they needed a, a path to get help. Um, and uh, maybe 20, 25%, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly, felt that uh, of the referrals came from providers. Um, and a, to me, a hearteningly small number came from law enforcement, which given the fact that my concerns for a very long time were, were around due process issues and a concern that we not go back to what I would call the bad old days, um, was encouraging. So. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your interaction with families and how families view this process? Because uh, I think that that's instructive. I, as I say, I'm, I'm heartened that it did not turn out to be essentially 
you know, the tool for folks to be um, targeted by law enforcement, which was one of the concerns people had. Yeah, so at the initial stage of the implementation of the program, we worked really hard with um, organizations like NAMI to outreach to the family members and community members. So when we provided a lot of the training and information on AOT, we made sure that we do that at various different communities so that they are aware of the program. And then once we did that, uh, we also made sure that information is distributed so that they can access the referral forms and the information on AOT so that they can refer clients or their family members. Um, also, too, once they do refer, our staff really work with them continuously, not just the individual refer, but family members as well provided we have the release of the information and able to work with them so that we can also continue to support the family members because we also know that they are trying to support their loved ones. Um, they often don't know how to navigate the system. So we will work with them along with the individual in the program so that we're working not just that individual but with the whole community, really. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I think uh, our... Um, interaction and our um, the response that we've received from them has been generally positive um, of course there has been frustrations you know with when you know um, their loved ones go up and down um, but I think generally our staff are very responsive and quickly respond whenever they do also text or call the providers or even myself and our staff uh, with concerns, um, then we respond as well to continue to support them through this process. Well, thank you. I don't mean this in a cliched way or a warm and fuzzy way, but I really do think family engagement is gonna be key in terms of addressing the challenges of creating a truly responsive, client-specific, patient-specific wraparound bundle of services that um, Ms. Hansen and Supervisor Chavez were speaking to earlier. I, I, I think, um, I guess that's my way of saying, I don't think uh, family engagement is a nice to have, I think it's a have to have as part of the, the program. And so I was pleased to see those numbers were relatively high. Um, the additional increment in the budget for the coming fiscal year, I believe is 3.4 million. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, um, so it is to support the housing as well as the services for the expansion of the program. And forgive me because you answered the question already for um, Supervisor Lee, but I want to uh, sort of reintegrate the numbers. And the expansion is from how many patients to how many patients? The initial start was 50, and we increased another 50 to 100 now. Okay, so the 3.4 is what allows us to to, to get at and support and maintain at 100. Correct. Okay. And we're already past 50, yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the work in the program. I, uh, this is a receive report. I'm happy to move approval to receive the report. Uh, and if there's a second, the only question I would second. ask, colleague, thank you, is um, would we like another annual report? Is that on the on the books anyway? or? I, I'm happy to incorporate that in the motion with the consent of the seconder that we see you at the full board uh, in, in another year, because I do think we're going to want to keep a careful eye on this and see how it develops. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the, the really robust report. This was, it was helpful to have, um, to be able to see the experience that you're having. Um, my first question is, if somebody, if, if, um, if the Participants aren't accepted into the AOT program. How do we track what happens to them, the, the folks who aren't included? Where, where, are, where would they be? So I think we um, laid out the information on people who meet the criteria and people who don't meet the criteria. So for people who don't meet the criteria, yes. we link them to services. And for people who are in AOT program but continue to refuse services, is that what you're asking Well, for? no, what I'm actually asking mm -hmm. is that um, this really goes back to the bigger question that, that 
you asked, um, Supervisor Samidian, and that is this, that initially when we were discussing whether or not to adopt and to opt into AOT prior to um, Supervisor Lee coming on board, we had conversations at a board level that we don't, we don't need AOT and we don't need AOT because we're already providing an array of services that are helping people move through a process to wellness. And what I'm asking, what I'm asking is, if that's the case, um, are we also tracking the folks that don't come into the program because they are getting a significant amount of support and help so that we would be able to compare the AOT folks with the non-AOT folks? So we are tracking those individuals who are in the assertive community treatment programs, FSPs, the forensic programs, as well as the, the FSP programs. And those individuals, if they are unable to serve them and require a different level of service or they're not engaging, we refer those individuals to AOT. So we are able to you know, move individuals around based on their level of need. That I, answers your question. I think one question. way to answer the question that Supervisor Samidian asked is that we should actually be able to track them in, if they are, if they're referred and they don't meet the criteria, that we're providing enough support to them that we can actually track them irrespective of which group they're in. And, and the reason that's significant and the reason I think it's so important is that there's a contention um, that the, the program is not needed. But I, I think what has actually been demonstrated here is that there's a significant need for us to be able to structure a program that is, a, is highly accountable um, to you, to our partners, and to us, to each other, and that it would make sense to me that everybody who gets referred gets tracked because that's how you would know that in fact we are giving them the right dosage. They're in the right program, they're in their right place. And so I, I would just say to my colleagues who made the motion in the second that really we wanna see both sides of the aisle because that would actually answer the question as to whether or not AOT is significantly more effective. And if, and I think you raise a great point, that if in fact um, somebody's struggling that is not referred and then is acute enough to be referred, that, that that answers a different question, which is their acuity relative to, to dosage on the, in the non AOT program. So I, I personally think that's a very valuable thing to understand because it ultimately helps us long-term understand dosage because that, that's really the question from a resource perspective that we're, and I know you all think about this all the time, is, is the dosage that we're offering appropriate? And um, the other thing I would just point out is that the point that, that Joe raised that I just really, really want to focus on is that AOT, the, the, the thing that is most important to me about this is that, that there is a higher level, or it appears to me as an outsider, that there is a higher level of engagement with family in, in AOT than non-AOT. And I personally believe that when we were having the discussion about AOT, that the reason our the reason you all were saying we don't want it and our nonprofits were telling us we don't want, I don't mean you personally, but I mean administration, maybe that was just Jeff, Dr. Smith. But anyway, the reason we didn't want to pursue it was that we, we had the programs in place that met the needs of the people we were serving. I think what this demonstrates is that may or may not be true, but if in fact what is significant about AOT is not necessarily the black robe effect, but the ability to engage families at a deeper level. I, I think we wanna understand what part of the programs need to be expanded that aren't at this same high level. So what I would be saying to administration is let's understand the both sides of the coin, so to speak. And I wanna ask, are there any concerns about what I'm raising? So Supervisor Chavez, we are tracking every individual and every referral that comes to us for AOT services. And with that tracking, 
what we can go back and do now is begin to look at the difference, right, in terms of the services provided. I think the, the most important thing to remember also about AOT is the fact that it's a specific group of individuals who have refused or not engaging in the regular FSPs and all other services. So th that's the difference in terms of how this engagement and that work that we're doing there is, is different. So it's not necessarily the dosage that is being provided to them, but it's those individuals who are not able to be engaged even with as much dosage as been given. I see, and so Margaret, that's that's helpful a helpful distinction because I may not. I, I, let me ask this question back and see if this makes sense uh, to you. So, when of the 250, and I'm using the history of arrest page, so I'm on packet page 459, nine of 19. It has that total referrals were 252. The accepted referrals were 65, and then it did the comparison. I'm presuming that what you're saying is the folks that were on the left side that were that we didn't take into AOT, that the main reason they weren't taken is that they were willing to accept services. Yes. Now, were they willing to accept services because they got referred and they were given an option right then? Okay, go ahead. And then they accepted the option of service? Well, actually, a large number of the people who were not referred to AOT are people who did not meet the criteria. So that's number one. Right, but the criteria, mm -hmm. the, the, what I'm asking is, is the, what's the most significant criteria they're not meeting? Because if what you're saying is they don't meet the criteria because they're already accepting services? They were either, so, always, yes, okay. yes. They're engaged or open or receiving some type of services already. That was the one of the biggest reasons for not meeting the criteria. Interesting. So, so let me ask another question. What's the capacity of the program? What's your question one more time? Like, what's the total capa what, what are the total number of participants that could participate in the current design annually? Um, 100 right now. And we, we can't find 100 people that aren't accepting services? We recently expanded the program. So we, we understand that it will continue to grow rapidly if we were to accept everyone. So what we do also is to try to link them to other services if they're willing. So our staff will work with them to see if they're willing or already engaged in any type of program. So there's a difference between someone who's difficult and so refer to us uh, because that person's difficult and not want to work, but that person still open and still contacts them, still open with them, and still talking to them. To us, that's still engaging and that's still working with the providers. So, so meaning that if they're still talking to you, they're not eligible for AOT. If they are still continually working and communicating with the existing pro provider, we even think if they're not accepting services, we we. They are. So to, to us, when they are continually checking in, even though they might be what's considered difficult, that's still engaged in the program. So we also want to make sure huh. that we are uh, reserving this spot for people who are completely not engaged in any type of services. Uh, we do have... When you say not engaged, you mean unwilling to engage. Correct. Okay. Correct. Correct. So unwilling to engage, and so we get 252 referrals, and only 65 of them in this program period were unwilling to engage. The people who are referred to AOT programs are people who have completely not engaged at all. Okay. All right, and so, I, I guess I, I'll thank you. This was helpful, and I I'm having I am really having a hard time um, drawing a distinction. And and again, but but I, I'll give more thought to what I was asking because it, maybe my misunderstanding is what's impairing my ability to digest this properly. 
Um, one last question, and that is, again, just to use that single page as an example. If, if um, on the, the, um, the part that says, you know, the number of people that have been arrested, I'm just looking at the, the comparison. Is there an implication to the, to the arrest data that you want us to draw from that comparison? It's just to show that um, the general uh, referrals, obviously, are many of them do not, while they may have complicated um, mental health concerns, um, they actually may not have the kind of um, interaction with the justice system as the individuals who are actually meeting the AOT level or AOT criteria. Um, because of that, we have been continually meeting on a regular basis to collaborate with our uh, uh, justice uh, division as well as the court to continue to coordinate our services for our individuals. They both seem relatively high. They are. Thank you. All right, um, I will we'll, we'll share. I realize Supervisor Sumidian maybe just asked um, staff, but I, I'm going to share my perspective as well on um, on on AOT. And and first of all, thank you to Eric and and Margaret and Sue for for this report and the really fascinating uh, data. I I continue to have reservations about the effectiveness and the appropriateness of involuntary care. I for sure recognize that this may be needed for a very select and narrow population, especially when we're talking about acute and subacute care. But I continue to worry about the overuse of courts to direct treatment for an illness, um, whether it's through AOT or, or care court or, or possibly under uh, expanded conservatorship um, eligibility, which is pending in the state legislature right now. It was really encouraging to me to see that only 3% of the cases um, eligible for AOT processed all the way to needing a court order, which to me and to Supervisor Chavez's point suggests that if we had much more intensive community outreach and engagement in treatment, we could be more effective in voluntary uh, engagement of residents and their families. Um, even for people that have been hard to, to reach in the past. So one of the, what I'm thinking about is, uh, in addition to the expansion of AOT slots, um, I would be very interested, and I'll, I'll look to our COO uh, and the teams involved in behavioral health system planning, to look for opportunities for expanded intensive outreach separate from the AOT process. Because what you're showing is that it's not the court order that is effective, the, the forcing into involuntary treatment. It is the intensive services at a level which we weren't doing prior to AOT. So to the extent that AOT has pushed us uh, to provide more services, I think it's good. The, the problem that I still have is, is just with the um, uh, forcing involuntary treatment. I did have just one um, question that I wanted to ask. Uh, page six of the attached report shows that 62% of individuals that meet AOT criteria and were referred to services were BIPOC with really an over-representation among black and African American residents. They represent 17% of AOT cases. And I'm curious to know what analysis has been conducted around uh, racial disproportionality in cases referred to AOT compared to the behavioral health system and the community as a whole, if any. And if not, you can guess my direction. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think in comparison to the overall behavioral health uh, clients, the number is not too far off. It's pretty similar. 
uh, because it's the initial year, we haven't gone into the deep dive of the analysis, but that's actually something that we're planning as we are uh, continually um, improving the program. We also want to look at if there's any barriers, if there are any over-representations, we want to know about that. And so we will also continue to work with our advisory committee together um, to have that dialogue, hear from them, um, get their feedback as well, to do a deep analysis on if there are anything that needs to be improved to make sure that we're not focusing on one particular group. Thank you. Then with um, the consent of the maker of the motion to come back next year, I would like next year's report to also include um, data on disproportionality and since I think we can guess that it's going to exist, what are we already doing and putting in place to, um, to reduce that and, and provide more, lead to more equitable outcomes? Is that all right? Yes, but I don't want to prejudge what we're going to get back, even if we think we already know that what exists. Good point. Very fair Just point. That's, and yes. I want to go back to Supervisor Chavez's request, which I'm happy to accommodate, and I want to make sure it gets incorporated uh, through the chair uh, and with the consent of the seconder to, to bring back essentially what I'm going to call a parallel set of data for folks who have not been in the system so that we can sort of do the compare and contrast that I think Supervisor Chavez was hoping we would do. And I, wanna, I don't want that thread to get lost. And then I do have some comments and opinions to share. Thank you. Before I begin a second round, I just want to check with Supervisor Arenas if you had anything to add. You're okay. Then Supervisor Sumidian and then Supervisor Lee. Yeah, I I um, I understand the concerns that have been expressed because they were concerns I had for a very long time, uh, and it was only after we took a careful look at this not once but twice in committee and at the full board and with the testimony that was very helpful, as I said earlier, from two other counties where they felt they were having a good experience. Um, but I think there are, there are two or three things that have been referenced that need to be underscored yet again, which is 3% um, is a pretty small number. Uh, so when we're asking ourselves um, how involuntary the program is, it's not involuntary 97% of the time then what does that 3% look like? And I'm going to ask and answer the questions, and you feel free to correct me if <laughs> I'm wrong. Uh, but, um, well, that way I know I'll have an appreciative audience. Um, <laughs> you know, does involuntary mean involuntary uh, or forced medication? And it does not. Does involuntary mean... Uh, involuntary or forced institutionalization, and it does not. So as I say, we're looking at um, just 3%, and even for that 3%, um, we've got a situation where it does not involve uh, medication or institutionalization uh, that is uh, involuntary. The other thing I would say is I, I heard an interesting perspective two years ago when we were having these conversations, and as you can tell, it has stayed with me. And one person I talked to said, you know, I know some people see this as requiring something or forcing something, but there's another way to look at it, which is clearly all of the tools that we have and have been using for not just years, but more than a decade, haven't worked for some folks in the system. For some they have, but not for all. And for some folks in the system, AOT is the way we can ensure that they have access to the services that they need and deserve. And it gives some families, again, not all, but some families, the ability to get their loved ones the help they need and deserve. So I don't, I don't see it as more this than that, I see it as one more option that will work for some, but not for all, but will mean that some folks who heretofore haven't been able to get their loved ones the help they need and deserve are able to use this particular path to get there. And that's why I'm not only comfortable, but enthusiastic about it. So um, I, with the consent of the seconder, will incorporate the request for additional information and for Thank a report you. back in a year that as described. 
And um, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure we covered this issue that actually was covered here on the report. Um, is regarding housing being supported for the OT program. Um, my initial reaction when this program first got proposed is that housing is a crucial part of this program to make it successful. Looking at the chart, a couple of things. One was surprised to see that there's actually three that was provided with tent. <laughs> so that does not really seem to be the profile of housing we're thinking about. But is this one situation where the individual only wants to be in the tent and nowhere else? Yeah, I could speak on that. So um, that particular, so tent is really the last resort. Um, that individual, particular individual, has been placed in multiple placements, like motels to um, individual apartments, to master lease housing, to you know various different places. But um, he just wasn't able to live in that kind of a setting. Where when so when the staff actually provided a tent um, to a particular location, they could continue to check with that person. He was able to do that and continue to. Um, engage with the provider. So that's a last resort. We don't want to do that. Um, but sometimes um, it's still better to provide that, that he stays in there than just on the streets without tent also. Well, absolutely. And then the other thing is the part of the reason why AOT so far has been, it seems to be welcomed by the, the uh, those who are participating. Housing is a huge part of it, isn't it? Correct. And so as you could see even on the report, um, the providers place them in about 83 different housing placements with right. these individuals. Um, and also, I think having master lease housing program has been really helpful in that there are times when they are, when they're released from jail, they really need somewhere to go to immediately. So that became an option for them to come to, to stabilize while the staff are looking for something more permanent for them. So right. that's been a great resource as well. Great, thank you. And then second one, when I look at the um, individuals that was highlighted saying that there are those who I referred, 32 met the AOT criteria, but they could not participate in various reasons they could not participate. One of which is this is incarceration. Is this because they have a sentence that need to finish up and they haven't finished up, therefore they cannot participate in OT yet? Right, or they have um, a sentencing that's longer than say three to six months. Um, so we, um, yeah, it's long term that we didn't know when their release date was gonna be. So we would just close them out. So the question would be, do we track them so that when they are being released, then they will come to the program? We don't track them, but once they are released, um, AOT is one of the options, so they re-refer the individuals as well. Okay, so that's one question. Second question, I guess, would be whether or not the, the offer of AOT, since they are qualified, is this something that could be brought up to the judge so that when they make the sentencing, this might be an alternative instead of putting them in jail any longer, just stay, put them in the AOT program instead. Yeah, in fact, we meet regularly with the judge and the court staff to discuss and coordinate that. And so he'll often say, hey, we have this individual. We want to refer this individual to AOT. We'll coordinate the release date so that the providers go pick that person up as well. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Let's take a vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Semidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5-0. Thank you very much. I'm going to make a quick uh, order switch because we have um, a good number of speakers in the chamber or, or had um, waiting to speak on item 17, and I'm concerned that they may run up against our dinner break and have to wait. Uh, and there are no speakers in the chamber on item 16. So we're going to hear 17 now. Then we're going to break for 30 minutes for dinner and come back and continue with item 16. So item 17 is alternatives to incarceration work groups, final report. Good afternoon, Martha Wapensky, Deputy County Executive. Here with me is Program Manager Veronica Marcello. With us also today online are the consultants from RDA who facilitated the ATI work groups and synthesized all the discussion you see having your packet there in front of you. 
Um, so online we have Dr. Charlene Taylor and also Megan Drazik from RDA. Uh, this item on alternatives to incarceration was heard by the Public Safety and Justice Committee in May. I did want to emphasize before I turn this over to the consultants for brief overview that o RDA served as group facilitators and as I said, this synthesized the work group recommendation, but all of the work and voting on the final recommendations were directly from all the work group members themselves. I wish there was time to thank them all individually today, but all of their names and bios are in the packets in front of you. And so given the hour and given the fact that uh, you have the report and recommendations in front of you, I'm gonna ask Charlene and Megan from RDA to give us a high level overview of the report and recommendations, as well as the top three voted strategies from the work group. And as I turn it over to her, Charlene and Megan from RDA, following their presentation, I'd like to comment on next steps and then take your questions, if that all sounds good. Yes, thank you. Okay, Charlene. We're Megan. gonna do public comment in there though before we get to um, supervisor questions. Thank you. Uh, Charlene and Megan, go ahead. They're joining us on Zoom today. Thank you, and thank you, board members. Today we are sharing the Alternatives to Incarceration, or ATI, final report and presenting the recommendations and strategies developed by the ATI workgroup, which included both the county staff and community members. And so we'll start today um, with an overview of the process um, for everyone and then jumping into a review, as Martha said, a high level review of the recommendations and strategies. So I'll be sharing out a brief version of this presentation that's included in your agenda packet. So I'll be skipping some slides that are included, um, but I'll, the slide numbers will be the same. So I'll, I'll announce which slide we're on if you'd like to follow along with your own copy. So starting with our process review, as shown on slide four, the ATI work group was composed of three groups based on intercept points that represent the different stages at which an ind individual might interact with the carceral legal system. So this included intervention at the start, um, everything from community-based crisis response programs to arrest, um, booking, and pre-arraignment. And then the criminal legal process group picked up with arraignment and covered through case disposition and sentencing. And then the reentry group covered um, everything from release to post-sentence, um, including probation and parole. So if we move to the next slide, um, also decided from the, the start of the meeting series, each of the three, um, I'm sorry, my bad. Um, the county identified areas that fell outside of the scope of the ATI work group. And so these included prevention, policing, juvenile justice and correction spaces. So there's more detail in the final ATI report if you're interested um, in learning more about why these were selected as outside of the scope. So moving to our next slide on slide six, this is, provides just a brief overview of the timeline. And so over the course of this meeting series, each of the three groups met seven times in total beginning in September of last year and culminating with the consensus sessions in April. Additionally, members from all groups met in a combined session on Monday, May 15th to share their feedback on the process as well as their thoughts for moving forward with this work. RDA really acknowledges the difficulties that may have hindered expected work group output and participation in this process. Some of the challenges identified by the work group members themselves included the speed of the meeting series, thereby culminating in recommendations that many work group members feel need further discussion prior to implementation. Also noted was the inhibiting nature of the virtual meetings for some members, particularly on communication and engagement styles. And then there were some concerns with group member representation or frustrations with conflicting schedules, which can be very difficult um, with a large group like that. And then lastly, there was a desire to focus on issues that were deemed outside of the scope of the project, such as upstream prevention or policing. So next we'll move into our brief review of the work group recommendations. So I'll be spending um, the rest of the pre presentation today on that brief review of some key themes from each group's recommendations and strategies and then highlighting the three strategies that were voted by work group members as top priority for the county to consider. And so as shown on slide eight now, all three groups aligned in who they identified as most affected by the carceral legal system and the issues within their intercept points. So these are community members who are most marginalized and in need of care, particularly those who have been impacted by poverty, unstable housing, disability, mental and or substance use disorders, and violence, as well as people of color. So these are the individuals that work group members had in mind as they crafted the recommendations and strategies through this process. 
So moving on to slide nine, you'll see each of the three groups listed here. So I'll be providing a brief overview of the recommendations developed by each group, um, as well as um, in the ATI group, full ATI report, you can see the full strategies and recommendations listed out. There's also some more detail on slides 10 through 20 in the slide deck in your agenda packet if you're interested in following along as I describe these. Um, the recommendations are a higher level, and then we had uh, the work group members also developed strategies for each recommendation. So these are more detailed action items that contribute to the overall intent of the recommendation. And so, as I said, more information can be found both in the report and in the slide deck. The intervention at the start group developed two recommendations and 12 corresponding strategies. These focused on increasing the use of destinations that can be used as an alternative to arrest and connecting people to needed services and resources, as well as raising public awareness around the proper use of 988, 911, and community-based alternatives to violence to decriminalize certain behaviors. Our second group, the criminal legal process, developed two recommendations and six corresponding strategies. These focused on efforts that would reduce the amount of time spent in custody for individuals who could benefit from treatment and services, as well as assessing current prosecutorial and court-based diversion practices to determine if there's ways to expand opportunities for individuals who would truly otherwise remain in custody with current practices. And then lastly, the reentry group developed four recommendations and 19 corresponding strategies and these focused on increasing access to services and supports to individuals, both through improvements in the release planning process, as well as also increasing networks of support and the capacity of services in the community for individuals who are being released from custody and also for individuals who are formerly incarcerated and already living in the community. So now I'm going to jump us ahead to slide 21. It's titled Top Voted Strategies. As I mentioned earlier, um, as part of that final combined session that we held in May, we asked work group members to vote on the top three strategies across all intercept points that they would like to see the county prioritize for implementation. So these, lar these votes largely concentrated on three strategies, as you can see in the figure here. And each of these strategies is related to expanding the county's capacity for behavioral health treatment and other supports. So if we move to the next slide, with 14 votes, recommendation 3C was the top most voted strategy. This was to create a non-carceral secure mental health residential treatment facility designed to provide a safe and supportive environment where individuals can receive comprehensive mental health treatment. However, uh, it's worth noting two members of the work group that developed this strategy dissented to the strategy and the overall recommendation that it was housed under. Uh, reasons for dissent, uh, dissent included objection to the idea of funding a secure treatment facility because a locked facility cannot be non-carceral in nature. And there was the preference for funding preventative and community-based intervention mental health care, as well as supports for individuals to be stable in the community, including those impacted by poverty, inequality, systemic racism, and other factors like that, rather than expanding the carceral system and relying on it to address community challenges. The next top voted strategy with 11 votes was recommendation 1A, and this was to expand the capacity of community-based treatment, um, behavioral health treatment, and supportive housing across the continuum of care to better meet the needs of the population. And then the third top voted strategy with eight votes was recommendation 3B, which was to invest in additional crisis residential beds and facilities, treatment beds, outpatient slots, and affordable long-term housing that can be connected to outpatient services with the goal of reducing wait times for treatment placement by 50%. And that concludes our brief presentation. Thank you so much for your time. We are available for any questions. Thank you very much. Let's go to public comment. Uh, how many speakers do we have in the chamber and on Zoom, please, Jess? I have 11 requests in chambers and six online, which brings us to 17. Okay, so we are going to do one minute uh, per speaker, and if there's anyone else in the chamber that is wishing to speak that hasn't submitted a yellow card, please scurry and do that right now, because when the first speaker begins, we will close the in-person queue. And for those of you who are on Zoom, if anyone else wishes to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand at this time. That queue will close when the first speaker begins on Zoom. So let's begin. In the chambers, I don't see anybody back there grabbing an extra yellow card. I concur. Our first speaker will be John Sweeney, followed by Sylvia Perez-McDonald, followed by Raymond. I'm sorry, I can't quite catch the last name. Feel free to queue in the center. 
going. It's perfect. So Wait, you'll be you the third speaker. Go ahead and queue up in this one. You'll do five at once, please. Oh, five. After Raymond will be Cynthia, followed by Donovan. And John Sweeney, whenever you're ready. Oh. And Ellenberg County Supervisors and Staff. On behalf of the County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Marianne Dewan, and the Santa Clara County Office of Education, we want to thank the county for its ongoing efforts to provide alternatives to incarceration. Incarceration has been extremely damaging to the community in Santa Clara County and has painfully affected both thousands of adults and children. It is now widely acknowledged that the incarceration of a parent is extremely detrimental to the health and lives of their children, affecting their education, mental health, and socio-emotional well-being. In addition, the racist, disproportionate use of incarceration against Black and Latin A populations has added additional hardship to historically marginalized communities. Black and Latin A people that are disabled experience even higher disproportionality. Children also face the direct harm of incarceration, which separates them from their family, isolates them from their community. Tools such as educational support and restorative justice are proven and effective tools to keep families together and provide educational support. Thank you very much. Sylvia Perez McDonald, please go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. <clears throat> My comments are that we, I support the recommendations. They may not be perfect, but they are a very important first start for the transformational change that we need to make to our justice system. The need for transformational change will be um, is, is evident in the recommendations, which I support not just because they are long-term and impactful, but because they are timely, they are relevant, and they have the capacity to be ap applied right now. And they have the capacity to actually have an impact in our jail population um, on a daily basis. We also need to look at these recommendations in context. We've done transformational reform in the justice system before. We did it successfully in the juvenile justice system, and where now the juvenile hall population is very low, but it required time, diligence, this board's oversight, and collaboration and effort. Reform cannot be achieved overnight. It takes time, and it requires a cultural transformation. Thank you. Next is Raymond, followed by Cynthia, followed by Donovan. Please cue in the center. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Raymond Goins. I'm with Silicon Valley Debug. Um, I am part of the formerly incarcerated marginalized population, as you guys talk about. I served over 18 years in prison. I just came home from dealing with Santa Clara County and the aptitude of you guys dealing with the function. You guys continue to throw money at a problem, saying we're going to fix the system, fix the system, but you're not addressing the problem. You're just throwing sugar on something trying to say it's sweet. The, the, you need to refund the money and throw the money towards the youth, throw the education process. If kids are properly educated, they won't go to jail. If you go to jail as a youth, like I did, you become mentally ill. You deal with mental illness because you got PTSD from the stuff you see. This is juvenile. When you go to jail, you're trying to reduce the jail population. It doesn't matter because you're talking about you refunding money to mental health. But that addressing mental health, you have to educate them. Jail is a part of mental health is part of mental health deterioration. Jail would destroy your mental health. I've seen dudes go to jail for two days and kill themselves like that for nothing. So I think you guys are throwing money where it's not needs to be thrown at and should address education. Thank you. Cynthia followed by Donovan, followed by Narrowly Campos, followed by Eladio Cortez Morales. Again, please queue up in the center, form a line in the center of the room. Hello, I'm a registered district one voter, a system impacted family member. The community, stakeholders, and I, along with debug members, attended meetings with the intent to create new ideas and to do the work that is needed for radical changes in the system. Instead, only improved communication and improved process improvements were created. The ATI process did not allow space for policy changes and only honored space for awareness of the existing failing programs. The ATI report needs to include allowing people to calendar their court dates and also making sure that we do zero dollar bail and also the Humphrey ruling to help people doing bail arraignment. The final ATI report shows an unwillingness to challenge the carceral system, thus creating recommendations that are ineffective and empty. Therefore, we ask the board to call on the administration and the stakeholders to, to work with debug and other people Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Hello, uh, my name is Alad Cortez. Um, I'm a formerly incarcerated inmate. I was 17 years old when I I got locked up. They uh, the system failed me. They sent me to level four prisons. And coming out, I'm also un undocumented, so I'm not able to get the mental health that you guys provide because I don't I can't even get a job. So how would I sign up to things that I'm always get, getting denied to? So I'm thinking about like. The only reason I'm actually being stable because my community is helping me real good, my family. It's a big help for to have them. If I didn't have them, like, I have cousins that suffer from, from mental health. My cousin, like, like, a month ago, he tried to kill himself by suicide by cop. I don't want to, I don't want to be a person like that either. <sighs> That's it. Uh, Donovan and Nerly Campos, if you're still in the room, please come forward. Next will be Jose Valle, Melissa Valdez, and have Xavier Espana. Can I interrupt for a second? Dr. Smith? Can you uh, contact the man that just got done speaking so we can get him connected to mental health? Okay. And we'll also have Alicia Chavez. Hey, how you doing? Jose with Silicon Valley Debug. Uh, the ATI completely ignored cries for policy change, such as allowing people to calendar their own court dates for a, a, arrest warrants instead of having to go to, into jail. Re-implementing zero dollar bail, which, is, which was initially instated um, through COVID, using the Humphrey ruling standards for bail decisions at arraignment and strengthening and expanding Penal Code 1001.36 pretrial diversion for folks impacted by mental health disorders, substance use, and come from communities impacted by poverty via Humphrey standards. Therefore, we ask uh, the Board of Supervisors and call out the administration and the courts to work with community stakeholders such as DBUG to implement actual policy changes to reduce incarceration in Santa Clara County. Um, and uh, one last statement, I know we've been saying that a lot lately is, uh, well, it looks like my time's out, but thank you. Thank you. Is this Melissa Valdez? Thank you, followed by Xavier Espana, followed by Alicia Chavez. Melissa, a San Jose resident, born and raised. I am a system impacted family member here with Silicon Valley Debug. I was also on the ATI. I ask the board to call on administration and courts to work with community stakeholders such as Silicon Valley Debug to implement actual policy changes to reduce incarceration in Santa Clara County jails. The final ATI report shows unwillingness to challenge the carceral system, thus leaving recommendations intentionally ineffective and empty. The report um, could have included the uh, re-implement of zero dollar bail, the use of the Humphrey really ruling standards for bail decisions at arraignment, and allowing people to calendar their date, or dates for arrest warrants. Thank you. Also, before I speak, Donovan and Norelli were here in person, but I think they're going to be joining online. Donovan and Norelli? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Xavier. I'm with Silicon Valley Debug. Uh, Debug submitted recommendations that can be implemented today to reduce the incarceration before the incarceration even begins. Most of the recommendations that have been implemented through the ATI work group won't be able to be implemented until after the incarceration has already been completed. As a member of the ATI, I voted I strongly disagree or veto most of the recommendations, which wasn't mentioned earlier, which makes it not a consensus. This is coming from an individual who's been previously incarcerated himself, working with other community members who have been previously incarcerated or have loved ones who are incarcerated themselves. Um, with that being said, I don't really support the recommendations from ATI. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Alicia Chavez. Uh, I'm an organizer with Silicon Valley Debug. Um, I was also a part of the ATI work groups and uh, just wanted to share the feeling that the ATI completely ignored the cry for policy change um, and only allowed space for things like awareness and uh, space for for programs that to expand that are really failing failing our current population. Uh, there is a cry for policy change, such as allowing people to calendar themselves for arrest warrants. As you know, we have now sent a demand letter to the courts and to the county through the ACLU, and we're asking to re-implement the zero dollar bail like they have now done in LA County. Uh, we call on you. Just want to confirm one last time that Donovan Castellero and Narrowly Campos are not in the room. Then that concludes in-person speakers. Thank you very much. The, <clears throat> pardon me, is the number of speakers the same on Zoom as it was earlier? It's up to eight. It's up to eight, all right. Reminder to folks, when the first speaker on Zoom begins, the Zoom queue will close. Thank right. you. Our first speaker is Iani Ballard, or Lonnie Ballard, if it's not capitalized. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Lonnie Ballard. I'm a voter in District 1, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice. I feel that we have to find new ways to, to keep our community safe and well. But putting a community member with mental issues into a locked facility is not the answer. We should promote unlocked, peer-led in interventions, which are actually more effective. Therefore, I do support the ATI recommendation C and C, but do not support the first recommendation. I'm not saying the county supervisors not to support any recommendation for a locked Thank you. Our next speaker is Victor Sin. You'll have one minute. Please go ahead. I believe you'll have to press star six to unmute your telephone. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Victor Sin from the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. I'm in support of the Care First JNFA Coalition. I'm calling on administration and courts to work with community stakeholders such as the BUC to implement actual policy changes to reduce incarceration in Santa Clara County. We support real and substantive changes that concretely reduce the number of people involved in the carceral system and in the jail. More concretely, we support measures such as allowing people to calendar their court dates for arrest warrants, re-implementing zero-dollar bail, using the Humphrey ruling standards for bail decisions as a arraignment, and strengthening and expanding PC1001.36 pre-trial diversion for folks impacted by mental health disorders and substance use. Therefore, we ask you to call on administration and the court to work with community stakeholders such as the bug to implement actual policy changes. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Catherine Hedges. I'm a member of Surge in District 2, and I'm supporting SVD Bug. I agree with all the speakers from DBUG who are on previously, those on the ATI committee, and others with lived experience. I live downtown in affordable housing, and I have neighbors who struggle with mental health and substance abuse, and sometimes this leads them to commit acts of crime. Uh, many of them have... Um, basically mental injury from being in jail, and I don't want to see them locked up in secure mental health facilities. How can someone trust their treatment team enough to heal in that kind of setting? What we know actually works is caring for people in non-carceral settings, uh, such as Blackbird House and the other parts of the mental health system discussed earlier. And we need culture competence, we need housing, um, pretty much everything except a mental health jail. Uh, thank you very much, and support debug. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have one minute. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, 
if there is a benefit from these conversations is that what I think we've learned is that our community and citizens are the best resource to inform policy, to implement it, and then amend it as we move along. We've spent, we've spent a lot of money on these consultants. That's fine. Because what I think it did is it told us as a community, we already know the answers. Now, I think the onus is on the, is on the county to really do what we do. And I, it may be naive for me to place my hope in that, but from what I was hearing from Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Chavez, you understand, I mean, you hit it right on the money. So now, where's the policy change that's gonna reflect that knowledge and the rhetoric? That's what we're looking at. That right there, where is that? Our next speaker is Jen Meyer. You'll have one minute, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jen Meyer. I'm a D2 voter, an SEIU 521 worker, and a member of showing up for racial justice at Sacred Heart. If we really want alternatives to incarceration, we need both immediate interventions to reduce jail population, and we need upstream interventions that solve problems at the root. I ask that the Board of Supervisors call on administration and the courts to work directly with community stakeholders like SVDBug to move forward with their community proposals for policies that will reduce jail population immediately. While people are waiting in jail, they can lose their jobs, they can be evicted, they are separated from their families and their support networks. In particular, I want to underscore the debugged proposals to expand the trust program, allow people to count their court dates, use least restrictive principles, and re-implement the emergency bail schedule. Regarding the official ATI workgroup recommendations, I support the second and third of the top priorities, which focus on prevention, but not the secure treatment facility. We support peer-led community-based acute crisis residential facilities, which have more effectiveness than locked facilities. Our next speaker is Kat Adamson. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Kat, and I'm from Students Against Mass Incarceration at SJSU, and I'm a District 2 voter. I support DBUG's um, policy changes, such as the $0 bail re-implementation and allowing people to calendar their, their court dates for arrest warrants, among other policy implementations. I think it's very important that we pay attention to the actual community stakeholders and how important their impactful statements are. I also just wanted to say that my organization does not support the use of locked mental health facilities, um, as these are too close to jail and they're not really seen as effective in the community. We do support a new mental health facility, but not a locked one. Thank you. Our next speaker is Raj Jayadev. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Raj with Debug. I submitted written public comment earlier. Um, that further explains uh, our position. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate, Debug stepped into the ATI in good faith that it would be a vehicle for the transformational change that uh, Sylvia spoke about, but found it to be really ineffectual. And I think that's clear in the recommendations that were presented. All of those recommendations were either too general, too vague, uh, could not be measured, um, or really just reiterated the status quo. And that's why we presented our own list of, of ideas and recommendations that were proven to already be effective in this county, zero dollar bail, allowing people to calendar court dates. That's why we actually filed a, a demand letter today that you all saw. It shouldn't take litigation for the county to act. There's clearly will uh, for this change in, in chambers. You see the leaders that spoke earlier today and I hope that you follow their lead and work with us to make those changes. Our final speaker is Kim Guptill. You'll have one minute, please go ahead. Yes, my name is Kim Guptill and I'm from District 4 and a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. I care about justice and I care about care and I care about care first. People in crisis need care, not jail. We all need to understand and support alternatives to incarceration because we all know what jails do to people. We ask that the Board of Supervisors call on administration and the courts to work directly with community stakeholders like Silicon Valley Debug, the leaders in all of this, to move forward with their community proposals for policies that will reduce jail population immediately. And regarding the work group rec recommendations, we support the second and third priorities. We do not support the top priority for a secure treatment facility because as you know, peer-led community-based 
acute crisis data at residential facilities, and we find that the residential facilities have been proven to be more effective than locked psychiatric facilities, even for people with severe mental illness. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the uh, members of the public who, who came out to, to speak today. Uh, thank you to Veronica and, and Martha. Thank you to RDA. Um, and, and really, most of all, to all of the, the work group members who dedicated time from their evenings and days to attend meetings, review materials, and engage the voices they represent to produce the report that's before the board today. Um, I, I believe that their dedication exemplifies the energy in our, just, in our county for justice reform. Uh, it wasn't lost on me that the top three recommendations all related to mental health services as diversions from incarcerations. Um, that wasn't necessarily what I expected, but that's exactly why we engage in these processes. I appreciated the public speaker who referenced early education and other preventative and early interventions um, as, as the very best alternatives to incarceration. Uh, thank you to the members who spoke their truths during public comment about the shortcomings of the process and the acknowledgement that it was more evolutionary than revolutionary. Um, I believe you're right to a large degree and I hope that the appetite for authentic transformation continues to grow in our community. Uh, I'm gonna offer a motion and then turn to my colleagues for hopefully a second and then any comments or questions. When administration returns with a work plan and timeline in September, I'd like to make sure a couple of elements will be included. Um, so I'll make a motion to receive the report along with these two requests. Uh, first, that the report back addresses the overall recommendations as well as the strategies included under each of the recommendations which appeared to span a range of different ideas that, that weren't fully captured by the top line recommendations. I'm interested in the strategies because I think we need to be looking at priorities uh, around behavioral health capacity that the work group members put at the top of their lists, how those may or may not align with work underway in, our expanding, in expanding our behavioral health system and strategies that may have shorter timelines and reach the population that doesn't qualify for mental health diversion. Two, that the work group members will be informed and engaged on the work plan before it's presented to the board in September. I've heard concerning feedback about past community engagement processes that engage the public at the outset of uh, some initiative and then turn to county departments for implementation without seeking further feedback from the groups to determine whether the implementation proposed is consistent with the recommendations. The ATI work group model was designed specifically to put departments and community members in the same room to jointly identify implementable plans. So I want us to maintain that transparency and communication uh, through this next phase of the work by bringing the proposed implementation plan back to the ATI members, I think we can gather them uh, in, one, in one group or we can talk about how to, how to effectuate that um, uh, for input before administration brings uh, that plan back to the Board of Supervisors. I'll second it with some um, potential amendments. Thank you very much, go right ahead. Sure, uh, on that report, I certainly would like to also include some other key data, uh, including the cost for treatment alternatives, housing and other social services. That would also help identify how funds can be reallocated from the carceral system. In, in a general way, yeah. talk about funds? Sure, okay, sure. We, need, we need to talk about cost. Second is target numbers for how many people that would be transitioned out of the incarceration if such alternatives were being set in place and how many people would not even be placed in the prison pipeline altogether because of these strategies. Sure. Okay. Um, and then also including an information and data on our <clears throat> current diversion program. Uh, knowing that the staff of the DA's office is working to make this program work, I would like to see what we can do to strengthen it and explore ways to get as many people into this program as possible as well. I'm so sorry. I was doing a clerk thing. Yes. <laughs> Could you say that again, sure. please? It, it basically, we, knowing that there are other efforts right now to 
have more diversion program that is being currently in use. I would like to know uh, how the DA's office is also working to make the program work and to see what we can do more to strengthen this program and explore ways to get as many people into this program as possible. I, I'm not sure we can direct the district attorney, but the direct but the district attorney is part of the ATI work group, and we can certainly pass along that um, that recommendation and um, and, and see how they respond. Thank okay. you. And that's my my. Uh, I, I do have some questions and comments, but I'll let other people speak on this otherwise. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, one one request, and uh, Supervisor or President Allenberg, this is a, a question really for you. Is the how do you see the Public Safety Justice Committee um, as part of this prior to it coming back to the full board in September, and maybe even reentry? We can a absolutely do that. It'd be, if if it's ready, it's more of a timing question. Um, if it's ready in time for the August PSJC meeting, I would always welcome another opportunity, depending on whether PSJC or Reentry happens first. Maybe it's ready in time for the second. I don't think we need to hear it at both. There is a good I, deal I of agree. overlap. Yeah. But Martha, I'll look, I'll look to you on mm -hmm. calendaring and scheduling, and um, and let us know in terms of timing if it can be brought to PSJC or Reentry Network in August. And if not, let's see how it works in September. If it comes to the Second September meeting, maybe we can do it earlier in the month at one of the committees. We'll look at timing for sure. Um, August feels uh, pretty optimistic, but I'm happy to look at timing. Perfect. Thank you so much. And it may be um, through the chair, Martha, that that a high-level presentation. And let me just tell you the outcome I want so that this could be helpful to you. And that is that what's interesting to me about um, the the overall material in our packet, both the debug recommendations and the, the group's recommendations, is that a, a number of these programs are already in progress. And what I want to make sure of is that the Public Safety and Justice Committee community, as, along with the debug community and all other communities that are really interested in this, know, um, you know what, what actions are already being taken that may um, address some of the issues and concerns that are raised by the by the community I, and that's really one outcome the second outcome is that in particular as it relates to reentry one of the strategies and I'm I'm kind of looking to dr. Smith on this one but one of the strategies of reentry was actually to make that facility a, a no entry so you know one of the challenges is that we don't want someone to have to commit a crime before they can go find an organized place to get housing that you you know, and, and frankly, the reentry center may be easier for somebody than trying to go online and navigate a service. So what I had thought, where I thought we would be evolved to, honestly, by now, would be that that the reentry um, program would have opportunities for people leaving, um, you know, incarceration, but also for opportunities for people who hadn't yet gotten deep in the system and were just looking for help, mental health help, drug and alcohol help, housing help. And, and somehow, I don't know, I, I think this is actually something, um, Jeff, that you, you know, my recollection is that we, we were actually looking at that direction in the, before COVID. And so I, I, so I think it got a little sidelined, but reading both reports, that's so clear to me that that's something that the action that we need to take um, so anyway, that's partly why I wanted to hear it at reentry because I thought maybe maybe the group would just come yeah. to that same conclusion again. It sort of did get sidetracked for a while, but um, you'll notice in the revised budget there's some money for reentry to rev back up and um, take a different, slightly different approach. No, we're not going to give up on obviously on reentry, but moving towards a no entry support structure. And one thing, just to follow up on that, that that I, I think would be just something I, I, that this both reports really make me reflect on, and that is the idea that, you know, whether we're looking at um, 
the Vietnamese American Service Center or the hub, which is really a community center for, for children who have been part of our, um, uh, you know, foster youth, have touched our foster youth system at all, is that we're trying to create, for lack of a better word, sort of service homes for them so that it's easy to access, they feel safe and secure, and there's mechanisms to doing that. And I think, you know, one other thing I'm just reflecting on today is how important in-person exchanges are for so many people in our community. You know, that again, the online, the phone call, the versus being able to sit across from somebody and, and actually have a conversation. So in any case, I, I think these are both really important to move forward with. What I would really be asking the staff oops, to think about is the, um, the model and the approach we want to take, because I think we have learned from the reentry center, definitely we've learned from the VASC. I mean, the reason we're real rebuilding the hub is we actually see success in that. Uh, so I would just be very interested back to, I think Susan, you raised such a good point, is what are the underlying strategies that we're using to try to accomplish the outcomes we want, which is frankly less entanglement overall and I I think I, you know as one young person said when he was talking about education we're for that too right we're we want to support the educational system but there are other areas where we need to provide support so anyway it, I, I love the idea of looking at the strategies I would really like it I think maybe it makes more sense for it to come back to reentry so we can take a look of the look at this in a more holistic way that that really juxtaposes reentry with this concept of a service center that's available to the entire community before they need, uh, before they end up in the, in engaged at all in the carceral system where we can avoid it. Thank you for that. And I will note that um, we, we did specifically limit to not talking about all of the prevention and early intervention because literally that's everything else. <laughs> that's good. That's an excellent <laughs> and point. And it was yeah. a little, it was yeah. overly broad, but if, if we ran things by, my preference, the, the vast bulk of county funding would be going towards children, families, prevention, early intervention, all of that scaffolding to be sure that people don't end up in systems like, like this where we then have to support them. And I think, Susan, you know what? I, I, I want to just say to you, um, I, just to say thank you to you for staying on this and really forcing the county to have discussions about how to do everything we're doing better. And I, I absolutely understand the point that the, the debug community is making, and I understand the, the leadership that it took from you to really get the county and all of us to be thinking about the whole continuum because that's really what we have to do, both be in the prevention business, a la the Office of Children's Advocacy and all the other offices we've created, and then where we are today. So thank you for that. Thank you. Supervisor Samidi, and then Arenas, and then back to Lee. Thank you. I have some questions, Madam Chair. Uh, could you repeat your motion, please, so I know um, what's before us? Because the recommended action, of course, is simply to receive the report. Yes. So the motion is to receive the report along with two additional requ two requests. One, that the report back addresses the overall recommendations as well as the strategies included under each of the recommendations. Do want, I can read the whole explanation I, I or just the direction about that part. And first, if I may, just uh, sure. For the record and also for my clerk. Uh, so the addresses does not mean incorporate. It means speaks to. Is that correct? Let me look at my language. Uh, the report back addresses the overall recommendations. Yes, it does mean speaks to, makes comments upon. Okay, so they could agree, disagree, agree in whole, agree in part. Recommend in part. Okay, I just I, I don't I don't want to be voting to incorporate or do something ah. today uh, unintentionally. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. And then the second piece is the second is that the work group members be informed and engaged on the work plan before it is presented to the board in September. And what I'm looking for here is not necessarily a not. Um, a veto power or another um, extended process, but a single meeting between now and um, 
August or September that brings together the members of all of the work groups so that they have an opportunity to review the report that's intended to be presented to the Board of Supervisors reentry and, and, and or PSJC before it's presented so that if they do have concerns or comments, they can make them and either those changes, possible outcomes or that those recommendations are incorporated or that they are added as an appendix or that there is um, a rebuttal to the recommendations. Any of those could happen, but I want the opportunity to be made available prior to the report coming to us. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, turn now to staff, if I may. So the current plan then is for you to come back with a proposed plan in the fall. That's correct. And meeting with the impacted departments during that time to figure out what's already being done, what the gaps might be, what the plan is moving forward. Let me, if I could make a distinction, because you're right, Joe, that's the same words. These are recommendations and what will come back is an implementation plan which could include we're not going to implement this it's not in the purview of the county we're not going to implement this because it costs 900 bazillion dollars we are going to implement these four things over this period of time and this is how we're going to do it I want to be clear looking to County Council and to the staff that we are not actually making any policy or operational decisions today. Is that correct? That's my that understanding. My understanding but let James, but James do you want to? Yes, as I understand it, to put it kind of another way, this is basically being um, asked to be looked at for further analysis. Mm -hmm. Great. Are the maker and the seconder amenable to incorporating uh, the uh, direction to staff that when they come back with uh, their reports slash plans slash recommendations in the fall that that has feasibility analysis, cost analysis, and legal analysis. To the extent that that can be provided by September, I'm happy to include it. I don't want that to hold up the report and I would be amenable to the report saying what you have and what you don't have. I mean, certainly nothing should come to us that hasn't been reviewed by county council and is not legally permissible. If, um, if costs aren't available yet, indicate that. It may, it may impact how we, how we vote. Uh, I think all of that information, Supervisor Sumidian, that you're requesting is, is important and certainly are things that we would need to know before we are approving direct projects, but I think we can come, I'll stop talking and see if that makes well, sense. Well, I've got a request out there to the maker and the seconder to include fees, fees, uh, direction to staff that the report come back with feasibility, legal, and cost analysis. I, I understand and am sympathetic with your caveat that it should not delay the return back. I sometimes resist people piggybacking on my referrals uh, what uh, <laughs> when I when I worry when I worry that they will have the impact of uh, of delaying the the expeditious um, so if I can get a yes to to, to the extent feasible if we can add that language sure okay but I will then go on the record as saying if somebody comes back with a recommendation in September and can't tell me if it's legal I'm probably not gonna be able to vote for it if they can't tell me is it feasible, practicable, doable, I probably am not going to be able to vote for it. If they can't tell me if it's, you know, something we can manage in terms of cost or what it's going to cost, probably not going to be able to vote for it. So I just think before we, you know, um, make decisions that have pretty significant ramifications, we need to do the feasibility analysis, the legal analysis, and the cost analysis. And I appreciate your willingness to uh, request that makes uh, sense. The I information. Um, where's OCLAM in this process, if anywhere? The OIR group? They were not included in this process. Can we refer your recommendation to them? I, I don't mind the extended listening process and the re-referral, essentially, to the uh, work group membership, but I, I do think we have a Office of Correction and Law Enforcement monitoring consultant on 
retainer for a reason. So I'll ask the maker and the seconder if they'll incorporate a referral to OCLEM for their response as well. I'm happy to have their opinion. I, I have some concerns about um, law enforcement um, monitoring being perceived as an arbiter of of um, alternatives that would specifically happen outside of of custody, but I have no problem with their taking a look and telling us what they think. If the seconder is in agreement, yes, I'll take I'm yes for an answer, yes. and I'll even resist the temptation to to have some dialogue. I on appreciate that. that. Thank you. No, I appreciate it back. Thank you. Seriously. And then um, let me just ask um, when. Certain items are indicated as having support from such and such a number of votes on each item. Um, I'm looking at packet page 534, which is the final ATI report, page 51 and page 52. So if you're looking at report page numbers, it's 51 and 52. And if you're looking at packet page numbers, it's 534 and 535. And you know, by my count, there there appear to be uh, 61 work group members. Did they all participate actively, or I mean, I know some participate more than others, presumably, or more robustly. But I'm trying to get a sense for whether all of these folks really stepped in and stepped up, or whether some sort of because you had a lot of meetings and you know and made an effort to be inclusive. As I look at the list. On average, there were, and again, this was uh, virtual Zoom meetings, on average, there were about eight to 12 active per work, per work group per session. Okay, so maybe half the folks participated. Does that sound right, about right, looking at the 23, 17, and 21 in each of the work groups? That would be fair. Okay, and when we get uh, an indication that a particular recommendation had, or strategy, I should say, forgive me, had 14 votes or 11 votes or eight votes, is that a vote that's taken of the particular work group or the entire membership of all three work groups? The entire membership at the end of the process. Okay, so I think you can see where I'm headed, which is, you know, strategy 3B, which has eight votes, that means that 53 people out of 61 didn't vote for it? Is that a correct assessment on my part? Yes, I can't speak at the moment to the number of people who showed up for the last yeah. uh, whole group session, but your math is about right. Okay, well, let me just say, I, I, you know, I ultimately the decision about what makes sense and what doesn't is going to fall to every individual board member to vote for or against something. But I do think um, that's noteworthy. I'll just let it go at that. Mm -hmm. All right. And Madam Chair, notwithstanding all that, I'm looking forward to voting for the motion. Thank you for the accommodations. <laughs> uh, appreciate it. I appreciate it as well. Supervisor Arenas. Uh, thank you. So I have a, a couple of questions, um, oh, actually just some suggestions. I know that um, Latinos um, and, uh, well, people of color in general, um, black and brown uh, people are typically the ones in um, our jail systems. And so I want us to make sure that we are culturally sensitive when we are asking for um, for it to for our, some of our strategies or recommendations to have place-based opportunities um, that we make sure that those are are culturally sensitive. Um, and then the other thing is part of the recommend one of the recommend one of the strategies was uh, to invest in additional crisis residential beds and facilities, treatment beds, outpatient slots, and affordable long-term housing. And so we saw that. Um, in a previous report, I know we are not seeing each other, Martha, but in a previous report, uh, we saw that I think there was only 21% um, of some of those beds, uh, of some of the providers that can actually take in folks who have this 
background. And so there's, there's n not enough beds. And I wonder how are we going to pull in this strategy um, into the m uh, monthly report that we have for behavioral health and so we can track that. The monthly behavioral health report is becoming quarterly? Right, right, in August, right, is the next one. Correct. Yeah, and so I wonder how we can um, bring this element into oh. that report and so that we can integrate these efforts a little more seamlessly um, because if this is one of the strategies that ends up being part of the implementation, once it goes through some of the process, you bring back the implementation plan, we check to see if it's feasible and, and all that good stuff. Um, I think there's there's an opportunity for us to put it on um, our the way that we monitor <laughs> our behavioral health um, uh, movement and progress. And so I think that we should think about how we integrate um, some of these elements um, because I don't know that we really talked about um, the intersection of this item and the previous item that we had. So um, I'm hoping that we can work behind the scenes. I don't think that we, it needs to be part of a motion, um, but, or unless you would like for it to be part of a motion, I just would love for us to think about how we are going to um, bring some of these elements together. I, I love the idea that we're talking cross sector and cross service. I would feel more comfortable if, if we could wait until October to the next quarterly report because I'm afraid in August there just is not sure. going to be no, it, enough. It, that, that absolutely makes okay. sense. And we, we know that there's something that's already, that there is a need um, uh, for those beds in that other report. This is obviously right. a strategy that they thought of separate from that report. They have no idea what that report looks like, but obviously they're, they're telling us what, what the RAND study found to be true, which is there's just not enough beds, and that is also um, pivotal to the success of folks um, uh, so that they could uh, have their reentry back into their lives. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to ask is if um, the maker of the motion would consider bifurcating um, one of the items uh, that uh, were included is uh, the Oakland Review. I don't necessarily agree with that portion of that, and so I'm happy to support the overall motion with um, the two elements that you've mentioned, um, President Ellenberg, and then the feasibility, legal, and financial um, review, but I don't see um, the role of Oakland in this as, as something that's crucial and that should, I think it's, it doesn't make sense to me, so I, I won't be supporting that piece and I'm hoping we can bifurcate that. Let me turn to um, May, may I address Council? Supervisor Reynos' first uh, question just briefly, please? Of course. So you make a great point, and I should have mentioned that in the beginning, in that we did, with regard to diversity, we did um, involve the Office of Diversity, Equi Equity, and Belonging in a review of the recommendations. And I see that, that work continuing through the summer when we look through the, uh, every single recommendation and strategy. So thank you for bringing that up. Th thank you. And I'm sorry we have to look through. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I sat in the wrong place. <laughs> I think the newcomer always gets the seat, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see if we can bifurcate that. Uh, James, how do you recommend we pull out? I'm because I'm I'm open to doing that um, as well. Remove the OCLAM request from Supervisor Simidian from the main motion, but perhaps he can yeah, make I mean, it it's just as a, a motion. As um, an additional or a second motion? You just motion vote on them as two separate motions. All righty. Easy cheesy. That's a legal term as well. Of yeah, course. Very I recognized it. Thank you. That's all? Okay. Um, back to Supervisor Lee, then Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, President Ellenberg, and on your good work on, on pushing this uh, very important uh, uh, topic uh, for all these times. Uh, and I also want to thank staff, um, Martha and your staff, for the amazing work working with so many uh, stakeholders uh, putting this report together. Um, 
One of the things that we're doing today, of course, is to look at how we could find alternative to incarceration and lower the number of those in our current jail. And some of these recommendations looks like it would take a while to implement. We'll have the report coming back in September. Uh, and I do think that there has been some proven strategies that worked during COVID um, that may not be in our jurisdiction, but something that we should look at and has been spoken today by many of the speakers. And I'm going to reiterate those today. Number one, the zero bail policy that reduced the jail population to below 2,000 at one point. Uh, is this something the administration can collaborate with our courts to potentially find a way to work with uh, even the DA's office to reinstate or increase the number of zero bail um, to reduce the number of incarcerations simply due to poverty, not due to the actual flight risk or danger to society? So that's one. I'm going to look to Dr. Smith to uh, yeah, the, the respond courts to that. The courts set the bail policy, oh. so we certainly can encourage the courts and we have encouraged the courts to leave the zero bail policy in place, but we don't have the ability to mandate it. Um, we are in the process of doing a so-called stress test where we have the courts, county administration, public defender, DA, and others um, involved in looking at our processes because <clears throat> we are one of the slowest counties in terms of time from arrest to times of adjudication. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we can improve that and get people out of the custody system who ultimately will not be um, incarcerated and or convicted as fast as possible. But it does require the coordination of the courts to do the zero bail. Great, so this is something I'm gonna ask the administration to encourage to yes. work with the courts on this one number. And the second one, probably similar, is the issue of no mandate for arrest warrants. This is the case when people basically miss their court dates, they could then be presenting themselves at the court's clerk's office to schedule their court date and not having to be booked into the jail due to a bench warrant for no show. I heard we had such a version of this during the pandemic, and so I would like the administration also to work with the courts on trying to see if we could implement this, or, or if this is something um, that's still in place and we can continue to support these efforts. Again, that's really up to the court, um, and uh, it also has to do with a recommendation from the district attorney, um, depending on the particular seriousness of the underlying crime, um, but we can certainly talk with them and try to encourage them. Do, uh, James, do I need a motion for these two items uh, to ask staff to proceed on doing these things with the courts? Well, I think it could be incorporated into the current motion or sp split off as a separate item. I mean, these are both just... Um, um, request to continue to make requests of those bodies recognizing that they have independent authority in that area so but would the maker of a motion be willing to accept those as friendly amendment as a request look I, I support both of those those things that you want to happen I, I'm not sure how useful it is to um, to direct engagement where we don't have um, purview, but I'm certainly, and I know they're already engaged. If you'd like perhaps a, a formal letter from the executive to the courts stating our board's support for those um, That's policies. a good start, yeah. I, I don't, actually don't know if we have the full board support for those. Okay. So it's, Let me ask. I think we're getting a little muddied, and I'm, and if you don't mind, I think I would be more comfortable if you would continue to have those conversations, um, see where they are, what they're doing, what the engagement um, already is, and then maybe come back with, with sort of a fleshed out, uh, perhaps a resolution um, or, or a letter for the board to sign on to looking at a number of, um, of the debug recommendations with some analysis of what's, 
what the county can do and where we might offer encouragement. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I don't want to put in another report. I don't want staff to spend more time until September and all that. I'm trying to do, to do this <laughs> fast. <laughs> well, you want me to do it myself from my office? Yeah, sure. I, for that. Yeah. I, I'm happy to do it. Uh, I just don't want to slow down the process because, as I said, sure. this is something that we can implement very quickly. I agree. Uh, and but so, we can't implement it. So I just, I'm, I will incorporate it and let the. Let the staff decide how to engage the courts. How's that? Well, why don't we incorporate a request that, no, you know what? I'm, I'm so sorry because that's going to take us down an entirely new conversation mm -hmm. that we haven't agendized about whether everyone on this board supports that. So I, 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 I am. So you think the new referral will be better since it's not agendized? That. Okay, I'll, I'll just put in a new referral then. Excuse me. Thank you very sorry. much. Can I jump in? Sure. Please. Um, I would suggest you <clears throat> vote on the motion before you, and we'll take your commentary as sufficient directive to discuss what we've been <coughs> discussing in the uh, stress test with the courts. Okay. I could do with that. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Sumidian. Yes, I wonder if I might ask that if we're going to bifurcate the motion so that the OCLEM reference uh, referral, excuse me, I should have said, if the OCLEM referral uh, is a separate item, could we vote on that first? Because if there isn't at least a majority of the board that supports that, I won't be able to vote for the main motion. Happy to take that first. No, I just, I'm oh. pointing over there and I do have further comments. I'm a little confused. Maybe I'll ask Martha to straighten it out. In the uh, report from the um, consultant, it lists OCLAM as a participant in the reentry component of the, the uh, issue. So I don't, seems like they're already in the game. Uh, that, it's not the OCLAM, it's the Citizens Committee to CCLAM. CCLAM. Oh, okay. Can I, James, can I just see clarification on the on the motions? Is this, as I as I understand, Supervisor Sumidian's most recent comment? It's a motion to amend the underlying motion to include the o the Oakland referral. No, that was what I had initially agreed to to incorporate that in the main motion, Supervisor Arenas ask to pull that and make it a separate motion. I strongly support that and I'm happy to uh, agree to take it out of, out of my <coughs> primary motion. And then Supervisor Simidian I requested that we vote on sending this to OCLEM prior to voting on the, the larger motion because it will determine how he votes on the larger motion. I'm, I'm just seeking clarification if that second motion was an amendment to the underlying motion or just a separate item. Through the chair, if I may. Please. <laughs> um, first, let me say I'm just a little concerned we're awfully far afield from a simple mm -hmm. receiving of a report. Second, let me say I appreciate the um, effort to have Supervisor Lee pursue his um, concerns on a separate path. Um, uh, next, let me say, um, I appreciate the fact that we have a motion that got a little complicated because we had a uh, request from various board members to incorporate things, and I think the maker and the second were very generous of spirit in incorporating those. One of the things that I asked for was to refer the recommended plan that is coming back to us, the same document that Supervisor Ellenberg had said, please make sure it goes back to the work group membership before it comes to us. I had said, could we also make sure it goes to OCLEM before it comes to us? Um, and she and the seconder agreed to incorporate that direction. Supervisor Arenas, as I understood it, said, 
she could not support that referral, but would, and therefore would like to have the opportunity to vote against that piece of it, which I certainly understand. I've made the same request many times on other matters. And then I asked, could we please vote on that separate motion prior to the main motion um, so that I'd know whether or not when I was voting on the main motion, OCLEM was going to have the opportunity to comment. I think that makes it admittedly, long-windedly clear. Yes? Yes, th thank you. I just I was just seeking clarification because I didn't know if it w if it was an amendment or a separate motion. It sounds like thank it's a you. separate motion. It, it's now a separate motion, as I understand it, and I will just speak briefly by saying um, it's called the Office of Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring because they have expertise in corrections. And since we're talking about alternatives to incarceration, I think they are an ideal group. Uh, to weigh in. Not the only group, obviously, but one where I think they're going to have some experience from other jurisdictions around the state, possibly even around the nation, that would benefit us from hearing. If you'll need a second, Supervisor. I think I don't need a second. I think you agreed to split it off, but it didn't need to be a se separate motion. I made as a separate motion. If it's a separate motion, does it need a second? I'm not seconding it. If it's a separate motion, it does need a second. I'll second, second it. Thank you. <laughs> it's a day. All right. Um, are we ready to vote? Is anybody not ready to vote? Okay, one more issue. Supervisor Lee is not ready to vote. Since we're also talking about alternative to incarceration, uh, I've mentioned this many times about this concept of the deflection center. Uh, we know that the reentry and Mission Street Recovery Station have certainly played a huge role in providing these services, but we ran it like a deflection center with expanded services of case managers, registered nurses, social workers, psychiatrists, detox beds, and direct referrals to ongoing services such as counseling, jobs, medical services, housing, all housed in one facility instead of stovepipes. I would like to have this fall under one of the recommendations um, that we discussed if this is something that would be um, acceptable to make a motion as one more issue to come back to us in I, September. I think it's, it's, it's too broad. That's, that's a big, important conversation. Supervisor Chavez can, raised in connection with the no entry center. And I think it's, it's so far afield of this receipt report, but if, if Let's see what oh, county can, can I just suggest for clarity, since we have a discrete motion on the floor, that we maybe vote on that motion and then go back to the broader underlying motion, just for yes, but he's asking the for clerk's it. purposes and everyone else. I, oh, I didn't understand. Jess. I understand uh, Supervisor Lee's comments to be related to the broader yes. main motion, motion not yes. the specific not the Oakland one. Oakland right. motion. Let's so my recommendation is to vote on the Oakland motion. Thank you. Okay. Thank and you. thank you for your patience, Jess. So hold that for a second, Supervisor thank Lee. Thank you. Um, can we vote on the uh, Oakland motion? Okay. Um, motion by Simidian, second by Lee, and this is specifically and solely to direct the report to um, the report that's coming back to the board in September for to Oakland for review. And comment. And comment. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas? No. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? No. That carries three to two. Excellent. And now um, to your question about including the, the information about a deflection in this particular report back, I, I, I don't want to do that. I, I feel that this report is getting so big and broad that it's not going to be able to come back to us in September, and it's, um, it's really hitting a lot of different topics. Um, but having said that, it is not at all because I don't think a deflection center or a no entry center or some combination of those is really critical, and I would recommend that we bring that conversation perhaps to FGOC as we are looking at um, since we're going to get the behavioral health facilities report now every month to us, that might be the place to, to raise that if that is something that appeals to you. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Are we ready to vote on the second motion? Let's do it. This is, um, I'm not going to restate the motion, but I made it. 
Supervisor Lee seconded it. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5-0. Thank you all very much. It's 6.05. I think we have some cold pizza waiting for us. And uh, we will resume at 6.35. I mean to today. They found me here.
All right, welcome back. It is 6.35, and let's take a, hi, Jan, Jess. Let's <laughs> do a, a roll call, please. Supervisor Arenas? Here. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Smidian? Welcome back. Vice President Lee? Present. President Ellenberg? I'm here. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you very much, and we are ready for item 16, which is the opioid settlement and bankruptcies expenditure plan. Welcome. Good evening, I'm Eric Riera. I'm the Deputy Director of Service Delivery for the Behavioral Health Services Department. And I'm here with several of my colleagues, so I'm gonna ask them to each introduce themselves, starting with Zoe. Good evening, President Ellenberg and board members. I'm Zelia Faria Costa, the Children's Director for Behavioral Health Services. Good evening, Ma oh, Madam President. I'm Dr. Sarah Redman with the Public Health Department. Good evening, board members. Good evening, uh, Laura Trice, Deputy County Counsel. We do not have a formal presentation this evening. Um, we did submit a um, report back to the board with several recommendations for use of the opioid settlement funds that the county anticipates receiving. Um, we currently have approximately $5.8 million in funds that have already been distributed to the county. And we have a set of five recommendations um, that we would like to present to the board this, this evening for um, your approval to move forward on. And I'd just like to take a moment to highlight each of those five recommendations. The first is an expansion of outpatient substance use treatment in our local schools with a focus on opioid use disorders. The second is an expansion of the distribution of naloxone kits and fentanyl test strips, including training throughout the county with a focus on public transportation, our library systems, schools and universities, working with the Bar and Restaurant Association, homeless encampments and distribution of kits, as well as our direct service providers in the community. The third area is an expansion of youth substance use disorder residential services, inclusive of residential services for youth with opioid use disorders. The fourth is an expansion of our partnership between the Behavioral Health Services Department and our Public Health Department um, to include data analysis and data support to ensure that we're making data-driven decisions um, and evaluating the effectiveness of our proposed interventions. And finally, support for a public communication campaign to get the word out about the types of services and supports that we're offering to the community um, through a variety of different communication channels. And with that, I'd like to open up for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, Eric, we're, I should have mentioned at the outset, we're hearing 16 concurrently with item 29. Is there anything um, that you wanted to say that's the mobile opioid treatment clinic? I didn't have any prepared comments on that, okay. but I'll turn to my colleague, Dr. Rudman, to see if she has anything to add. Nothing specific, Madam President, just um, uh, we're working on bringing forth additional details uh, for the board to explain the existing resources as well as a timeline for how we may propose increasing those. Got it. Well, thank you all very much for the presentation. I will turn to Supervisor Lee, then Chavez. Thank you, President <clears throat> Allenberg. So we'll ask questions for both uh, 16 and 29 at this point, correct? Okay, uh, since we're doing both. So uh, regarding item 16, thank you so much for the uh, report. Always uh, excited to get more funds. Uh, and this specific case is from the uh, Oboid settlements from all the different uh, entities that settle with us between the Sackler family uh, plus all the other uh, uh, drug companies that were uh, at the time selling um, these opioids. Um, I 
definitely agree with the strategy you have laid out below uh, today, or those five strategies, and certainly looking forward for more direction based on the community feedback. Um, I do want to mention uh, three areas uh, to see explore further uh, in future reports. Uh, on this specific issue. Um, one is the prevention of the over-prescription uh, and ensure appropriate prescribing of the, the in consultation of dispensing of opioids. Um, the, I just want to say I, I myself uh, was at a situation when I came back from uh, the war zone in Iraq. When I saw the doctor, he was very uh, quick to give me a bottle of opioids. I looked it up and I said, I'm not sure, sure I want to take this stuff, which I turned out I did not, but I also found out later on the, uh, the effects of opioids. And I think I certainly could be a victim of something like this had I followed the instruction of what being prescribed to me, quote unquote, when I truly wasn't needing uh, that type of uh, uh, um, <clears throat> medications. Second is addressing the needs of pregnant and parent parenting women and their families, including babies with the neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, something that we are seeing more and more uh, these days because of the opioid issues. And also with working with local schools, I certainly would like to see if there's a way we could uh, work together um, to, to engage the youth directly. Because working with existing advocacy support groups that's led by, for example, the student body. Uh, on this specific issue because of all the <clears throat> opioids that uh, we are seeing or even fentanyl uh, in our schools these days. Uh, are these things that we could uh, look into, please? Yes, absolutely. And I would like to um, turn this piece over to Zelia Faria Costa. She oversees our children, youth, and family system at CARE to talk about the particular model that we're proposing to implement in schools because I do think it addresses your question around engaging youth directly, and we're proposing to use a peer model, which you can talk a little Perfect. bit more about. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Supervisor Lee. So um, the program design for this expansion really is gonna have a big focus on the use of peer support um, workers that will be located at the school sites to really focus on that outreach and engagement of young people. Uh, we understand that that is a best practice, and making a referral is not sufficient to get a youth in services. So we really need to spend the time and be thoughtful about how we work with young people, providing that time of engagement with them, and then a warm handoff to a clinician that could do the, the treatment services. The peers will also work with administration, school staff, um, our schooling services coordinators, school social workers, parents, anyone you know who um, is in need of some psychoeducation or wants to engage in them uh, to learn about the services. So they'll provide that role as well and provide the consultation to teachers. Uh, but really the big piece and the most important piece here is really the engagement with young people at schools. Thank you so much, I certainly agree. That's uh, exactly what is needed. And I think the peer uh, aspect of it is so much more effective with uh, young people. Um, on item number 29, um, regarding the mobile opioid treatment services um, plan that we put together, uh, I would like to ask the administration to please make sure there are also cost breakdowns for the implementation of this program um, and also the treatment models used by other counties um, as a comparison um, or even other states. Uh, although knowing how we can, you know, Break out these programs together. I would certainly like these cost breakdowns for the mobile opioid treatment centers as a standalone model and not just being part of the existing programs we have currently. Opioid addiction is a very complex and sensitive issue that requires dedicated attention and specialized care. So by keeping this, um, these mobile opioid units alone, uh, they can prioritize the primary function of delivering the comprehensive addiction treatment and support services without distractions or dilution of other resources. And additionally, the standalone units also provide a discrete environment where the patient can feel more comfortable uh, and more privacy potentially to access these treatments. Any comments on, on these uh, ideas? <laughs> I was certainly happy to look at those different models and include them in our report back in September. Okay, so if that's the case, uh, 
President Elmbrook, may I make a motion to incorporate these comments? I'll second it, and then I'd like to weigh in. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Thank you, um, and thank you very much for the work. I, I do, um, you know, just a couple things. One is that whether it's a mobile model or a pure model, I, I think the point, uh, Zelia, that you just raised about being able to demonstrate that whatever actions we take are um, evidence-based, and where they're not evidence-based, if they're experimental, that we just call it that, because in some ways, especially dealing with um, youth, we, we have a different, we have a, a competing problems relative to op opioids and fentanyl. One is the overall um, extremely addictive nature of, of uh, opioids, and then the other is just the high risk of death w of poisonings. And so in some respects, I think um, Supervisor Lee and I are talking about two different challenges that we're trying to address, um, at least from the research I've seen thus far, that a number of the deaths are not necessarily related to young people being addicted, but young people having access to counterfeit medication. So I see that you're trying to do a lot of, trying to address a lot of different um, angles. So he, here are the, um, here are some questions that I would like to make sure uh, get answered when this comes back in September. First, if we're using a peer model I'm going to assume that a peer-based uh, program is rooted in um, drugs writ large and not simply opioids. And the reason I'm presuming that is that for a peer mentorship model to work, it, that it would have to be um, address broad enough issues and really almost be on both the preventative as well as the engagement side. At least that's the experience that I've had in the literature that I've read. So I'm, I'm very interested in understanding what, how the peer model works in terms of getting treatment vis-a-vis -vis addiction, how the peer model works relative to prevention or intervention, which I think are pre somebody having an addiction versus young people needing to understand that there's a high level of risk taking counterfeit medications, period. So that to me needs to be weeded out a little bit and would request that that is, that we, that you've dug into that enough that when it comes back we, we would understand what the, what the primary purposes are and if it's, rel and, and also relative to addiction in general. I'm sure that's something you're already thinking about. Any thoughts about that? I think you, um, Supervisor Chavez, thank you for the, the comments and the question. I think you raised really good points related to this. What we really want to be seeing with uh, this peer model that we're implementing uh, with the expansion of substance use treatment services is really for the engagement piece. The services will be provided by the clinician. But the engagement so to what end? engagement to, to treatment services. So we, we're, so the program would be designed so that a peer mentor would be available on a campus for a young person who's suspected of it having an addiction issue? Right, answer questions, be there, really do that outreach piece because what we see is uh, at schools, we see that we get a lot of referrals from teachers, from parents, from concerned staff but those referrals don't materialize into actual treatment services oftentimes. And the reason for that is because it takes a lot of time and energy, if you will, uh, to really bring the young person to a state of readiness where they really are ready to start working on what it is that they're dealing with or dealing with or being challenged by. So the peer support would be someone that would be sort of like alongside them to really um, talk about risks, uh, to talk about opportunities. And, it, and like you said, it's, it has to be broader than, than substance use because young people are coming in to the counselor, to their teachers, for a variety of different reasons. So it, it really is to have that presence there with young people that they can actually start talking about what's happening in, in their lives. Uh, and identifying the resources that are needed, one being 
substance use treatment services. So I, I think that is a, it's interesting and one that needs to be really vetted. Um, I'm, I, and let me just say why as it relates to opioids specifically. Um, the research to date demonstrates that when, when treated with medication, because we can treat opioid addiction with medication, that medication is the primary um, uh, tool used to address uh, addiction, not counseling, oddly enough, which means that we, whatever system gets set up needs to address the, the literature as it relates to what we know works now. And what that also means is that we're not necessarily looking at expanding or the need for uh, behavioral health services, but more the medical services. And so what I would like you to think about as this comes back is whether or not we have the proper investment for pediatricians. Because what I'm very nervous about, and, and actually one of our doctors that sits on the... Um, the, uh, the working group that we have dealing with fentanyl has made really clear, and I've, I've kind of discovered it myself as I've been talking to more of our folks who work on it within the county system, that we really don't have enough pediatricians who are um, trained or comfortable dealing with um, addiction, and that means two problems. One, we don't have pediatricians talking to parents and kids at a young age around risks relative to drugs, alcohol, and other things, but second, if, in fact, we know that children will have, or young people have more success um, with, a, you know, a, medic, a medical response, and we, we don't have a mechanism in our system to get them connected to their pediatrician and to make sure that pediatrician has the training they need, that's really an area where I want to make sure that we have the, the, the support we need to get the kids the help they need. So, as, so that's for me, something I want to see come back, a deep dive into how that peer mentoring works, what its bandwidth is going to be and all of that. But, but as importantly, when somebody has an addiction, are we able to get them to a service that, that actually exists that is responsive to opioids? There are some drugs I know that we don't have a medical response to, right? Meth is an example of that. So that requires a different, a different approach. And and back to the point you raised about peer mentors, I actually have a lot of confidence in them relative to educating young people, because I think young people, you know, if you're 17, someone's 22, they're practically dead to them because they're so old. So I, I get the, the peer side of that. And I will tell you, with my um, work on plan, with Planned Parenthood, the peer mentoring programs they did there were phenomenally successful in making sure that people got to medical appointments and also to um, education, just straight up information that wasn't, you know, fake information. So I, I'm really excited about that, but I, but it needs to be refined in a way that, in my mind, really deals with it, what it is we intended to deal with. It's either the prevention, intervention, or dealing with addiction. And then I'd like to see us have some investment with our own pediatricians, like education, an opportunity for them to be able to engage because this is a, I, because I think it's such a significant issue. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I, I actually think that what you're describing is our continuum of care, you know. And you know, I'm talking about that phase one, that initial phase with our peer mentors to do the engagement, and then moving them on to treatment, outpatient treatment, and then when needed and if appropriate, we do the medication-assisted treatment and we are collaborating with our addictions medicine division uh, where we actually can have either outpatient or inpatient induction for Suboxone for the treatment. But um, just, to, just to press back on this, because I hear what you're saying, but let me, let me say something back. We, we have, Sherry earlier today talked about, and she's totally right, that we have a problem with expanding the, the amount of counselors and therapists and everything else under the sun. We have pediatricians today working in our system who could be trained and educated to assist us in addressing people who are, or children who are at risk or children who are already addicted. This means that you've got a primary, we've got a primary doctor and we've worked really, really hard to make sure that every child in our community is accessing their primary care physician. So what I'm really wanting us to do is not overdo or redo or undo, but to take where we have strength now, invest in it, train, 
and educate. And you know, I, if we're already doing that, I, I, honest to Pete, I do not have evidence of that. I've talked to our own medical professionals. This isn't me just making it up. It's I've talked to them, and there's discomfort, there's concern, there's, and then there's just a lack, a delta of, of education, and we, I think we need to address that. So part of what I want to see is this resource going to that. So I'll look forward to uh, learning more uh, from you on that. The second. Um, colleagues is we do need to make sure that we have enough Narcan or Naloxone available and I want to make sure that that's robust and clear and that this is broken out in terms of how we're going to spend it and how how we're going to make sure that resource gets out to the community because you know frankly we need to be on buses bars restaurants and I want to see that outreach plan that gets us gets us there and then um, Another issue that I thought was interesting was the uh, the online tools about being able to look at hotspots and you know really, I I really think that's a thoughtful idea and one that I think will serve us well if it's a really good program. I've seen, you know, LA is doing some really interesting work there. Um, I usually say beat LA, but not in this instance. It would be it might be worth us taking a look at at what they're doing and again as a basis for you know, what we can layer on relative to the kinds of risks we see with, with drug abuse and drug addiction. So I'm, um, they have a, LA has, um, I think it's uh, LAO Preven LAOD Prevention. So if you wanna take a look at that. And then lastly, colleagues, um, I just wanna talk for a moment about communication. So I had my staff reach out to you all and say, what are we doing on communications? And I'm, I'm gonna just say what I worry about, which is we do an RFP and we get the same folks who are experts in public health and help us with posters and the like. The world has changed. People don't look at information the same way. And, and we, if our target audience is folks younger than 30, we've got to be looking differently. And so there's two requests that I have that I'm gonna ask staff to investigate. One is there's a national um, a group working with the Ad Council, and they're doing a good job, I think, of really trying to look at opportunities for uh, communication that I think are a little newer, a little more vibrant. And, um, and I'll ask my office to send over to you, um, one of the members of that committee is a, a person who's on our task force who lost a child to um, uh, fentanyl uh, poisoning. And, um, and he runs an organization called Song for Charlie. So I'll, I'll get you his contact information because I think I'd like to see us using what's already out there, especially if it's something that works because the amount of money being set aside is so little, really, for education. It'll go like that. And if we can pay for content, I mean, you know, pay less for content and more for getting the information out, the better. And then the other thing I'll just say, and colleagues, I apologize if you've heard me say this, but when, when Jeff Rosen and I went out to talk to the community about fentanyl and the, the counterfeit pills, I was curious about how many people even knew that was a risk. And what I was both surprised and impressed with was that we found two groups of people, people with lived experience who knew um, what they were taking was dangerous. And even one person we met, their dealer gave them naloxone, which is horrible and good in a whole bunch of different ways. But when I asked people, when Jeff and I were asking people how did they know what the risks were, almost all of them pointed to TikTok and they pointed to authentic content. A parent talking about losing a child, a young person talking about losing a friend, and how it happened, and a, a young person explaining to adults how their kids were getting access to counterfeit pills. What that tells me is there's enough authentic content out there, and I think people want, listen to what's real, and listen to, a, back to your point about peers, Zelia. So I wanna see whether or not we can engage um, whoever helps us in promoting authentic, real information that the public will respond to. And I don't think we have to spend a bunch of money. I think, I mean, I, 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 to a person, they could help me find what it was that got their attention on the phone, on their own phones. They showed me their own videos, the videos that moved them most. All of them were on 
TikTok or um, I don't actually know the other thing I saw it on, but it, TikTok was one of them. So please let's look at authentic information and please let's look at whether or not that budget can be increased. No, it wasn't Instagram, it was you know, maybe Snapchat or something, but, but what was interesting to me is that they found these stories because the stories found them and they were compelling to them. The other group were people who didn't know it all until they lost someone. No parent, not one that we talked to, had ever heard of counterfeit pills. No, nope, not one. And they're, these were folks who lost their kids. So I, I think I really want to look at what's authentic, and I also want to look at what we see out in the world and curate it ourselves and spend the money in a way I think that would be more effective. So I, I would just ask if, if those ideas could be included as you do your research and as this comes back, um, requesting both that it come back with a work plan and a budget so that we can better understand how you're going to proceed. And as it relates to, Jesse, I'm doing this so you don't have to listen to 20 minutes of me, um, that we're really understanding the peer mentor um, uh, framework, that there's a component of this that educates um, pediatricians, particularly in our own system, and that we're responding with evidence-based approaches that deal specifically with opioids so that we can be incredibly effective at addressing that. And if we're doing something broader, that we understand how our programs are going to scale that give us the flexibility to be responsive. As part of acceptable, the acceptable to the motion maker. Thank you. Thank you all for your work. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I don't know who on the team or Dr. Smith or, but I just, uh, you know, I appreciated the reference to evidence based. Um, looking at page three of the report, packet page 472, there's a statement that high schools will be prioritized based on the current high risk area map, which includes a substance abuse risk indicator to increase on site support. I'm just concerned that that not exclude schools or school districts that may not be on the map if there is an evidence based problem there. Can somebody give me some assurance on that? Because if, if uh, my recollection is that the high risk area map is not specific to opioids or fentanyl or drug abuse, that that's, as it says here, that there is a substance abuse risk indicator, but that's just a part of the, of the high risk area map. Am I remembering that right? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Smith, for that question. The high risk area map is based on, I think, six or seven risk factors, one of them being substance use. Um, but it, it does not preclude, you know, um, schools from all over the county um, to be included if it's so indicated. So it's, it's that r particular risk factor is based on um, behavioral health data on substance use. Would the maker and the seconder be amenable to explicitly calling out the fact that that's not the only tool that can or should be used to identify areas of activity by our county? Yeah, I mean, you're expanding and I'm fine with that. Well, I, um, I think what you just told us is there are like five or six different um, factors and four or five of them may or may not have a connection to substance abuse issues. Did I get that right? I can cite them for you. So one is the substance use. No, no. Uh, it's okay. I just and I, I thank you. And I, um, you know, I think there are some things we know very much um, are are tied to those indicators. There are things that may or may not be. And going back to Supervisor Chavez's uh, exhortation that we do this in an evidence-based way, I'm just saying if there's evidence from some other source that there's a problem somewhere, I don't want to be bound by the language in this. I mean, let me, I'm just going to say it. I had to sit on a stage and listen to the parents of a dead youngster in Los Gatos, and I, I sit on the stage and listen to the parents of a dead youngster from Los Altos. Now, I'm doubting that they're on that high-risk area map, 
but both of those schools would tell you they got a problem. And in fact, as you know, I think, they were part of the program because our behavioral health folks and our public health folks sought them out to identify the fact that the problem was real and it was in those communities, that it wasn't someplace else. So I just wanna make sure we're not inadvertently leaving out folks who need the help. If they don't need the help, or excuse me, if they are not the highest priority, I'm not suggesting that we should, you know, just put the resources there. But if there's some other tool or indication or evidence that tells us that the problem is there, I wanna make sure we haven't un, un, um, unintentionally narrowed the, the criteria we use in a way that leaves them out. That's all. Maker and seconder. That's fine. Seconder was me. I, I'm comfortable with that. What, one thing, Zelia, I would ask is um, in the final report, when this comes back to us, I would list all the factors. And one other recommendation I would make is that, ironically, um, Ironically, I think one of the challenges we're gonna have is finding a way to prioritize what is such a great need because the truth is that my guess would be this, the at least one of the two schools you talked about would absolutely be very high on the list uh, based on our past experience with the school. As it, I mean, so I think both listing the list and um, the, you know what you're d using to determine, and then the other thing I wanted to add just to what you said, um, Supervisor Smithian, that I think is really also emerging is that one of the reasons I think the idea of creating the um, the website that looks at at the um, at the kind of the hot spots is, and just to use this as an example. In your district, we saw a really high number of um, suicides in high schools, you know, for a while. And and so, as I think about how we're measuring the overall health of youth in our community, one of the reasons I'm excited about this kind of hot spot map is I think it's going to allow us to overlap all of the different indices that will help us understand better um, risk factors. Because I think in the past we would think of them as income, ethnicity. I think as it relates to drugs, it's a whole different ball game. And so, so, I, so anyway, I would just include it, Zelia, and then also to, to just think a little bit about how that map that we're looking at, you know, and I'm looking at really at Dr. Redmond because I think this is where you all knock it out of the park in terms of data and information and research because I think it's gonna help us understand the health of, of the youth in our community. So thank you. What she said. <laughs> Supervisor Lee, your, your light is still on. Anything no, else? No, I just want to uh, agree with uh, Supervisor Samidian's uh, uh, perspective on this. Uh, as we all know, in terms of drug issues, uh, oftentimes drugs are far more available sometimes as some of the uh, wealthier uh, districts or private schools because the kids there have the ability to pay to buy these products, and that's why there are dealers over there as well. So I think it's important to use those uh, uh, other metrics to, to make sure that we are able to cover everybody who needs this help. And then, uh, and I, as I say, you know, I, I've said this on dais before, my own first cousin uh, suffered all, over the over a the couple of years ago, uh, and, and you just don't know where they are. So it's so important to make sure that uh, these resources and outreach is, is, is really everywhere. And also echoing the, the point that the Supervisor Chavez has made, um, the, the drugs are changing so fast. Uh, I have never seen things has gone this quickly. Fentanyl just showed up two, three years ago and so prevalent. Now we have this tranquilizer stuff from the vet's office, the tranks out there, which unfortunately the, the, the Narcans don't even work on those. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff out there, and frankly, I don't think the parents or even students will really know what's in the stuff. And so I think the real stories that you are able to find um, online and whatnot, I, I think it's so important to get these words out there. And not necessarily, I believe in <laughs> a lot of the stuff on TikTok of issues, but I really do think if we could harvest the good ones, uh, whether we use social media or whether we actually use, you know, traditional media, put on CNN or whatever other channels that people watches, uh, 
I think it's important to get the word out there because it, 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 the things are moving so quickly that I don't think a lot of parents and families know what the kids are doing. Let's be honest, I have three daughters. Do I really know what they're doing every day? I must be kidding. All right, thank right. you. Yeah, thank, you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the, uh, um, the comments of, of all of my colleagues, and, and truly I have nothing to add except to say all of that. Uh, to all of you, thank you again. I really appreciate the thoughtful revisions that have been made since the January committee reports, as well as other strategies uh, beyond the use of opioid settlement funds in our substance use uh, treatment expansion that we talked about in item 14. Um, I just, this isn't direction, I just um, wanna verify because I think this is happening that any necessary updates relative to these five strategies should be rolled into, the, into some existing quarterly reports either to the full board on SUTS activities overall or to uh, CFSC on the, on the CYF system of care on youth specific strategies. Do you wanna give yes, me a nod absolutely. or acknowledgement that that's what's happening? Yes, for sure. Perfect, thank you so much. Do we have public speakers on this item? We have one virtual request. Okay, nobody in chambers? Correct. And if anyone else on Zoom is planning to speak on this item, now is the time to raise your hand. When the first speaker begins, the queue will close. We're up to two requests. All right, let's give it another second then. Steady at two. All right, let's have the first one begin. Thank you, Jess. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I continue to be impressed with uh, Supervisor Lee's range of knowledge of the issues. The opioid crisis was caused by the Sackler family. These were dope dealers that, that, that were the producers of Oxycontin, which was the precursor to fentanyl addiction. And they never did one day in jail, not one. Secondly, one of the main producers on the streets and facilitators of fentanyl is the San Jose Police Department. We have an international drug ring operating out of the San Jose Police Department. We cannot forget about that. So when we're, when we're looking at that, we have to just be, have the humility to be honest about what the issues really are, if we hope to create policies to address them. This is very simple. And, and what, what the, the role that I play in my community in this, in this context is to push that, is to constantly, constantly push that because I'm pushing against a bureaucratic system that actually with the Indian system denied my humanity. They denied my humanity. And they created systems to relegate my existence to very base levels. That's what redlining and poverty is about. And so I would ask that, that, we, that we also use Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That way it cuts out like the bureaucratic language because that stuff has already been done. Look at Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it tells you the system that you don't get to self-actualization until all of these other base needs are met. So we're really trying to invent something that we already have. Let's stop wasting time with that and start instituting policy that creates real change in our communities. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Montiel. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, can you, can you hear me? We can. Okay, yeah, my name is David Montiel and uh, my supervisor is uh, El uh, Susan Ellenberg. Um, you know, when I was thinking about this topic, um, I noticed on the, not this website, but the County of Santa Clara website, they were having a survey to find out, okay, uh, should drugs, uh, should uh, basically marijuana be allowed in high schools? Why are they having that survey? Why are they having that survey? I don't think it is allowed in schools right now, right? So if we really want to be honest about it, right, unless, I, unless I'm just wrong about the people can smoke pot in high school, uh, we have to be straightforward and we have to look at what the county health is promoting comparing to the county. And sometimes there's a disconnect in my opinion. And that Paul Soto guy, he has a lot of experience and I, I value his opinion because he's a very, very, uh, um, he has the 
the, the, the street knowledge as well as the head knowledge of what's going on with opioids and all that stuff. But to me, the thing is, is that when it comes to the treatment and everything, um, and so say somebody gets arrested for, you know, dealing opioids or, or they're on drugs. Well, part of that, part of it is, well, I didn't have a mic there, sorry. Part of it is, is that they, is, is, the, is the judgment that they've done something wrong and there is prison and there may even be, you know, uh, a certain fine or, you know, they have to go through, right? But it's to really to get them to think, hey, look, I don't want to be here. <laughs> I hate it here. I want to, I want to get treatment. And we need to have that up to the police department too, all the people and the counselors of the police department say, hey, look, we need to test you here. We need to help you uh, and have them accountable because if they just go in and out in a revolving system, that's where a lot of sometimes even shootings have come in the past. People just go in and out of a revolving system with no results. Thank you. That concludes our requests. Thank you very much. We have a motion by Lee, second by Chavez. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5-0. Thank you. Item 18 is our county executive's report. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, just two things to report on today. One is that um, earlier this afternoon, the um, revised recommendations for the budget hearings next week were posted online so everybody can look at them in detail. Um, and the second thing was I wanted to just uh, have us remember for a moment that 79 years ago today was D-Day and that was a day that 10,000 Allied troops uh, were casualties with 4,000 documented deaths and somewhere around 9,000 uh, Axis troops were killed in addition. Um, and because of that, World War II and the um, European venue began to come to a close. Thank you. I'm Questions for Dr. Smith? Supervisor Simidian. Well, just um, a reference to and a thank you for uh, off agenda report that uh, was released uh, at my request, I think, on um, May 26th. This was an off agenda report on the restrictive covenants program uh, that some of you will recall and you may or may not recall it, it drew my interest and attention. Um, I, th I think it's an important piece of work, uh, albeit pretty, pretty tedious uh, yes. work. And um, <clears throat> as I read the off agenda report, there essentially are two websites coming. Um, one uh, that is, you know, essentially a, an effort to upgrade the current program so that it includes the status and metrics for the project. I think that's a good thing and that should happen relatively soon. And then more uh, significantly perhaps is the development of a second website which will be um, designed to be more interactive uh, and that comes a little bit later. Uh, Dr. Smith and presumably your successor, Mr. Williams, I just wanted to exhort you all to make sure that the work that's being done by, I guess you call it ODOME, uh, the uh, Office of Data Oversight Management and Evaluation, um, have a mapping function because I think that will be in some ways the clearest way of communicating honestly and accurately what happened where. Uh, and I think that's important information to provide in the exercise. So could we maybe ask for a report back in December of this year through this venue? Sure. All right. <laughs> consider yourself I asked and I'll consider myself could have told that. sure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, County Executive Smith and County Council James Williams. Thank you very much. Item, yes, of course, Supervisors. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, following the comments of D-Day from uh, County Exec, I want to first say thank you to the County Exec's office, uh, along with her, his many uh, amazing staff in Chang for all the good work, working with our sister county commissions, hosting a very uh, uh, well-received visit from uh, the open world um, uh, group that came by from Ukraine. There were six of them. Uh, the delegations, they were very glad to be received with our um, flag raising ceremony that was uh, done right here at our county. Uh, a lot of moving moments that brought tears to people. So uh, especially in light of the fact that what type of war is going on right now uh, in Ukraine and, and just read in the news today that uh, there was suspected the sabotage by Russia to uh, bomb this um, dam that is causing a huge humanitarian crisis right now in Kherson, and uh, tens of thousands of people have to move out because of this potential flooding coming through and might even threaten the nuclear power plant uh, cooling system. So uh, the war is still very much real and alive, and I, th I just want to thank you, uh, Doc Smith, for, for your work in terms of what we engage with these uh, delegations, and hopefully we could continue to provide more assistance uh, to these uh, uh, future engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no other lights on, item 19 is the County Council report. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of June 5th, 2023. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Item 20 is preventative maintenance on county roads. Good evening, Harry. Good evening. Um, Let me just check President. with my colleagues. Is it your pleasure to hear a report first or to go directly to questions? Anyone? I, as one, I think uh, Supervisor Lee, you requested this and so I'll defer huh. to him. Thank you for that reminder. I, I don't think I need to hear a report. I do have a couple of questions, but um, I certainly want to hear from any of my colleagues uh, if there's any public who would like to address this issue before I ask the questions. There is one request online, no requests in chambers. Would you like to hear Please. the speaker first? Absolutely. All right. If there are any other uh, listeners hanging on with us on Zoom and you'd like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand now. The queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. We are up to two hands. Okay. Give it another second then. Item 20, preventative maintenance on county roads. We'll go ahead and open up for Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, thank you, Paul. Still up on the horseshoe. Um, there was a, an analysis done on the city level, and was within the context of racial equity and how that actually creates issues on roads. And what they found is is that in certain parts of our city, and I'm sorry, our county, when you do not use a racial equity metric, cars in the more affluent areas. These are people that can afford the kind of maintenance that is required for cars. Now, when you have other you know, residents in other areas of our city and county, and we all know what those areas are, these are people that are less capable of maintenance on their cars. And those are the roads that actually get neglected more. Now, when you extrapolate that over time, what this means is, is that the poorest people that have the least ability to four car maintenance are the ones that actually necessitate it more so because of the lack of equity within the context of road maintenance. I mean, I know this doesn't sound sexy or nothing like that, but this is the reality. This is, it, it, was, it was an excellent analysis that was done. And one of the neighborhoods that they used for that analysis, guess who? It was the horseshoe. And so they saw that like, like uh, Cambrian, you know, a uh, uh, Willow Glen. I mean, look at those roads. They are smoothly paved. And the reason for that is just, you know, I mean, we, we've normalized and institutionalized preferential treatment for affluent areas. So all I'm asking for is to keep that in mind because when we don't do that and don't keep that in mind, we are actually creating more of a financial burden for the neighborhoods that are least uh, equipped for that car maintenance, and we can do something about it. Our next speaker is David Montiel. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. 
Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, yes, uh, my name is David Montiel and Susan Ellenberg is my supervisor. Um, I, I agree with Paul Soto, um, definitely on the road situation. Uh, it seems like the more you get into the inner city, uh, uh, the more you get into downtown, downtown and other areas, uh, further in San Jose, I've noticed, you know, because I live in Santa Clara, but when I go to San Jose, I man, some of those roads are just awful, you know, big bumps. Uh, and then I, you go to other places and they look really nice. But another thing I wanted to bring up was, is um, in general, like uh, when you go traveling, I, I go, you know, if you go traveling somewhere out of this county, you know, and uh, either north or south, and you notice after a while, the roads seem to be a little, little nicer to me. <laughs> they just do. And then when we start to get into Silicon Valley, the head of the high-tech capital of the world, and even the bridges and everything, you start to go up over a bridge and boom, you know, it's like, uh, I'm sure Paul Soto can relate. You get over by 87 and all these other freeways, and you just, your car, you know, unless you've got a brand new one, it's almost doing an acrobat situation uh, when you go over a bridge and you come down. I don't know who thought of the having these slopes before you hit a bridge, but it's not good for cars. <laughs> I'm not trying to you know, laugh at or anything, but it's just actually something I've been wondering about because you go to other areas, uh, you know, north and south of here, you just don't see that. But for some reason, San Jose area, you know, 87, 280 south, uh, areas there, all around there, you'll see it. And it's like, wow, it, you know, it's like I've got to brace myself because one of the vehicles I have is older. I don't know, maybe I need new shocks. But I don't think it's just the shocks because I see newer vehicles doing the same thing. They're just, you know, it's like, hold on, you know. Uh, so I, I think that at some point we need to uh, realize and, and, and have the planning to really plan out where the roads are the same all around. Have them the same all around. And that shows real what you would call, I guess. That concludes public comment. Thank you. Um, back to supervisors for comments. Thank you. Yes, a uh, couple of questions. I'm ready for motion. Um, the first question is, uh, do we know when we can expect receiving those state and federal funds to address the road repairs, uh, especially for Highway 130, Harry? Well, yeah, they, those are all going to be reimbursable. The county road fund, um, uh, uh, a couple of Meetings ago, Supervisor Smithian asked that we add the $15 million, or excuse me, another $10 million to the total cost of the repair. We'll be repairing those roads with the uh, county road fund, and we'll be receiving um, the reimbursements from FEMA. Sorry, I moved too far away from my mic. Um, you, you have to certify the construction. It has to meet all the standards. It usually takes mm, up to four or five years. Um, it comes in in series and tranches. Um, but that's okay. We have the funding to repair it now. Okay. And then the um, second question I have is regarding the signage around uh, Mount Hamilton and Highway 130. Um, is it possible for us to go and make sure to update those uh, and reflect more up-to-date information? What we're hearing from the constituents is that many of the signs do not have information of when construction and road repairs are happening in the area. Yeah. Uh, and they've called us about sometimes they might not have reliable internet access. Yeah, we're, we're very clear on what's going on out there. Those roads are passable, and there's not going to be any closures. And in conformance with your uh, direction, at the last time I reported, we'll be giving them a, a minimum of two weeks' notice whenever we have to close the road for construction purposes. So we, we are going to follow your direction on that. We've got that clear, and there's no other notice to give. The roads are passable and open. Okay. I also communicate with members of that community frequently. Good, uh, thank ones you. Ones that are probably contacting your office. Right. And, and I just wanted to make a motion to receive a report and also incorporating my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. I see no other lights on. So let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5 0. Thank you very much. Uh, item 21 has been held to June 26th. That brings us to item 22, uh, which is an ordinance regarding campaign disclosure and board member disqualification. James, are you presenting on this? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Questions the board may have, this is the same item that has been in front of the board a few different times. There are no changes to the proposed ordinance. 
I can provide a quick FPPC update, which is that um, the FPPC still has not taken action on proposed regulations. I did want to note that to the extent that those regulations make any changes in any applicable definitions or how the Levine Act would apply, uh, this ordinance does not purport to and does not have language that seeks to define the scope of the Levine Act's application. For instance, it does not define participant or participant's agent. So uh, any clarity from the FPPC would automatically be applicable here as well. Happy to answer any questions. Supervisor Smidian. The penalty for a violation of the ordinance is what again, as noted in what section, please? One moment, I'll just pull it up. It's listed on page two of the ordinance and the uh, penalty would be a civil penalty of not more than $500. And am I remembering correctly that that uh, reflects the fact that the board indicated in its initial discussion on January 10th that we did not wish there to be a criminal penalty? That is correct, so there would be no criminal penalty. Okay. Um, colleagues, I, I know we still have folks who are hoping we can hold off on this, but I would respectfully um, recall that <coughs> we heard this item, and I give kudos to County Council for being on top of it, uh, January 10th, uh, just a week and a half after the amendments to the Levine Act took effect, um, because of concerns that were raised in the community, we uh, suggested amendments, uh, which meant the measure came back to us a second time on the 24th of January. And then at the request of uh, the board chair, we continued the item for a month. Uh, that took us to February 28th and the president requested that it be held until May 2nd, so that was the third time, and we continued it to the May 2nd meeting. That was the fourth time it was in front of us, and Supervisor Lee asked if the item could be held for another month, uh, and I think we've all been hoping for some guidance from uh, the FPPC, which has not been forthcoming. Uh, so now the item is in front of us in June for the fifth time, and I'm hoping we can take action tonight because um, let me go back to County Council. Um, Mr. Williams, uh, as I read the information you've provided us, as well as the underlying statute, um, we're in violation of the law and subject to criminal penalties as elected officials if we um, solicit or receive contributions from folks who are, quote, participants if they have a financial interest, uh, but unlike folks who are parties or agents, they are not under state law obliged to tell us that they are participants with a financial interest absent some action at the local level. Am I remembering this correctly from five months ago? That is correct. And colleagues, you will recall and I, I, I want to thank you all for your patience and I mean it sincerely because I, I know how tedious it is when I read off the 48 items in consent today that were subject to the Levine Act, but I have no way in the world of knowing who was a, quote, participant with a financial interest uh, if somebody doesn't tell me. Because Mr. Williams, my understanding is that if somebody sends a letter but I don't see it, they're still a participant and may or may not have a financial interest about which I have no way of knowing. Am I Correct in that understanding? They could be, yes. They could be. And similarly, if they've met with two of my colleagues to discuss the matter and they have a financial interest, that would make them a participant, but I might not know that they'd met with my colleagues. It, would that, does that make them a participant if they've met with a couple of my colleagues? Yes, if it relates to the item. Yeah. yeah. And. You know, we had, as I say, 48 items just this morning, and that was before we got to the ones on our regular agenda. So I, I genuinely empathize with the concerns that are being expressed uh, by folks who wish we could hold off, but I think it's pretty clear the FPPC is in no great rush to provide any guidance to anybody. And meanwhile, 
the law applies to us and we have to make a good faith effort to comply, which is why I keep reading my lengthy disclaimer. And um, Mr. Williams, if I'm remembering correctly, you've informed us that the court case that sought injunctive relief uh, was unsuccessful. So the, at least initially, the court has said law remains in full force and effect, yes? The, the case is still pending, but the request for preliminary injunctive relief was denied. Okay. Um, well, I just think if we're gonna make a good faith effort to comply, we need to ask, we need to have a vehicle by which people are obliged to tell us if they are in some way participants uh, with a financial interest. And if, I mean, I, I understand that they, they feel like that's a hard set of questions to ask and answer, but if the participants don't know, there's certainly no way we can, and which means we can't comply. So I'm gonna move approval of the recommended ordinance uh, in an effort to ensure our fullest measure of compliance uh, within the limits of the rather inartfully and not much clarified piece of legislation we're obliged to abide by. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, do other supervisors wish to speak on this item? <coughs> oh, the, perhaps the seconder of the motion. Thank you. I'll. I'll um, I just wanted, James. Could you just explain um, why the action that we're taking is? and maybe you did this, but just very simply why the action we're taking doesn't negatively impact some of the stakeholders that have been concerned about us taking this action today? Uh, sh sure, so the sp specific o ordinance that's in front of the board would require disclosure by participants covered by the Levine Act. Uh, the Levine Act itself imposes an affirmative disclosure requirement on parties and their agents, but doesn't impose the same disclosure requirement on participants and their agents, even though it applies the same recusal requirements to board members, whether you're dealing with a party or a participant. The definition of who is a participant or and who is a party and who is an agent is something that there's been advocacy to try to more narrowly define in regulation because the statute uh, includes broad language, uh, but that language is subject to formal rulemaking from the FPPC. And so there, there is a, a rulemaking process that may or may not ultimately provide some further refinement of those definitions. The ordinance picks up whatever those state definitions happen to be. So there's nothing in the ordinance that expands, contracts, or otherwise changes who is a participant, who is a party, or who is an agent of a participant or party. So I don't know if that was clarifying or not, but that I was trying to describe well, what Well, essentially, it just to refine it, that the, the definitional issue that so many of our our community members are concerned about is in the hands of the FPPC period. That's correct. And we would, the way that would impact any ordinance we have is that with the definitions, expansion or refinement, or um, then we would automatically be taking an action that aligns with, well actually we would take no action because it aligns with the definition from the FPPC. That's right, there's okay. no local definition of those terms whatsoever. I just wanted that to be clear. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Smitty, and you wanted to add Just in one more question. I, because um, we haven't, just haven't, or at least in my memory, haven't done one of these in a while. Um, because it's an ordinance, it requires a second reading. That's correct. Which presumably would be at our next board meeting on the 27th. Yes. So there is no impact until there's a second reading, and do I remember also 30 days has to pass? That is right. So the ordinance would be effective 30 days after second reading. So if the FPPC did take action in June since our next meeting is on the 27th, we'd have the ability to say, okay, hold it right there, or we want to change course. That's correct. Yeah, I, I'm not terribly optimistic that there'll be a sudden revelation of some consequence, but I, I think the, the fact that taking a first step doesn't bind us irrevocably or impose any duty on anybody until and unless we have the rest of this month go by is further convey. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, not seeing other lights, I will add a, a comment of my own. As an elected member of this board and a public office holder, I accept my responsibility to follow the state law regarding disclosure of contributions over $250. The proposed county ordinance does nothing to change that, nor does it add any further burdens on me. The state law is clear that anyone who violates the act is subject to misdemeanor penalties. Sections A3-34 and A3-35 of this proposed ordinance um, would create, in, in my eyes, an unnecessary threat of a civil penalty, penalty for participants, something that is not required by state law. I am in favor of adopting proposed section A3-36, as there have been serious questions regarding how the board would handle a matter on calendar where three or more members have disqualified themselves and put the, the quorum in jeopardy. This section would give us what I think is a good process to do that. Uh, but beyond that, I'm not willing to impose on members of the public additional responsibilities that the state did not see fit to impose. So in order um, possibly to affect that direction, I'd like to offer a substitute motion to adopt proposed ordinance NS-19.45 with sections A3-34 and A3-35 and any supportive whereas language for those sections deleted from the ordinance and keep section A3-36 and would look for a second. I'll second. Two seconds. Apologies, who did that go to, the second? It was a tie. <laughs> it's going to uh, Arenas, thank, thank you. you. Madam Chair, I wonder if I could ask the parliamentarian the county council question. Can we do that from a public notice and parliamentary standpoint? Yes, I believe the board could strike the delete those other provisions of the ordinance. Okay, and could I ask for the record that, so we know what we're voting on, which whereas clauses would be stricken? I'll be a no vote regardless, but I do think it's important to highlight what we're doing here. Japes, can you um, pull that up and read that to us, what the, um, the support of whereas language, anything that relates to A334 and A335? I think the cleanest thing would be to delete the first four. There's five whereas clauses and it would be to delete the first four, leaving as the sole whereas clause, whereas when board members are disqualified from participating in decisions concerning county contracts or other actions due to a conflict of interest or due to a campaign contribution related limitation, that disqualification can hinder the county's ability to conduct its business. I would leave that as the sole whereas clause. And uh, through the chair, if I may, the summary language, does that have any legal effect since it would now be inaccurate in its recitation? Yes, I would modify the summary language to say this ordinance est establishes the use of procedures relating to legally required participation in the event of disqualification of multiple members of the board or delegation of authority to the county executive when necessary. In other words, striking uh, the first part of the summary prior to the semicolon. Got it. Presumably that's the intent of the maker of the motion? Correct. Thank you. And um, in terms of numbering for our ordinance, is A336 properly numbered or should it be renumbered to be A334 in the absence of an A334 and A335? I'm genuinely trying to be helpful here before I vote no, Madam Chair. <laughs> I very much appreciate that. I would that. recommend renumbering it to A3-34. I believe that's the intent of the maker. It is indeed, seconder. thank you again. And then I have a question for the maker of the motion. And, um, and it's this. So if state law doesn't require a participant to tell us that they're a participant, but state law precludes us from receiving contributions from participants, 
how are we supposed to know that they're participants if they don't tell us? Because if I'm trying to abide by the law, which I'm trying to do, and I would assume all of us are, and you've certainly you know, laid that down as a foundation for the conversation, how are we supposed to know who is a participant and how are we supposed to abide by the law if somebody isn't obliged to tell us? So I think that's an excellent question. I think that it is one that is not answered yet. I don't believe that creating an ordinance would necessarily answer your question either in terms of uh, finding out who is a participant. One thing that we are doing that we're working on now that a number of counties uh, have already passed is a, is a form. Um, to, uh, County Council Lepresti isn't here. Uh, we, were, we spoke about it yesterday. Um, San Bernardino has a similar form, and this is attached. The, the, we are I, working I don't on a form, but speak without detail. But, but I, uh, is, we are working on a form that would be attached to contracts and other items. The form, um, and that was actually one of the reasons behind bringing this ordinance forward in the first place. The the folks who are involved directly in the contract would be the party or their agents. The, forms, the form is not going to be a, a useful tool to disclose participants. And we have we direct at the top of our um, agenda for participants we do request to disclose. We, we request, uh, we affirmatively request voluntary disclosure from participants. And, and I'm not suggesting that this represents clarity. What I am suggesting is that I am not interested in imposing an additional a burden on participants. The burden was placed on us, and we we do have the duty to figure this out. and And it is complicated. And I certainly hope that the FPPC um, will will lend some clarity. Uh, but at this time, my my motion stands and appreciate the seconds. I would like the minutes to specifically reflect the fact that I am a no vote on the substitute motion because I believe the substitute motion makes it harder, if not impossible, to comply with state law. And I'd like that in the minutes verbatim, please, because if and when there's a problem, I want it to be a matter of record that every effort was made to try and comply, but that we cannot comply without the information that we are obliged to have. And we can't get the information if nobody tells us. Enough said. Thank you. I'll be a no vote. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, are you on for the vote? Or yeah, you want to I, I can make a brief comment. Uh, frankly, I'm just very disappointed with that PPC uh, because we have been waiting for months for this guidance uh, to try to comply with this new Levine Act uh, and all these com uh, pro component. Uh, one issue that is still uh, not being determined is whether this uh, exempting uh, nonprofit volunteers and nonprofit board members from these contribution rules. So we're still waiting on these things. Um, I first want to say I really appreciate county councils and staff uh, for what you've tried to put together on this proposed ordinance. Uh, but you know, again, I, I think you, due to all these uncertainties of PPC, I, I think uh, less is more at this point in terms of what we're adopting. Um, so uh, thank you. Question? Thank you. Please. Is there a time at which board members who are inclined to support the substitute motion might be open to reconsideration? I mean, if we still don't have any clarity by December and we have lived for a year with an obligation to comport ourselves in a certain way based on information we don't have or have access to, would people be willing to reconsider then? I don't want to commit, but as you have taught me, every other Tuesday we have the opportunity to revisit anything we like. Supervisor Lee, I'm asking you directly. Oh, oh apologies. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to relook at this if this were to, uh, if FPPC give us some other guidance that makes sense, that we need to make changes, I'll be happy to look at this all over again. Sure. Yeah, I, all right. That, well, thank you. I just... Um, I'm going to keep reading my disclaimer, unfortunately, then every every two weeks as well, because <laughs> I feel like in the absence of any obligation to report the role of a participant, I 
need to make the good faith effort to suss out who a participant is or isn't by asking them to please sure. speak up. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, this needs a four fifths, right? No, this is a three. Oh, we can do a three. Okay, so um, you know, I I um, I really like the idea. Well, let me say two things. First, I wanted to say to Supervisor Simidian how much I've appreciated all along your the level of seriousness with which you've taken this, and that you've reminded the board and and council and all of us um, what an unfortunate, <laughs> to use one of your words, regrettable. Um, action that was taken by the state legislature that really has put local government in a quandary, and by the way, that's something that they did not apply to themselves, mm -hmm. so not to be overlooked. Um, I think, though, th th let me just say, I, I want to support this because I, I want to make sure we have um, something on the books, uh, you know, relative to how we proceed. However, um, I want to make sure that the, the issue about what information gets attached to contracts. I think that's actually a very good idea and what kind of a, you know, a, um, a form can be filled out prior to us voting on contracts, I think is really important. And, I, and one of the reasons, Susan, I appreciate you taking it down that path is that's really practical. Like one of the problems even with the, um, the motion, I mean, I'm sorry, the, what's in the um, original ordinance. Yeah, that even that doesn't guarantee that anybody knows anything. It just really says that we're saying out loud that our expectation is that this is a partnership with the community and the community we want the community to be aware and all that. But the real way to operationalize that anyway would be to have some mechanism to give information out to everybody who has contracts with us. And frankly, one opportunity we have is not only to add something new to the contracts, but one request that I would make colleagues is that um, that we annually um, share information with all contractors about the FPPC rule, um, not waiting for them to reach out to us, but actually sending out an email or a letter to them so that, uh, you know, so frankly that we are putting them on notice. And to me, that, that kind of deals with the more practical issue, which is wanting people in the community to know that they have an obligation. If I can just make make one comment um, and we can absolutely I think do that and I think both providing that notice and the form is very helpful in terms of the issue of disclosure by parties or their agents but I, I do want to be clear with the board that that's not a mechanism that's going to provide disclosure with respect to participants it just can't be because by definition a participant is not the contractor or somebody working for the contractor it's somebody else who may have a financial interest. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just want that to be clear so that there isn't any misunderstanding that the form is gonna disclose right. participants. So I think the, what I'm hearing as a really fundamental issue here is one of communication. We want people to know. I, I, I'm not feeling that they need to know or not necessarily would know because we have passed an ordinance that suddenly that changes the level of, of information. But I do think um, that, that we should give some thought and probably should have started thinking and maybe some have six months ago about how we communicate this um, you know, very technical rule, which is going to be hard to understand. Passing, you know, the ordinance wouldn't wouldn't necessarily it covers us a little bit, but wouldn't necessarily provide um, useful information. So, I would really welcome recommendations back um, to us as to what other mechanisms there are to usefully and in lay terms communicate expectations broadly. We can certainly do it with every political um, solicitation we make. We, we've got information here. We can think about other communication channels, but the, if, I'm, if I'm hearing my, reading my colleagues correctly, communication and having, them, having the public understand that we need them to share this information is really the, the fundamental issue. 
Supervisor Smidia. Thanks. I, uh, I do want to take advantage of this opportunity to have some more conversation about, so where do we go from here, depending on what we do or don't do? And, you know, I know it's at the end of the meeting and it's late, but here we are. And, you know, six months later, we're not a heck of a lot closer to wrestling this challenge to the ground. Mr. Williams, just, I mean, just to, not to put too fine a point on it, but I read the uh, statute as saying that the prohibition on contributions from a participant with a financial interest applies during the pendency of an application or permit request and then for 12 months after the final decision. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes. And the pendency can mean literally when someone submits an application, even if an application sits in the planning department and we've never seen it for three years. Yes? Yes, although one of the items that's um, the subject of potential rulemaking from the FPPC is to better define the, the pendency issue. <coughs> and presumably we'll also have the opportunity at some point to figure out what new or should have known really means, although I gather that's ground that's already been covered by the Levine Act in years past and it's more narrow application, yes? Yes, I think that, that one there's more um, applicable regulatory and case law. Yeah, I just, I wanna just sort of alert all colleagues, I, you know, so literally if someone has started paperwork in the procurement department, Mr. Williams, and you know, RFPs take a long time in this uh, organization, uh, you know, it can be six months, a year, uh, or a contract negotiation, once paperwork starts being moved around or digitally uh, shared, that means that a matter or contract is pending, at least under current understanding? Yes, prior to the adoption of this recent expansion of the Levine Act, uh, the FPPC opined in opinion letters that that process starts at the RFP stage, yes. In other words, before there's an award or a contract. And I appreciate your desire to sort of help us parse what's practical and what's not. I can't think of a practical way for us to have notice of when things are pending in an organization with thousands of contracts. I remember when we were here some months ago, I can't remember if it was Dr. Smith or somebody else said we had 600 mental health contracts alone. Yeah, that's nuts. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out how, how are we ever supposed to know when something is pending. Never mind the ordinance, I'm just trying to figure out how I know when something's suddenly pending. Uh, as I noted, that's one of the issues that's subject to potential FPPC rulemaking. They've proposed a number of different approaches to better define that question. Uh, and the particular point you have raised is one of the points that has been raised with the FPPC. Okay. Well, Madam Chair, Supervisor Chavez has won me over to a, uh, uh, a passionate abstention on your substitute motion because uh, if I vote yes, which I won't do, that would suggest I thought it was sufficient to the need, and as you know, I have a different view. Mm -hmm. If I vote no, that would leave us with potentially nothing in the way of a solution if we ever had a, uh, a matter of necessity uh, where we needed to find three people who could participate. So I think I'll uh, cast a principled and much uh, deliberated abstention and uh, we'll see how it works out one day. Very good, I still see lights on. Are there more comments or, okay. Um, do we have members of the public wishing to speak on this item? I do have one virtual request at this time, none in chambers. All right, if anyone else is uh, on Zoom and wishes to speak on this item, right now is the time to raise your virtual hand when the first speaker begins speaking. We will close the queue. Seeing no further hands, our speaker is David Montiel. You'll have two minutes. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yep. Looks like- Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry, I had my microphone actually switched, turned off. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes I think less government is more. And this, and, and what I mean is the bureaucracy. And to me, this, what you guys are talking about, in my opinion, is bureaucracy. I totally agree with the Submidian, uh, Supervisor Submidian, because the thing is, if you have a requirement 
for him to be accountable for something that isn't accountable to the, you know, a requirement of the public, that's not a mandate. It's impossible for him to be able in good conscience to be able to say yes to the vote. And I totally understand it. I've worked for companies in the past where you didn't want to have a conflict of interest. And maybe this is a conflict of financial interest. And the thing about the conflict of interest is you wouldn't have to have somebody working. Like I wouldn't want to work at my, my profession and have some, and then also uh, work for another company that has the same profession. Well, my profession has military contracts like it did. So the thing is, that's what they want to avoid. They want to avoid the conflict of, of that and the, how it looks. But the thing is, you guys have so many contracts, there is no way, in my opinion, that you're going to be able to cover it. Now, like I say, sometimes less is more, less is the best. <laughs> now, you know, you guys you make an oath when you get, go into office that you're going to do your duties responsibly, that you won't be biased in any way and all that stuff. I mean, that's part of who you guys should be, right? So this is just to me another way of almost to, to the person like me that was just going to make a comment. Oh, what conflicts of interest do you have? Who do you support? Who do... <laughs> At some point, we're just people just trying to get the government to work for us, you know, in a very, very logical way, straightforward way. Straightforward is better. I don't agree with this, the way this is set up at all. No to the campaign disclosure. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. We're going to take a vote on the substitute motion at this time. Motion by Ellenberg, second by Arenas. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Abstain. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 4 1. Thank you. 4 0. So there's nothing we need to do with the first motion, correct? No. Substitute okay. motion supplants Substituted the for first motion. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're now moving to items removed from the consent calendar. Item 29, we handled concurrently with 16. Uh, April, um, <laughs> item 36, we handled earlier with the behavioral health report. So we have remaining, and just let me know if I'm missing anything, but I see 41, 64, 70, 72, and 86. I concur with Levine Act announcements on 41 and 72. Perfect. So let's go to 41 and begin with the Levine Act announcement. Item number 41 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Through the chair. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Madam Chair. We've been advised that item 41 on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Finally, Madam President, while it is of course a matter of public record, I would like to note that since January 1st, 2023, when Senate Bill 1439 took effect and amended the Levine Act, I have in fact received various campaign contributions, which have of course been reported in full as required by law. All such reports are of course public, and I would ask that if anyone has any reason to believe that any of those contributions were unlawfully made, that they advise me of that immediately so that I may correct the situation and ensure that contributions that are not permitted are not subsequently given or received. Finally, let me just exhort any and all potential campaign contributors, please make no contributions which violate Senate Bill 1439, the Levine Act, or any other provision of law. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. So this is an item I pulled, and I'm happy to um, just ask a, a question and then see if there's a response that, that um, is helpful. And if not, we'll see what we have to do next. Perfect. Go right ahead. May I ask who's sitting with us? <clears throat> yes. Good evening. My name is Rhonda Schmidt. I'm the Employee Benefits Director of the Employee Services Agency. Great, Rhonda, thank you. Rhonda, what I'm concerned about is the number of complaints we've gotten with all of our providers relative to their ability to provide behavioral health services in a timely um, manner, in fact, and sometimes maybe they don't do it at all. And, um, and I'm wondering what mechanisms, if any, do we have in these contracts when an employee or when a provider isn't providing the services that they tell us they're going to provide? Forgive, forgive me, I, I just literally the one word when they're providing, did you say mental health services? Yes. Thank you, I just didn't hear the word. Well, for county employees, they can address those issues with my department and we can escalate the issue to our account management team um, at the providers. So when we do that and, and they're non-responsive, which I've seen that many, many times, what then? And what I'm really asking is, is there any kind of clawback mechanism in any of our contracts that addresses the lack of service provision or service provision not being provided in a timely manner? Or services not being provided in a timely manner? Thank you. I'll have to get back to you about that question. So, let Joe, go ahead. <laughs> Through the chair with the forbearance of my colleague. Um, I have, in fact, been in touch with our incoming county council on this subject, have in mind a referral which includes but is not limited to the precise issue that you've just raised and would be happy to Brown Act with you and seek your support as a co-author if that appeals to you at all, but I don't want to get in the way of anything you're trying to do tonight. Well, thank you, and yes, I would be very excited about that. And colleagues, the reason I'm holding these up, these are... I mean, we spend so much money on these services, and the number of complaints that I get from our own employees is really astounding. And one thing I'll share with you is that even in emergent environments, the county stepped in on behalf of our insurers, for example, during the, um, uh, during the VTA, not just during the shooting, but for services long after that. Our service providers were not providing those services we were or um, VTA paid for outside services to be provided without any repayment from our, our uh, I mean, our, um, our overall uh, medical providers. So if they're not in the contracts now, my one concern is that these contracts, I, I forgot, are they three years? One year. Oh, good. Oh, great. I'm so sorry I made you wait so late. <laughs> then I will move approval with the, the opportunity to come back and change the way we are doing business with these providers. So anyway, my motion to approve and look forward to talking to Supervisor Smitty and more. And forgive me if I can't talk to the rest of you colleagues now that I've committed to Brown Act with my colleague, Supervisor <laughs> Chavez. Would you like to second her motion? I'd be pleased to second her motion. Excellent. Do we have public speakers on this item? We do have one virtual commenter. All right, if anyone else is on Zoom and wishes to speak on this item, right now is the time to raise your virtual hand. When the first speaker begins speaking, we will close the queue. And it's still at one, and right. Paul Soto, you will be our first speaker. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will begin once you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto, of course you. When I when I, I didn't have nothing to say on this particular topic, but when I heard the the comments that were coming through earlier within the context of mental health, uh, uh, clients and patients needing Kaiser's facilities, and that they refused uh, county patients that went through. Uh, the Louise Hospital in Gilroy, that, that, that kind of like, there's an inconsistency there. The Kaiser is doing business with us. That's, that's, that's our money. And so they're contracting with the county. 
to provide services, what I'm asking is that if you could please insert in these contracts and bring that to the table. I mean, it, it's, it, it kind of like pains me that I have to bring something like that up because that's kind of what we're assume that our representatives would do. And I think, I think Supervisor Chavez did that. But I just need to reiterate from the public's perspective that we need to be able to attach those. And, and if they don't, if they, if, you know, we, we can't just assume, oh, no, they're going to turn that down. Put them in a position to where they have to. Put them in the position to where they have to turn it down. And then because they have to, like, it's like, well, wait a minute, you're going to turn us down for something like that. But yet you're going to start asking us for, for money. There's going to be an inconsistency there. And you want to be able to leverage the fact that we were turned down for services for citizens of our county at the St. Louis Hospital. And so th this is, that's what the negotiation process is about. And I'm asking that if that can be reiterated and reinforced so that we can get the benefit of those dollars. That, that concludes public comment. Thanks so much. I, I just want to add before the vote that I'm, I'm really happy to see the addition of wait time and preventative service, uh, ser preventative service metrics, including for access to mental health appointments. Uh, and I would like to see, and, and maybe I'll, I'll ask if this can be added to the motion, um, those quarterly reports from the plans uh, to ESA submitted to FGOC as they're received next year. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5 0. Thank you. Uh, item 64 is the county pay equity study and strategic plan, which Supervisor Arenas pulled from consent, then returned to consent, then Supervisor Chavez pulled Thank from you. consent. Thank you, I pulled from consent, and I'll That's do this. That's where we are now. I'll take this one, I don't need a presentation. First, I wanted to thank the staff for a really excellent report. Um, I have two requests. One is that the final work plan come back to us uh, in October, and through the county executive, um, when we brought this forward, and this, I can't remember honestly if Supervisor Cortezi did or I did, if we did this together, um, that's how long ago it was. But one of the tenants was that we wanted to make sure that everybody doing business with the county um, also signed on to pay equity. And we have so many contracts, the impact is very significant. What I wanted to make sure is we have in fact instituted that in our contracts and second, that there is a method for determining whether or not companies are living up to that. As an example, when you're looking, you can look at um, uh, pay records as an example of, of to determine whether or not someone is doing fair work, for example, under in construction contracts. That's one of the ways we make sure that if someone signed on to a project labor agreement that we look at certified payroll as an example. So my motion would be to receive the report with an October uh, report back that also through the county exec's office looks at um, whether or not we instituted the policy for pay equity with contractors and that we have a method to determining whether or not they're actually doing what they say they're doing. Thank you, I'm happy to second that. Supervisor Simidian? No comments, thanks. No comments. Um, hi, and thank you so much for, for hanging on to us today. I just have a, a an observation that might be a question. I noticed that we don't yet have the technological capability to report employee, um, sorry, just making sure I'm on the right item, um, to report employee sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression data, which I now know is colloquially known as SOGI. And I want to just flag my support for the addition of the PeopleSoft module that would give employees the option to self-report. I, I think without obtaining this data, we really can't achieve our equity goals. So my, my question is, d does that need direction or is that already in process? Good evening, board members. Uh, Rosie Lando, Deputy County Executive. That's already in process. I know that we're waiting and working with ESA on multiple different initiatives and that's a, a definitely a high priority for us and, and for them. So Fantastic. we'll definitely follow up. Thank you very much. And I believe there's a report out coming from, according to Mr. Mills, in the next month. I mean, I don't know if it's it's the end of by the end of June or early August. 
Excellent, thank you. Any additional comments from board members? Any public speakers? I have one virtual request. Let's hear that speaker. Two virtual requests. Oh, so then let's hang on for just an extra second. Um, if anyone on Zoom is wishing to speak on this item, the report uh, from the Office of Women's Policy relating to completion of the county pay equity study and strategic plan, now is the time to raise your hand. We will close the queue when the first speaker begins speaking. Seeing no change, our first speaker is David Montiel. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, yes. Uh, uh, about the, you know, I know that the term equity has been used a lot in our county. And I think a lot of times what they mean is equality. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I don't know why you'd have to have a study like this. And uh, just, my, just from my view, uh, you know, looking at somebody's gender, or this and that and the other, I, I don't see this country being systemically racist or white supremacist and all the things, some of the things you hear politically. I see a lot of, especially in this state, I see a lot of people treating each other by the content of their character and not the color of their skin, and I love that. I have people from Ethiopia next door. They, they like me, I like them, we love each other. We really do. We'd hate to have each other, any one of them move, you know, because we don't want those guys to move. They're great neighbors, and uh, they invite me to parties, and uh, I'm invited to even pray for their son at graduation. I mean, I don't know. I just sometimes, like I say, I think sometimes less, less prying is okay. I'm not saying that maybe some things don't exist sometimes, but there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, even in the county, don't you guys have, uh, you know, like uh, personnel or something or some other department where if there's a grievance where, hey, the person would think they're being treated differently according to their race, you know, their, uh, their religion, their sexual orientation. And I think that's the appropriate channel to go to rather than coming up with something else here uh, I think sometimes we want to help so much that we can overdo it and we assume things. And I don't want to assume things in this great nation of ours. My dad was a World War II POW in Stalov Law 4 in Prussia. He went through eight months of concentration camp. So there's, you know, so I'm just saying, I hope we don't treat people differently. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Just a little history lesson on pay equity. In the 1960s, when the uh, Center for Performing Arts was getting built with Model Cities money coming in, one of the main things that the Confederación de la Raza Unida, one of their main issues was ensuring that Chicanos and Mexicanos were hired because there was a pay inequity and imbalance that was racially uh, motivated. After that, we started getting more contracts. Mexicans started getting contracts in these types of, uh, in, in construction jobs. Secondly, is that women make 70%, 70% to every dollar that a man makes. So when you look at that, those statistics, if you're a Mexican woman, you are making even less because you have a dual uh, you have a dual, um, like, kind of liability. And so I appreciate that, this, that the county is, is, is trying to do something to amend that. But we already have, when, when, you, when you put it in this context, it's almost like we don't have a, a memory of that. It's like we have an amnesia of history. That's why the work that I do is critically important. Because what I do is I get that history, and then I contextualize it, to give it a modern, uh, a, not only a modern perspective, but a modern relevance, that we've been here before. We don't need a whole lot of study sessions. We don't need a whole lot of analysis because the ones that benefit from that are just nothing but people that, they're, they're, they're consultants. We have a rich history here in our county and in our city of both racial disparity and gender disparities with respect to pay. So what I'm challenging the county to do is start researching our own history. That concludes public comment. 
Thank you. We have, um, do we have a motion? Yes. yes. Oh, I second it. Yes, motion by Chavez, second by Ellen Burr. <coughs> uh, let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5 0. Thank you. Item 7 uh, is regarding a trailer facility at 999 Hamlin Court in Sunnyvale, and Supervisor Lee pulled that from consent. Thank you so much. I see uh, our awesome staff from Osh, Consuelo, and Key are still here. Thank you for staying late for this uh, uh, item. Um, and I don't need a report. I just want to ask a couple of questions, if I may. Um, basically, we I came through with this referral, um, trying to help out the students uh, that we're knowing that staying at Hamlin Court. Uh, because of the fact that they don't have any place to do studying. So um, the report coming back in summary basically said that it's not going to work because of uh, site constraints, right? And so the alternative to it is that, hey, why don't we uh, find a place for these families instead of putting them in these open shelters uh, and, and find maybe potentially motels for them in the future? Is that a pretty good summary of where we're at? Yes, thank you, Supervisor. Okay, good, thanks. So, so um, uh, I mean, as, as, as I have noticed, the reason why this came through was <clears throat> there were 31 kids uh, there Easter Sunday. I was there last week, and there were still 15 boys and seven girls. So um, I guess my main question really is, I, I've heard that we want to m move this as soon as possible. Uh, when do you think you will be able to have these families given other options, i.e. motels or elsewhere? When do you think that could actually happen? Thank you, Vice President um, Otto Lee. The update that we provided is that currently there are 11 families. Three of those families are connected to the city of San Jose. They were previously homeless there. We are working with uh, the city of San Jose to enroll them in San Jose. That leaves us with eight families who have a connection to Sunnyvale. Each of them have unique needs, um, and we are working with each of the families to understand um, what options they would prefer because we've heard that some of them want to stay um, at the congregate setting. Um, so the timing really depends on the readiness of the family. We are focused this week on the San Jose families. Great. And when you say to San Jose, you don't mean putting them into another shelter in San Jose. You mean finding actual uh, housing or like pri uh, uh, options that would provide them the uh, individual units, right? Correct. The city of San Jose has a motel program um, that they operate, and the idea is that we would be providing them. There's two options, that or at Evans Lane. Great, thank you. Yeah, then I've visited Evans Lane. Certainly, it's a uh, very um, <clears throat> well-run facility when I saw it. So, thank you. Um, for the future, um, what type of processes do you think we will have in place to let the new families know that uh, they would have other accommodations instead of the shelter? Uh, in other words, uh, how would they be evaluated or diverted from group shelters uh, and provided? motels or other uh, individual housing units in the future? It really is a policy discussion, Supervisor Lee. Uh, we always ask the families mm -hmm. when we pull their name from the shelter wait list, um, these are the options. The, the families choose if they want to go there or if they want to wait. Uh, we do have a heading home update coming to you on June 27th. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that policy discussion has to be what do we as a system and as a community think should be the response in a congregate setting for families. In this case, we have a site that has congregate um, sheltering that combines single adults and families. And I think the policy question is, do we want to continue that? And if not, where do we replace that? Um, today you approved the Santa Clara site, which is great, um, but that will take at least 15 months. Right, that's a much more longer term uh, solution of uh, solving this issue. Obviously, it could be a, uh, assuming we get funding and getting built, that's at least over a year away. Now, on your report back, you also mentioned that uh, OSH would use this opportunity to continue to work with a private business owner that has offered the county a grant to complete on-site improvement that would add outdoor amenities. Could you explain uh, what, what ideas is on the table? Sure. The
the current ideas, there is no real outdoor space. Um, there is a makeshift, as you've seen, Supervisor Lee. Uh, we have temporary uh, a, a table out there. And the offer from the private donor is to create some recreation space and sitting um, areas for folks that are staying in the shelter. At the parking lot? Um, it's a portion of the, it, it's not the parking spaces. There is a designated area that is kind of like open space. So we would not be eliminating any of the parking spaces. Yeah, so you'll be using a portion of that parking lot area, but not eliminating parking spaces to provide potential, uh, what you call tot lot spaces or? Um, I'm sorry, Supervisor, I didn't realize that was going to be the nature of your questions. We do have a diagram that shows there is a, um, in the front of the building, there is a grass area. Um, mm -hmm. That area is not parking. Okay. That is the area of improvement that we're referring to. I see. And that is not, um, that won't impact the current parking structure. Correct. It's currently not being used. So that's the area that you're thinking of putting some potential facilities Correct. for, for the kids. Um, not necessarily okay. for for the children. It's for anybody to use. Okay. All right. I mean, I, I guess my 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 main question is, uh, as far as this policy uh, discussion, um, does this need to be referral to come back? To, oh, I guess we will talk about this on twenty seventh. Is that, that is right? correct. We are um, one of the actions that you, that the Board of Supervisors gave us as part of heading home was to expand capacity um, for sheltering of families. If you might recall, in 2021, we had a very limited number of options for families. Right. Uh, we have tripled that number um, since the campaign launched, mm -hmm. and it's just a, again a function of understanding, you know, how do we program this? Um, how do we leverage the resources? We have a few grants. Um, and that will come back to the board for consideration on the 27th. Great. Looking forward to that. Thank you very much for the uh, report. Good job. Thank you. Okay, so Other a, a motion oh. to receive the report. Motion you got a Rochambeau. <laughs> okay. Motion and second. Uh, Supervisor Smitty, and your lights on. Did you I have look a forward to voting aye in a moment. All right. Do we have, we just heard public comment. Oh, Not on this yeah. item. Do we have public speakers? We have one virtual request. All right. I think everyone still on Zoom knows what to do if they're planning to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Our speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, thank you for at least, we're, we're trying to piecemeal together and to solve a problem that has been 80 years in the making. And I applaud the efforts of the county because I believe that this is sincerity to do just that um, is, is more uh, genuine and authentic than the city. Now the city was one of the primary beneficiaries and the creator of the redlining map of 1939. That is the root, that is the root. And so with respect to these issues, there, I, I understand that they're, they're, we're, we're trying to do the best that we can, but we're not really articulating properly the generational consequences of that map. And until we do, we're not going to actually create a policy or anything that is going to directly address the issue. We have to inoculate ourselves. And what that means is you have to take a piece of the disease and insert that into it so that it becomes an antidote. And that's what racism is. Racism is a public health issue. Dr. Sarah Cody said just that. So if Dr. Sarah Cody has admitted that it's a public health issue, that means racism is a disease and it infects our systems. And these are the symptoms. So after this meeting, I'm gonna go to sleep in a, in a doorway because I don't have a home. I've been homeless for a week. One week, I've been sleeping wherever I can. And sometimes I don't even sleep. This is the situation that I am in. And so I've spent my entire day here with you, giving you the benefit of my knowledge. And now I'm gonna go and try to find some door. That concludes. Public comment. Unfortunately, David Montiel did not raise his hand in time. Thank you very much. We uh, are ready to vote on this item. Supervisor Arenas? 
Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 5 0. Thank you. Item 72 was pulled by Supervisor Chavez. It requires a Levine Act announcement. It is an agreement with Valley Water for Outreach Services. Do you want to begin uh, with the Levine announcement? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Item number 72 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Madam Chair. Supervisor Simidian. We've been advised that item 72 on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. So I wanna ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And finally, Madam President, while it is, of course, a matter of public record, I would like to note that since January 1st, 2023, when Senate Bill 1439 took effect and amended the Levine Act, I have, in fact, received various campaign contributions, which have, of course, been reported in full as required by law. All such reports are, of course, public, and I would ask that if anyone has any reason to believe that any of those contributions were unlawfully made, that they advise me of that immediately so that I may correct the situation and ensure that contributions that are not permitted are not subsequently given or received. Finally, let me just exhort any and all potential campaign contributors, please make no contribution which violates Senate Bill 1439, the Levine Act, or any other provision of the law. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. On this item, um, so thank you. Uh, to the staff um, for being here still. Um, what I wanted to make sure of is that we get a, a mechanism for reporting, and I don't know what we do now relative to when we provide these kinds of services. Do these come just with our general reports annually? Let me, actually, let me tell you what I'm looking for and that might help. So what I wanna make sure of is that we're looking at um, issues of gender, ethnicity, age, um, and what services were provided and the outcomes, specifically if they're housed where, is it interim or is it permanent, and how this body of work will really feed into the overall um, system that we already have in place. So understanding as we're doing these kinds of services, how they connect and then um, who we're meeting out on these uh, waterways in particular is what I'm interested in. Yeah, I think that's uh, doable. It's um, incorporating sort of the outcomes and reports associated with all of our outreach programs or incorporating this program into that and then oh, providing that to you. And will you, when that comes back, is that an annual report that well, you? Well, um, I think Supervisor, I think OSH provides um, monthly reports through Hewlett. Um, uh, but I, I don't think there's a specific meeting about the outreach services, but I think maybe they can incorporate that. Already um, in the report you're doing, that would right. be great, because I do think it would be important to delineate it, in part because the, the partner organizations we're working with have different needs, and to, to be perfectly direct about this, I'm very interested in understanding where we're having more effectiveness in terms of integrating folks into the system of care that we already have and where we're having challenges with it and why. Will do. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I move approval. Thank you. Second. Second by Lee. Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you, I will be abstaining on this item, not, <coughs> well, 
I'll be abstaining on this item uh, mostly as a way to signal my concern to staff about the working relationship with Valley Water. And I understand that the goal here is to make sure that county services are available, um, but I, I'm just I'm just nervous about it. So this is my way of saying you've got at least one board member who uh, worries a little bit about the partnership or the relationship and uh, hope she'll keep an eye on it. Valley Water is mission driven. I understand what their mission is. Their mission is different than our mission and I just worry that um, as noted in the staff report that Valley Water's quote responsibilities to maintain the waterways end quote um, might trump some other human concerns uh, along the way. I wish you well and thank you for your effort to try and make sure that doesn't happen. Seeing no additional comments, do we have public speakers? We do have one request online. Okay, and let me remind the folks on Zoom, if you're intending to speak on this item, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. We have two hands up. All right, let's do it. Down to one. Our speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. We had 200 citizens of our county evacuated from the, uh, from the waterways. There is nothing in place for them. There literally isn't. And, and, and this has been the norm for many, many years. So the infrastructure just is not there to accommodate that. What developers have been able to successfully do, both on the I, I don't know too much about the county, but I do know for a fact on the city. And what they've done is they've created a system where market rate housing has taken precedence. Here's, let me give you some data. You guys like data? Let me give you some. From 2016 till now, today, this is accurate, 100% accurate. Market rate housing in this city has met 95 to 115% of its goals. In the exact same time period, ELI, VLI, everybody else, it has never broken the threshold of 25% in the same time period. You don't get those kind of statistics by accident. This is a methodical, analytical, scientific, complete, it's called euthenics. When you create a system like that, by design, you necessarily create this. This is the symptom of that. And until we get to a point, that's why I'm here, is to, is to inform, to instruct, and to push. Because we have created this system that is necessarily going to create another system that doesn't include the people along the waterways. It doesn't include the sons and granddaughters and grandsons of Sasipuedes. You see, because you don't have an economy that can accommodate them because what has happened over the last 80 years. So, I mean, we can't see this, these issues as disparate. They're all connected. It is all connected. We need... That concludes public comment. Apologies. Our second speaker lowered their hand. Guess we're ready to vote. Thank you, Supervisor Arenas. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Thank. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Travis. Sorry, I wasn't looking up. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, abstention from Smidian. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Thank you, that carries 4-1. All right, our final item of the day, item 86, the Gun Violence Task Force Report. This was pulled from consent at the request of the district attorney. Good evening, James. Good evening. All right, so four months ago, 
Um, you all um, approved in addition to Was grant that at funding. the beginning of our meeting, Mr. Gibbon Shapiro? Excuse me, I couldn't resist. Yes, at the beginning of the meeting four months ago. Okay. <laughs> we were discussing the possibility that I might be the very last speaker. All right, so four months ago, uh, you all approved um, funding and positions for our gun task force and uh, in conjunction with state grants and federal grants. And I'm here, first of all, to say thank you very much and to report back on the success we've had in the first four months. So you'll recall that the gun task force is set up to vigorously enforce California gun laws that have been underutilized, like gun violence restraining orders, domestic violence relinquishment hearings, armed prohibited persons enforcement, ghost gun interdiction, and assault weapons trafficking. We're off to a great start, not only procedurally, so we've got a lot of connections with the family court especially, um, but also with lots of other uh, partners. And we've got a procedure in place now where the family court is immediately notifying us when there is an order uh, that's not being complied with, that someone who's got a restraining order in family court is, has guns, and then we're immediately following up on those. And so in the last four months, there have been four instances where following up on family court findings, uh, we've not only investigated that and made sure the guns were relinquished, but also followed up with the victims to find out what was going on. And I'll just give you one example of one that's not in your report. Two weeks ago, our task force followed up on a family court finding of noncompliance with the order. And as we always do in these situations, we contacted the victim who said, perhaps not surprisingly, the perpetrator was not just not complying with the order to relinquish guns, but wasn't complying with any part of the no contact order and was continuing to engage in acts of violence and threats against her that were unchecked. And so what we did was not just make sure that we got the guns, but we also arrested the perpetrator for his continued acts of violence and then connected the victim with victim services. I'll say another example recently of where our task force has been instrumental. So you know that we've have um, all sorts of instances of gun violence. There's a recent report by John Hopkins University that came out today about the increase across the country in gun violence. There was a recent road rage incident where someone pulled out a gun and threatened the other driver with a gun. Now, previously, the police investigation would have begun and ended with the investigation of that incident. But what happened, because we have the task force, is in addition, we got a gun violence restraining order. This person who pulled out the gun in a gun violence road rage incident shouldn't have any other guns. And when we did a search warrant on the piggyback of that gun violence restraining order, we found a gun manufacturing operation where he was manufacturing ghost guns, assault weapons, machine guns. And so just in the first four months, not only are we doing more and better with the family court and their orders, but we're doing more and better for ordinary police interactions that would have just stopped, and we're taking it the extra mile to reduce the flow and the prevalence of illegal guns in our community. So thank you so much for your help and support, and if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Lee. Really, um, James, I, I bet when you thought, hey, let's pull it, you'd be done at 3 o'clock. But thank I you did for think that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for hanging with us. But I, in all seriousness, I wanted to say how much I appreciate the, the work that you personally have done on this. Really, it's, it's amazing. And to say thank you to your team, because I, I, I do think that um, in addition to just addressing gun violence, it's also changing the systemic way that we're addressing this in our community, which allows us to be much more on the prevention and intervention end um, than I think we have been in the past. So congratulations and thank you for the update. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Thank you very much, James, for this uh, great report and the stories you're telling how this extra step, which is something that honestly should have been happening all along, but due to lack of resource, we haven't done it. So I'm so glad that uh, with this additional resources, this is happening now in our county. And I'm sure this will be continuing for many, many months and future years to come. And hopefully with our work, we could actually be a model for other counties as well to show how we could use the law 
existing law, uh, making sure we put in resources so as to get rid of these uh, folks who should not have guns. Uh, Follow-up question regarding the gun violence restraining order, GVROs. Um, I am very concerned that people don't understand how to apply or use this method in order to get guns away from individuals who should not have them and go through application process. Um, what have you been able to do? Is there something in the works where we are getting these applications out there, making it easy for people to access the applications and uh, also in language, in different languages to get out to the communities? Um, I was just in a meeting yesterday on this topic about how we can do better outreach to all our communities um, on social media and other places where they are so that we're letting people know that when there's someone who is a danger to themselves, and suicide is a big part of what we're trying to stop with gun violence restraining orders or dangers to the community, mm -hmm. that we can temporarily uh, get a court order to temporarily remove those guns. So we're absolutely got some plans, so uh, stay tuned. We're hoping to um, make a proposal for um, the acceptance of a grant that we're gonna apply for that's gonna help us do more outreach on that. Great, thank you, and that's exactly what I think is so needed because frankly, friends and families are the ones who really knows where these issues are um, brewing in the, in, the, in the homes and in our neighborhoods. So uh, the fact that we could make this uh, resources as easily accessible to, the, to our communities is extremely important. And as I mentioned, being in language is so important too as well. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I had to fight for over at the city was to have more resources um, dedicated to our San Jose Police Department so that they could actually do some of this follow-up because it just doesn't make sense to have a restraining order but no enforcement or no way to really check on, on our folks out there. And so it, it made me think about how this actually impacts closure rates um, for cases or how it um, lends itself to, to maybe have survivors come forward or be more willing to participate in, in the court process. Have you seen any of that just yet? I, I know that this is rather new, but I, I, you talked a little bit about how you followed up on some new um, um, consequences for this perpetrator based on um, your follow-up on the, the gun violence uh, restraining order. Supervisor, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that some people who are applying for a domestic violence restraining order in family court think that by doing that, they're notifying the police. Mm -hmm. But they're not doing that. Yeah, they're not. And, um, and so we're finding out on the back end, after there's been several proceedings, and we're talking to a victim who thought that the police might have been involved, should have been involved all along because they were reporting it to the family court. So one of the things, I was just in a meeting with one of our family court judges, Judge Estramera, who some of you may know um, today, talking about um, better information that we can get at the self-help center at the family court to make sure the people who want to call the police and think that they might be calling, calling the police by filing something in family court are actually connected with law enforcement. Oh, that is absolutely genius. Yes, yes, a a absolutely. I, I, I love it. Um, I'd love to see how, and, and I know we can't request this from you at this point, but um, maybe in a couple of months as, as this moves forward, I'd love to see if, if there's any... Um, movement in terms of the closure rates or participation rates in our in our survivors i i just think this builds the level of confidence and safety that i think um most per most uh, survivors would like to see in a system and and hopefully have it triggered in other cities um that have like the city of san jose so they know how important it is and how effective it's 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 been so anyways i really just appreciate all the work that you do um for all the survivors and the families that are impacted thank you so much and thank you for waiting to let us know the, this great 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 project thank you all for waiting to hear from me that's what it was <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh james i'm just uh, just very quickly, um, I know that the, the district attorney's office has led in the past with the gun-related intelligence program. 
and uh, the DA Rosen was looking to expand this work with the addition of 11 positions that the board approved in February, which, which I believe pretty much doubled the size of the team. And I'm wondering if you're, you're tracking um, the, the expansion of work that's associated with a team uh, double the size. You did share uh, three, I think, really interesting and powerful anecdotes today, but how else are you looking at um, identifying the, the capability, the expanded capability of the team at this point and what the successes are? Yeah, uh, we are tracking all the referrals we're getting from family court, also all the gun violence restraining orders that we've been involved with, and then also all of the um, person-based and place-based um, work that we're doing through our weekly meetings for every gun-related incident in the county. Mm -hmm. So if um, you'd like at a later date, I'm happy to come back and talk about that. And then I'll also um, note, as I did at the beginning, that um, six of the 11 positions were grant funded. So um, thank you for your support and also sure. uh, for your support in, um, in letting us apply for those grants. Absolutely, thank you so much. Do we have public speakers on? Oh, look first. I was gonna Is make a motion right to approve and then just to make a recommendation that I, I think the point you're raising is a good one, which is just that we, we wanna be able to look at where we were and where we're going. And I think being able to quantify that is actually really critical because one, well, for all the reasons that are obvious, but, but one specifically is the incredible system change and then and then the other is your point about you know we we should be thinking about where there are system issues that need to be addressed and as an example i don't think it's far fetched for the for somebody who's in family court to believe that they once they've conveyed a problem that that is reporting it and that there should be a mechanism that doesn't require them to take another step and that's worth us partnering with the courts to figure out how to make that happen as an example um, but there may be those systemic uh, recommendations that you want to make. I, I know the district attorney's office has a phenomenal relationship with the courts, and you can be collaborative, but when we don't see that change happening, we should know that. So, you know, for example, we, we fund the self-help center. So I, I would love to talk to the presiding judge about making sure that we're thinking a little bit about how to how to make those channels more clear, particularly family court. That's just one example, but that's actually the example, as I look back on this, that I remember where we started was you being willing to pick through every single one of those by hand, and now this is where we are today. So I'd be interested in that, that kind of dashboard approach. Thank you. Absolutely. Public speakers on this item? I'm sorry, I didn't capture a second on Second. The Thank you. Motion by Chavez, second by Arenas. Thanks very much. We have two requests virtually. All right, let's tee them up for two minutes each, please. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'm glad that the district attorney is here to give that report because, and, and that he stated that suicide is one of the things that he's trying to prevent. And he's absolutely correct on that because the majority of gun violence the people that commit it is suicide, not domestic violence, not domestic violence. It is suicide. People are using guns to kill themselves. So I thank the district attorney for centering that within the context of this conversation. Now, secondly, is that gun violence, the San Jose Police Department is making statements, and I really hope that the district attorney looks at this. What, he, what the police department is saying is that pointing a gun at a citizen is not considered force. I would like the district attorney to weigh in on that. I'm making a public note right now that you have been notified that the San Jose Police Department is using a particular rationale. And what they are saying on the record now, when I pull out my weapon, a loaded firearm, one in the chamber, that is not force. Yet, if a citizen does that to his wife, you will make absolutely certain that that person is arrested, stuck in prison for as long as possible. This is a very critical issue. So, because they're not classifying it as that. 
So if we're going to talk about gun violence, we can't have that much of a disparate interpretation of what that means. That means that. And that there are women that abuse that restraining order. Case in point, Councilwoman Rebecca Arminares, when she took me into court, Judge Manley threw it out because he knew that there was no merit or no value to it. And yet the violation was sending an email notifying a lot. Our next speaker is David Montiel. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, yes. Uh, is Dave Montiel here? Uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, gun violence. Uh, that's, a, that's a big issue uh, because there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of gun violence, and it's, it's sad. It's sad that uh, people resort to guns instead of, you know, to me, like, uh, you want to get things off your chest sometimes, you just say it in a meeting like this, or you go to, also you go to church, you, you do things to help your spirit, your soul, and your body to not jump into that category. Now, I know this gun violence task force, it, what I've been hearing about is more about, you know, which would be, you know, like say somebody has a restraining order, say a woman has a, uh, uh, fills out a restraining order against some guy that's, you know, uh, out to get her or something like that. That's totally legitimate. I mean, that's what you want to do. I mean, but what if that guy, uh, what about his rights? And I'm going to say what I mean about his rights. What if, what if somebody points a gun at him one night and he doesn't have one and they shoot him? So I, I, I think there has to be a balance somehow. I don't know how that would be, but I really do think, I'm just going to iterate again, that I think people need to have a way to to calm their mind and their body and their spirit, and that's to go to church. I know I sound like a preacher, but it really does help. I mean, for a lot of people. And we've really, in society, made that optional. Don't bring your kids, don't involve, you know, don't, don't, you know, and all that. And what happens is, is we don't know. Like, uh, like uh, Supervisor Lee was saying, we don't know what our kids are doing half the time. Well, if that's true, right? If we really don't, then we need to involve them in something that we are doing. It helps their body, mind, and spirit to where if something really, they really get in an aggravated situation that they don't decide to use a gun, that they ask for help. Anyway, that's my uh, opinion. Take care. Have a good night. That concludes public comment. Thank you. Let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. That carries 5-0. Thank you very much. With that, we are adjourned with tremendous appreciation for the clerks, for our security folks, for CREATV, for the department uh, heads and um, staff members that stayed to present their reports that were pulled from, from consent calendar and really to everybody that makes these meetings happen and run so smoothly. Have a good night, everyone.